Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees? There are no proposals for committees to meet, so I'll call the clerk to call on business. The clerk. Government business, order of the day number one, Treasury Laws Amendment reuniting more superannuation bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mr President. And uh, it's great pleasure order. I get a chance to uh, speak again on the uh, Treasury Laws Amendment Bill, uh, Superannuation 2020. Um, what's order. Thing? Can we start Go Thursday on. morning? Huh? Quietly, we're please. We're With a bit go? of compliance to order, so uh, Death tax Timmy there keeps interjecting. You'll need to tone it down a bit, mate. Um, now, as I was saying last night, the superannu superannuation industry really is like the 1930 uh, gangland uh, Chicago gangster wars. Uh, Really, we've got a bunch of uh, you know, uh, crooks that are out there running around gouging $40 billion out of the Australian economy every year, out of the Australian worker, and uh, um, it's about time we uh, stood up to that. And it actually reminds me, as I was saying this bill, it actually reminds me of the scene in The Untouchables when um, Sean Connery was played, uh, playing the role of uh, retired cop Jim Malone, who came out and he was out to get Al Capone, um, who could easily be played by Senator Tim Ayres, actually. Reminds me of that. But, uh, um, uh, how effectively, uh, in the scene where he gets uh, gunned down, just before that, he, he says to the uh, uh, cr criminal gangster as he comes in, he goes, uh, isn't that just like a wop? You bring a knife to a gunfight. And he tells him to get out. And of course, just as he's about to get out, he gets gunned down. Uh, and really, this legislation is a bit like bringing a knife to a gunfight, in the sense that it doesn't really go far enough in cracking down on the superannuation industry because we've got $3 trillion out there that's sloshing around uh, in the ivory towers of, of Sydney and Melbourne, uh, you know, uh, lining the pockets of the, of the wealthy, of the blowhards, while the battlers out there in the regions and the metropolitan suburbs of the cities basically are losing 10 per cent of their income every week. And the unfortunate thing about it is, you know, and, and you know, I'll have a go at my own party here, we, we think we believe in markets and free markets and that, but markets are actually predicated on the risk-reward paradigm. And this is the problem with superannuation. There is no risk-reward paradigm. There is no downside risk for fund managers because basically fund managers can lose the entire lot of someone's superannuation and they're not held liable for the loss of capital. And you know, if we're going to get serious about increasing productivity in this country, we need to get serious about matching risk and reward. And that's certainly not the case with superannuation, uh, which in my view um, doesn't really help anyone other than the, the wealthy, uh, the wealthy uh, end of town. The other thing superannuation does, of course, it also provides almost up to $40 billion in tax concessions. And of course, uh, most of those tax concessions also go to the wealthy end of town. Um, and you know, if we were to actually, I mean, I'll give you, I'll quote you some numbers. It's almost estimated to be about $40 billion in tax concessions. There's 13 million workers in Australia. If we were to give them a $3,000 tax cut, that would cost $39 billion. Now, a $3,000 tax cut from the bottom up could basically lift the tax three threshold from 18,200 to, off the top of my head, somewhere around 30,000, a bit over $30,000. And most of that money uh, would be pumped back into the economy. So you could probably lift the tax three threshold up to $35,000, $40,000. And that would be a great way to incentivise people to get back to work. Because I think it's really a crazy system we have in this country where we give businesses a tax deduction for the cost of doing business, but we don't give PAYG uh, workers a tax deduction for the cost of living. 
And it's really silly, in my view, to be taxing low-income earners below $35,000, $40,000 their cost of living if we didn't have to give it back to them through Social Security. Why not just let low-income earners uh, keep that money in the first place, especially if we can um, uh, you know, give, give all these tax concessions to superannuation? I mean, you've got to earn the money in the first place before you even pay superannuation. So it would be much better to actually let people um, earn that money in the first instance. And then, of course, we've actually got the, the cost of this superannuation. If you add up the $40 billion in fees and the $40 billion in tax concessions, comes to about $80 billion. The, tax, the cost of the pension is about $52 billion. So you've got to ask yourself: We're spending 80 to basically uh, saving uh, to avoid paying out more of the pension. But really, I, I think we'd be better off raising the pension, getting rid of superannuation tax concessions, cutting low income tax thresholds, or raising them, the thresholds cutting the tax rate for low-income earners um, and actually enabling everyone to have a, a better safety net uh, when they retire, rather than this uh, anything goes, uh, pick your super fund, and if your super fund does a good job, you might get your money back, but if it does a bad job, you don't get your money back. And of course, what I love about the super funds is that they're allowed to short shares, except I, I will, I will give credit where it's due. Uh, Australian Super and QSuper have stopped shorting uh, their sh selling short-selling shares, and that's a very good thing. And I would urge all other uh, superannu superannuation fund managers to stop shorting shares. And I am actually lobbying the Treasurer on this. I think shorting is a heinous uh, practice. Um, you have a fiduciary duty. Fund managers have a fiduciary duty to protect the interests of their uh, clients. And shorting shares creates a lottery, because if you just happen to short shares at the same time uh, one fund manager has to retire and maybe cash out to pay out his house because he hasn't been able to pay he or her hasn't been able to pay out his house throughout the course of his lifetime because he's had to put 10% of his earnings, which could be 100% of his savings, in the super rather than his house. The day you come to retire and have to cash out your super to pay off your home loan could be the same day uh, a super fund shorts the shares. Uh, you, you lose out. Um, so. I think this shorting practice is another example of how superannuation funds aren't really protecting the interests of their fund managers. It's a heinous practice, and it should be uh, abolished. It should be abolished. And you know, we've really got to, You know, it's almost been 30 years now since uh, Paul Keating brought in superannuation. And if we actually look at the number of people on the pension, including the part pension, it's only dropped by a couple of percent in that time. So you've got to ask yourself, what is the point of uh, giving away $80 billion in tax concession and, and fees, which are only lining the pockets of the wealthy and, and the white-collar uh, you know, uh, fund managers in their ivory palaces in the city, uh, when uh, it hasn't really done the job it's supposed to do? It hasn't really reduced the reliance on the pension anyway. And what's worse is that the number of people retiring with a mortgage since 1992 has increased from 10 per cent to 40 per cent. So that is clear evidence that superannuation is actually uh, making it much more difficult for people to actually pay off their home. And there is no greater way to retire. There's no better way to retire than to have your own home. At least if you've got a roof over your head, you know you've got some security in retirement. Unlike the, share, the stock market, which is extremely volatile, I mean, if you look at the last 12 months, it's bouncing around. Uh, like a boy on the ocean, it's not really effective um, and certainly doesn't provide a lot of security. And the other thing about superannuation, and I think this is a really, really important point why the pension is a much better way to protect uh, and provide a safety net in retirement, is that superannuation is not universal. It doesn't, uh, it's not there for stay-at-home parents. It's not there for people on the disability pension or the unemployment uh, 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 who get unemployment benefits. It doesn't help out volunteers. Uh, so basically, if you want a superannuation, we've got to get everyone back to work. But what concerns me is that if everyone goes back to work, who's going to man the school's tuck shops? Who's going to do all that volunteer work in the community that has to happen uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day? Um, you know, it's one of those things I know when I took four years off and helped uh, raise my children. There's a lot of uh, Community, uh, community organisations out there that do a lot of good work uh, throughout you know, uh, the week. Um, and this idea that we've got to get everyone back into the workforce, uh, well, that's going to destroy our volunteer community. So you know, there's a lot to be said for having a universal pension which covers everyone, um, including those on a disability pension and, and stay-at-home parents. 
Uh, so um, I think that's something worth considering. However, you know, look, this this bill is is a step in the right direction. I mean, I'd like to go a lot further. I mean, it's 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 a knife to a gunfight. I'd personally like to bring the bazooka and a few other things, but um, uh, I think it's worth discussing. Um, uh, you know, some aspects of this bill which are worth doing, and of course. This bill does seek to increase the accountability of underperforming super funds. Um, uh, it also takes aim at ERX, which historically have served the purpose of a temporary holding fund designed for lost, small or inactive superannuation accounts. Um, you know, this, this is a racket that's been going on for way too long where we've got mul multiple accounts and we don't have portability in the superannuation industry. Why it's taken this long to actually uh, fix it up is beyond me. Uh, it's just added more to the superannuation uh, fund managers' rivers of gold um, at the expense of hard-working Australians. So that is certainly uh, one good thing about this bill. Um, but ultimately, you know, if we, we've really got to ask ourselves in this country whether or not we want to continue this superannuation um, facade or do we really want to provide true, a true safety net for those in retirement through a universal pension, which is guaranteed, um, unlike superannuation, which isn't capital guaranteed. Uh, and you know, it also uh, raises the issue of whether or not superannuation is actually legit under the constitution, uh, because people haven't actually ever been given the option of, of whether or not they want to lose their hard-earned earnings. I mean, I think that's really um, one aspect of superannuation. Uh, that we should look at New Zealand. I know the left love to quote New Zealand. Well, New Zealand had a referendum on compulsory superannuation, and they voted it down 92 per cent to eight. Uh, I think you know we've had property rights destroyed here when people's uh, wages have been taken from them without their permission. Uh, and you know I would strongly, you know, I make no secret of it. I strongly encourage uh, a, a dis discussion, and I would personally like to see a referendum on whether or not superannuation should be compulsory. I think it should be optional. People should have the choice. Uh, as to how they spend it, especially whether uh, you know if they want to pay off their home loan or even their hex debt. I mean, it's crazy that we take, you know, we, we send kids to university, they, they rack up tens of thousands of dollars in hex debts, then they come out and they work, and then we say, you know, if you earn hundred dollars, it's going to you pay thirty dollars tax. It might cost you fifty dollars to live. You might be lucky to save ten or twenty dollars out of that hundred dollars, for example, and then you're going to lose most of that to a superannuation fund while your hex debt keeps on accumulating. So. You know, at the end of the day, we've got to put the car, uh, horse before the cart, and that is, you know, pay off your hex debt, own your house, set yourself up for a good family life when you have your own children, and then once your children have sort of grown a bit older, you can focus on your retirement. Then knowing that you've got a strong uh, and secure safety net in the form of a universal pension. Uh, but look, this this uh, bill is a step in the right direction. We've still got a long way to go, but I commend commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, Senator Ayres. Oh, beg your pardon. I have Senator Ayres on my list. Oh, okay. But I believe it's you, Senator. Thank Rennick. you very much. Um, oh, sorry, I thought I was on the list next, but uh, here I am anyway. Um, well, that was extraordinary. Um, I can't believe that I've been sitting in here, and I probably wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't have been sitting in here. But someone from the government bench is saying we don't want everyone in a job because who's going to man our tuck shops? For goodness sake. Anyway, I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment reuniting more superannuation bill 2020. This bill contains a single schedule that amends the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act, RSA Act and Superannuation Unclaimed Money and Lost Members Act of 1999 to facilitate the closure of eligible rollover funds by 30 June 2021. Uh, ERFs were designed to look after uh, unclaimed super. Balances are typically low and accounts are inactive. This measure addresses Recommendation 5 of the 200, uh, 2019 Productivity Commission inquiry into superannuation, which recommended that the ATO be responsible for holding lost superannuation accounts and that APRA oversee the wind-up of eligible rollover funds. It will allow the ATO Commissioner to reunite superannuation accounts they receive from eligible rollover funds with a member's active account. These changes build on the Protecting Your Super 2019 legislation, which saw low balance and inactive accounts transferred by trustees to the ATO, not ERFs. 
Fund trustees transferring inactive or low balance accounts to the ATO have made ERFs redundant, and this legislation provides that timetable to wrap up those remaining ERFs by 30 June 2021. The ATO have successfully reunited more than 2.1 million lost or forgotten superannuation accounts. This is a greater success rate than Ausfund over a 10-year period. Labor will be supporting this bill. It is sensible and logical that lost super should be reunited with its rightful owner as quickly and as simply as possible without establishing any additional funds and additional accounts. And Labor continues to support measures that target duplicate accounts with a stronger, fairer superannuation system. And it is clear that the ATO matching has been more successful than Ausfund, and it's in the members' best interests. But let me be very clear. If this bill, if it passes this chamber today, represents just one flicker of light of logic in the murky, ideological darkness that is the Morrison government's attitude to superannuation and ensuring that Australians have dignity in, re in retirement. And we just heard a snippet of that from the senator uh, in his speech prior to me. The best thing that this government could do to ensure that dignity and to work in the best interests of Australians is to move our country towards 12 per cent superannuation as legislated. That move already delayed by this government twice, costing workers retiring today between $60,000 and $100,000 in their superannuation balance, is vital to ensure that all working Australians achieve a dignified standard of living in retirement. Australians are living longer in retirement. The changing nature of work, rising aged care and health costs, and declining home ownership rates in retirement are key reasons why ordinary working Australians will need 12 per cent super to retire with dignity. And yet we see the Morrison government quib quibbling and uh, prevaricating. When Australia's compulsory superannuation system was first established more than 25 years ago, it was done so with a simple, clear objective in mind, and that was to provide working Australians with some savings at retirement. Before that, most people had no nest egg at all other than their home. Superannuation was largely the domain of higher income earners and the public service. Millions of Australians had nothing in super and could only look forward to the age pension, if that's anything to look forward to. And as the cornerstone of Australia's retirement income system, compulsory superannuation is now one of our greatest success stories. The miracle of compound interest has created a significant pool of capital that is now benefiting our economy and financial system, and it is a key mitigating factor against wealth inequality, and it is enabling people to have a better living in retirement. But something fundamental in shifting in our country. In 2017, the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees report, No Place Like Home, the impact of declining home ownership in retirement, noted the impact of Australia's falling home ownership rates on the retirement wellbeing of future generations. The report found that more people were retiring with mortgage debt or having to rely on private rental housing, with twice as many retired households paying more than 30 per cent of income for housing. Older retirees are forced to rent, many of them single women, deserve both housing security and a decent income. This is further argument for the superannuation guarantee to rise as legislated. And the guarantee is legislated to increase from 9.5 to 10 per cent on 1 July this year. It will then increase in uh, 0.5 per cent increments to 12 per cent by July 2025. But the federal government is yet to officially commit to this year's increase with Mr Frydenberg saying in recent months that a decision will be made in the May 2021 budget. He has announced that the legislated increase of superannuation to 10 per cent in 2021 will be reconsidered following the public release of the Retirement Income Review along with the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And a group of coalition backbenchers have publicly expressed opposition to a rise in the super guarantee. And again, we heard some of that just a moment ago. 
The Morrison government has let it be known that it is mulling over a proposal that would allow Australians to substitute future increases in the superannuation guarantee for higher take-home pay. The Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, and the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, should stop using this pandemic as an excuse to come after wages and super and stop pretending that they want workers to choose between higher super or higher wages when the truth is that the government wants neither. Workers have already lost $40 billion from their retirement savings through the government's COVID early superannuation release measures. This will translate into $100 billion over their full working lives. So we need measures to build up super savings to assist Australians who have accessed their super due to financial pressures to, uh, pressures to rebuild their superannuation savings, not cut them further. Industry Super Australia Deputy, Deputy CEO Matt Linden has crunched the numbers and they don't look good for ordinary working Australians. Not only does this idea uh, that the government is floating to make future superannuation guarantee rises optional, reduce the super savings for workers, it was also increase the amount of tax that they pay. This is because superannuation contributions are taxed at 15 per cent, while the average worker has a marginal tax rate of 32.5 per cent. As a result, an average family today consisting of two 30-year-old parents would pay $20,000 more in taxation over their working lives if they opt out of the superannuation guarantee rises and have up to $200,000 less in their superannuation by retirement. So removing the guarantee in the super guarantee to make it optional is a recipe for higher taxes, lower lifetime incomes, less dignity in retirement and a red tape nightmare for business. It is very clear that this government is exploring as many underhanded ways to renege on the superannuation guarantee as it can. And Mr Frydenberg will reveal how far he has succumbed to the ideologues in his party, those who seek to cut workers' wages through the current IR bill, those who seek to undermine the guarantee that is purely designed to give ordinary working people security and dignity in retirement in the May budget. Nine and a half per cent simply isn't going to get this country to a place where hard-working Australians can accumulate sufficient funds in their super accounts to have a, that secure, dignified retirement, and the government knows this. Leaving super at 9.5 per cent would consign low-income workers, as well as millions of women and men with broken work patterns, to financial hardship in retirement. It would also lead to more Australians needing to rely on the age pension. And let us all acknowledge that everyone, each elected representative in this chamber today, is receiving much more than that. We're all receiving 15.4 per cent. And to, de to deny the rest of the country a rise in their super would be the height, the absolute height, of hypocrisy. The Morrison government should acknowledge that we have a first-class retirement system and allow the superannuation guarantee to rise to 12 per cent as legislated. And the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume, sits in this chamber and she's sitting here today. She should commit to do that today and I call on her to do so. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, Madam Deputy President. Um, well, I urge uh, Australians listening to this or reading this uh, in the coming weeks to seriously consider uh, Senator Rennick's speech um, just a few moments ago and last night. Uh, because while Senator Rennick is held up to ridicule in public uh, from time to time because of his more extreme sort of utterances, the truth is he does represent, uh, he does say what the majority of the Liberal Party backbench are thinking. Uh, he does represent the view of most of the people uh, in the Liberal Party. And what a shallow, cold-hearted, miserable view that is. You see, superannuation in Australia is a national achievement. It's an achievement wrought by struggle and sacrifice through collective bargaining and legislation, through Australians' employers and unions, workers and government working together to establish a $3 trillion pool of national savings. There is much more work to be done to build a stronger uh, bedrock of retirement savings 
for Australian people. And I know that many people in the Liberal Party want to see working people go back to where they think they belong, that is dependent upon others, dependent upon the age pension, worried about their retirement security. That's where the Liberal Party wants people to go back to, where they think they belong. But we on this side, and I think every working Australian, are going to continue to fight for a retirement saving system that treats people with dignity, gives people opportunities uh, and allows people to continue to build the system that actually creates jobs, it deepens and diversifies our national pool of savings. It is the envy of countries around the globe. Deploys productive capital, despite all of the Liberal Party's efforts, can still be invested in national infrastructure. You know, it's easier for a Canadian super fund to invest in Australian infrastructure than an Australian one. I know the Liberal Party doesn't like it. They don't like the fact that workers' money can build jobs, build infrastructure in Australia. Over the next three years, industry super funds will invest $19.5 billion in projects, create 200,000 jobs, save the federal budget $3 billion. And indeed, our system does contain inequities that need reform. The gender pay gap uh, is compounded in superannuation, and women do retire with 42 per cent less super than men, and women live 40, four to five years longer, ensuring that Australian women in retirement are independent uh, and have their own retirement income should be a key objective of reform. That's a direction of useful reform that the Liberal Party could engage in. Uh, but they are beyond reform. They are only interested in pursuing their ideological prejudices and biases in government and maintaining government. And if that means sopping up to Senator Rennick or Senator Hanson, they will do whatever is required in government to persist, but they will not do genuine reform in the interests of the Australian people. Uh, now, indeed, low-income workers are more vulnerable to superannuation theft. That should be an objective of reform for this government. Low-income workers were much more likely to have used the early access scheme. Billions of dollars ripped out of the retirement incomes, mostly uh, of low-income workers, and the government continues to make it harder for Australian super to invest in Australian infrastructure. That should be an area of reform. Our test on superannuation reform is very simple. We will support measures that make the system stronger and fairer. To that extent, we will support the legislation that's before the Senate at the moment. The bill will allow the Commissioner to reunite superannuation accounts they receive from eligible rollover funds, um, which have become redundant. ATO matching has recovered millions of dollars of lost superannuation so far, but it doesn't, the bill doesn't represent the scale that's required of reform to rebuild our superannuation system after the Liberal Party robbed it during the coronavirus pandemic. It doesn't represent the scale that's required to fix the inequities that exist in the system. It doesn't begin to repair the damage done by Mr Morrison and Mr Turnbull and Mr Abbott to the system. The Liberal Party only have bad ideas for superannuation, only prejudiced ideas, only ideas that are about their own shallow ideology. They opposed compulsory superannuation when it was first proposed. Uh, the recommendation that the response of the then Treasurer who can forget uh, Mr Howard's period as Treasurer? We have pushed Australia off a cliff, basically, in terms of our economic performance. His response at the time, he said, the government has decided not to introduce the scheme of national superannuation recommended by the majority of the committee. The major transfer of resources to the aged implied in a national superannuation scheme of the type recommended could substantially impede the government's ability to meet other social welfare priorities. In addition, the government believes that freedom of choice individuals currently enjoy in arranging their affairs in respect of income in retirement 
should be retrained, which should be retained. What a miserable, straightened, confined view he had then of the possibilities for the Australian economy. And there's a straight line between that and where the Liberal Party and the Morrison government are today on superannuation. They've got the same bigoted attitudes to working families now that they had then. He drove the Australian economy off a cliff in the late 1970s and, and early 1980s. He was on the wrong side of history then. The Liberal Party is on the wrong side of history now. They were on the wrong side of history when they ransacked the superannuation system last year, forcing ordinary Australians to raid their own retirement savings so that the government could scrape through the recession. Not in the interests of ordinary Australians, in the interests of the uh, fiscal position of the Morrison government. And the enthusiasm on the backbench, which reaches right into the minister's office for sort of Darwinian superannuation proposals, mean that they will be on the wrong side of this debate for decades to come. They consistently wrong the Morrison government about superannuation because they don't understand it, they don't get it, they are incapable of empathising with the interests of ordinary people. They see $3 trillion of workers' savings and they can't understand how it got there. Why isn't it in the hands of their mates in the banks? Why isn't it with the spivs and the speculators? Instead, it's supporting decent retirement incomes for Australians. And it enrages them that trillions of dollars are managed cooperatively and efficiently and effectively by boards that are run cooperatively in industry sectors by unions and employers working hand in glove in the interests of the members of the superannuation funds. Nothing gets the Liberals more twitchy than hearing about the history of superannuation and the Laurie Carmichaels and the Bill Kelties and the Tom Macdonalds and the Mavis Robertsons and the Paul Keatings and the thousands of other Australians who fought to build the system because that's not the constituency that they represent. They represent the spivs and the speculators in the finance sector. Um, it's a threat to their entire world view. So when the coronavirus struck and the economy shed a million jobs in a week, they decided not to let a good crisis go to waste. It was a chance to strike at the superannuation funds that they've hated for so long. The early access superannuation scheme was a ram raid. It's reported by APRA that th nearly 3.5 million Australians withdrew from their super, a total of $36.4 billion and counting. Many people emptied their accounts and will retire in poverty as a consequence of the Morrison government's decision. Its target wasn't the superannuation accounts of the wealthy. CEOs still get tax breaks on their self-managed super funds. Its target was the people already struggling through the super system, casual workers abandoned by the government um, in terms of JobKeeper and hospitality and tourism, young people women, all abandoned, 53 per cent of the jobs lost in the first months of the pandemic held by women. Women withdrew higher percentages of their superannuation balances. Most likely, most of the people who withdrew their account balances were women workers. And as far as the Morrison government is concerned, that's a good outcome because it weakened the superannuation system. Why did they do this? Well, there's a spillover of anger from uh, people like Senator Bragg. These backbench ideologues will never have to make the kinds of decisions ordinary Australians have to make. They will never have to work multiple jobs or to struggle to save or to make tough decisions about which bills to pay or defer. They will never have to choose between a job that breaks their ageing bodies and possibly decades of poverty. They will never have to sell their own homes to fund the specialist aged care services that they need. Because the people on that side, they've got their trusts, they've got their big houses, they've got their 15 per cent superannuation courtesy of the taxpayer, they've got their multiple investment properties. 
We have learnt from the example of the former member for Dunkley this week. They have always got a cushy job lined up around the corner, sometimes even before they have left the parliament. Now, I have attempted to read the book from Senator Bragg. I sent someone from my office to go and ask for it. He, apparently the office didn't want to hand it over. I think it's in a safe out the back. I mean, it is, it is a book that is full of distortions and mistruths most of them deliberate. I've read the quotes where he makes outrageous, dishonest claims, dishonest claims about, about the role, the interaction between superannuation funds and the political system. He claims that they are big donors to political parties, which is a deliberate mistruth. A deliberate mistruth. Everybody knows it's a mistruth, but in some wacky Trumpian sort of approach, people on this side think if they continue to tell a lie that it will somehow become true. Uh, these statements, Senator Bragg since, said since super started in 1992, every single age group has experienced lower levels of home ownership. Well, that is a deliberate misrepresentation. The reason home ownership has declined is that the investor share of new mortgage lending has grown from 10 per cent in the early 1990s to 40 per cent. The reason young people aren't buying homes is that they've been priced out by investors and there isn't enough supply in the market. But in their determination to shift the blame somehow to the superannuation system for this is miserable indeed. It hasn't affected compulsory superannuation hasn't affected the capacity of people on the other side to purchase multi-million dollar properties. Mr Wilson's new campaign is home first super second. Um, he, he, um, the, the, the only policy Mr. Mor Mr Wilson can muster to the unequal housing situation is more speculation in the housing market. It sort of makes sense if you've got the life that Mr Wilson has led, if you've got the access to wealth and property and power that Mr Wilson has had, but he also enjoys a 15 per cent superannuation contribution. Perhaps his position ought to be really four houses first, 15 per cent super second, or perhaps holiday homes first, family trust second. It's an inspiring message for the hard-working people of Australia, the opportunity to die in poverty because you are forced to raid your super in your 40s, to scrape together to deposit, to beat some joker who's backed by a tax exemption on his seventh investment property. That's, that's the word, that, that idea that capital belongs in speculative property markets rather than in workers' retirement incomes is a shallow, venal, narrow, cold-hearted approach to the many millions of working Australians who are relying upon government. Uh, it lacks ambition. It lacks imagination. It's all about ideology and a shallow, narrow sense of the future for working-class Australians. Senator Giacconi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Labor has always uh, served the interests of uh, working Australians, and we continue to seek to put people first. And there are so many examples of this. You know, one in particular being the establishment of superannuation and the superannuation guarantee under the leadership of former Prime Minister Paul Keating, a measure which helped to ensure that every single Australian, regardless of their place in the workplace, was able to retire with comfort. It's not hyperbole to say that Paul Keating's stewardship of our superannuation program as Treasurer and then as Prime Minister will leave a lasting mark on the lives of Australians for generations to come. Thanks to the super guarantee, Australian workers have retirement savings of now close to $3 trillion. For most, they no longer have to fear the uncertainty of retirement or having to rely 
on the pension. Indeed, it is true to say that our system is the envy of the world. Many countries wish that they had set up a scheme like superannuation here in this country many years ago. I, along with my Labor colleagues, support the Treasury Laws Amendment reuniting more superannuation bill. And that's because we truly understand the value of super and what it means not just for individuals when they do retire, but also for the broader community. As we know, superannuation funds do a lot more than just manage super funds. They also invest back in our community. And on this side of the chamber, we know that the importance that super has to retiring workers in retail stores, in factories and building sites. Indeed, in my time before entering this place, I saw firsthand the value of this system to Australian workers, especially those workers in retail. The uh, Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association, uh, where I worked, is and continues to remain one of the largest trade unions in Australia, representing workers not just in retail but also fast food and warehousing. And the members of the SDA are often low-income earners, with the median weekly earnings of all Australians in 2018 being 34 per cent higher than retail workers. But for many, their retirement will still be reliant on the old age pension and rent assistance as well as what little super they may have. The decisions made in this place about super have a direct impact not just on their lives but on the lives of their families. While this bill will very likely prove useful to many Australians in managing multiple superannuation accounts, it is important that we don't forget that right now in this place and that in the other place the coalition is also trying to undermine the superannuation system, an assault on the retirement security of working families. And this is no surprise. For some of those strongest opponents to super, and we've had quite a number of contributions in this place this morning as prime examples, superannuation is a bedrock for many, but unfortunately those opposite and the contributions that we'd heard earlier, uh, there are a number of senators who'd like to dismantle that system. On the surface, perhaps some of the reforms explored in the draft could be interpreted as being of benefit to workers. But when you dig just a little deeper into them, we learn that this is un unlikely. In fact, the draft includes measures that directly contradict some of the recommendations and findings of the Hain Royal Commission into misconduct in the banking, superannuation, financial services industry. As the uh, SDA had noted in their December 2020 submission to the Retirement Income Review, with these measures, the government estimates estimates a typical young Australian entering the workforce in their 20s could be around $87,000 bit off at retirement. However, the implementation of this plan, as outlined in the exposure drafts, presents significant barriers to achieving this projected benefit. For five years now, the Coalition has promised and failed to deliver a retirement income covenant, and that would ensure workers' best financial interests are put first in their retirement. The Treasury Laws Amendment re reuniting more super bill supports measures that target duplicate superannuation accounts for the ATO. Now, Labor believes that the ATO matching is in the best interests of fund members. We support measures that are in the best interests of working Australians, and again, unlike many of those senators opposite. In submission after submission to the Retirement Income Review, stakeholders have reminded the federal government of the value of our compulsory superannuation system. For example, in, February, in, in a February 2020 paper, Res Super noted that the achievements of the compulsory superannuation system, particularly for lower income Australians, cannot be overstated. Even for members who retire with an account balance lower than retirement adequacy standards, having access to a lump sum 
or superannuation pension can provide them with valuable security and an ability to plan and manage this stage of their lives. Before compulsory superannuation, these workers typically, typically had no income in retirement beyond the age pension. Surely we all understand that making people more reliant on the age pension will, one, cost the taxpayer more in the long run, and two, leave future older Australians more vulnerable and living in stressful financial circumstances. Surely it's just common sense that retaining and supporting Australia's compulsory superannuation system should be a goal actively pursued by all sides of politics. There are some representatives in the federal coalition ranks who seem to believe that owning a home and saving for your retirement are mutually exclusive goals, and I simply do not accept that. We should be aiming as a nation to make it possible for working Australians to own their home, as well as saving for retirement. We can do both, and we have shown that. We should do both. Not doing both would be absolutely reprehensible. Owning a home, the Australian dream, is a worthwhile goal. A home provides security, warmth and a place to put down roots. In retirement, having worked for a living and made a contribution to the community in whatever form, Australians should be able to enjoy a comfortable retirement in their home. I will never accept the view that we should force people to choose between a home and a comfortable retirement when we in this place have the opportunity to make both possible. As I've already stated, Labor will support the Treasury Laws Amendment reuniting more super bill because Labor supports a stronger superannuation system. Labor has always advocated for a stronger super scheme, and it is worth pointing out that a 12 per cent super rate was always the intention of former Prime Minister Paul Keating in designing the original compulsory superannuation model. In July 1991, as a member of the backbench at the time, Mr Keating gave a speech to the Australian Graduate School of Management at the University of New South Wales and argued that government should legislate a mandatory 12 per cent point charge to be paid by employers as part of the productivity sharing under the Accord wage restraint model. And as he later recalled in 2007, this speech re remains the key speech in the forward design of the Australian super system. Labor believes moving forward with the already legislated increases to the super guarantee remains key to creating a stronger super system. Australian workers should be getting 12 per cent. In fact, they should be getting 12 per cent now, considering that most of us in this place do enjoy the benefit of a 15.4 per cent rate. Coalition senators, including many still here, voted against the legislation back in 2012. And today, in 2020, in 2021, Australian workers are only getting 9.5 per cent because the government has fr frozen the increases. And in arguing for the freeze, they told us it would drive wages growth. Well, the proof is in the pudding. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, wages growth had stalled. Not only are Australian workers missing out on the future benefits in retirement that would come to them through increased superannuation, they are also missing out on increased wages, which would have been promised to them by those opposite, due to stubbornly low wages growth that the coalition seems entirely disinterested in addressing. Finally, Acting Deputy President, as I've stated earlier, Labor will support the, uh, the bill before us, but Labor also supports a much fairer system. And once again, this directly contrasts with the members of the coalition who continue to demonstrate through their lack of action that they do not believe in a fairer system. If they want a fairer system, we would see new proposals to address the super gender pay gap, reforms to address the fact that females are retiring with significantly less in their accounts. If they want a fairer system, we would see proposals to address the enormous difficulties that part-timers and insecure workers and gig economy workers are currently facing in our economy. But we don't see any of that from those opposite. Instead, we see proposals that will grow the inequality, that will leave workers worse off. 
and we see continued attacks on our super system. But there is much more to do. Australians deserve a government that will act in their interests, and they deserve a government that is on their side. And it's only Labor Party that will be able to show that. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, like my colleagues, I note our support for this legislation, which seeks to make it easier for the ATO to reunite superannuation rollover funds with members' active accounts. This bill addresses a recommendation of the 2019 Productivity Commission inquiry into superannuation. I note also that the ATO has successfully reunited more than 2.1 million lost or forgotten superannuation accounts, assisting Australians to afford dignity in retirement that was the objective of the policy of compulsory superannuation. But what we must not overlook, however, is the fact that this bill sits within the broader Liberal Party agenda that they are peddling when it comes to superannuation, doing practically everything they can to rip the guts out of Australians' retirement savings. From the party that brought the misleading Your Super, Your Choice legislation, which took aim at mandated super in lawfully negotiated enterprise bargaining agreements, a bill that was about giving employers more choice, more freedom to undermine the choices of their workforce, leading to poorer returns and outcomes for workers. As the McKell Institute found in their submission, if the government cared to read it but didn't fit their ideology, to the review of the bills, they said this, employers and employee unions who collectively bargain for a fund are most likely to select a high-performing fund. By reducing the scope for employers and employees to negotiate around superannuation in their agreements. The government has restricted freedom of choice for these workers and left at the mercy of predatory retail funds and aggressive employer actions. It was clear that this Minister. bill was just a thinly veiled assault on industry super funds, all part of the Liberal agenda, to move billions of assets and funds under the management of industry funds combined by, looked over by employers and worker representatives, over to the poorly performing for-profit retail funds and their mates. Minister, it was a bill based on shoddy research Senator driven by an Minister. ideological agenda. Minister. Documents obtained by my Minister. office under the Freedom of Information revealed the extraordinary lengths the government went to in order to build a case for this legislation. They provided no performance basis or rationale when selecting several funds for the Attorney General's department to investigate. They relied upon a sample analysis that was never intended as a representative sample, but rather a select reading of enterprise agreements tied to the funds the government wanted to go after. Sadly, this bill did pass, clearing the way for the poorly performing retail funds to seize the financial futures of thousands of Australians. The retail funds have regularly been caught Senators, out delivering poor performance Senator and higher Sheldon. fees. Senator Sheldon, did you have a point of order, uh, Senator Watt? Madam Deputy President, members are conventionally heard in silence. The minister is obviously very sensitive. Uh, she should. I ask you that you uh, rein her in, please. As uh, I have, S S Senator McGrath, you're not helping the situation. Minister, I would ask you to stop interjecting. Thank you, Madam There's no point of order. Please sit down. I'm sit down, Minister. If you want to um, make a contribution uh, at the end of the, your, at your time, then you can do so and raise the issues that you're actually interjecting on. Senator Sheldon, please. Well, as continue. I repeat, these retail funds have regularly been caught out delivering poor performance and higher fees. Year in, year out, these retail funds underperform industry funds. Of course, it begs the question, why are retail for profit funds even allowed in the superannuation space? Now, the Liberals' war on superannuation doesn't stop there. Their mismanagement of the COVID-19 pandemic left Australians with little but no choice but to draw upon down tens of thousands of dollars from their superannuation accounts. The Liberal Nationals parties told people who lost their jobs 
many of whom were denied JobKeeper, that they had no choice but to shortchange their futures to meet the demands of present. And the cost of this government sanctioned vandalism of retirement savings, what is it? Almost $38 billion taken out of superannuation. Now, Liberals like Senator Bragg trot out lines that super is people's money anyway. Why shouldn't they use it in times of hardship? But the language ignores the actual hardship. It's going through, we're going through a global health pandemic. We're in the midst of a recession, not because of a market failure. People weren't forced to raid their super because they had made bad financial decisions. The vast majority of Australians accept the necessity of measures, limiting travel, bordering border restrictions, mandating social distancing. All of these were the correct responses to a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. But there was never any justification for forcing people to effectively trade away their future now by running down their hard-earned retirement benefits. The truth is that this undermining of superannuation will hurt most of those industries who have been devastated by COVID-19, all because this government has failed to take responsibility for looking after a people affected by the economic consequences of COVID-19. Well, the Liberals like to talk about responsibility, how working people should be responsible for their lives. Well, when are the Liberals going to be responsible? When are they going to be accountable? Well, they should take responsibility for the livelihoods of people whose jobs had been lost as a result of COVID-19. Now, not content with the acts of sabotage, the Liberals are now trying to present a false choice to Australian workers, telling them they must choose between higher wages today or dignity in retirement. It's a false choice. Since the former Abbott government in 2014 delayed scheduled increases in superannuation, real wage growth has been marginal. In the past five years, have workers been rewarded with higher wages because of the Abbott government's delay? No. In the last decade, real wage growth has only exceeded no more than 2 per cent in a single year. Under their watch, there is literally little or no evidence that employers are miraculously or generously passing on the savings of delayed superannuation payments onto their workers in the form of higher wages. Now, whenever the election is called, workers will be given a chance to deal with this false choice by the coalition. What the government is really proposing is that workers choose between dignity in their retirement or an unreliable promise of further wage growth. It is these choices being pushed by the renegade Liberals on the backbench, the thinly veiled work of henchmen for the big banks, put into parliament by vested interests of Australian financial vultures. They are here to do the bidding of the big four banks and for-profit retail funds. This government wealthily forgets the central reason for superannuation's existence. It's not a piggy bank for the government to smash open during a crisis. It is not a rainy day fund for the government. It is the savings of the Australian community. Is it a supplement? And it is best possible, possibly, to complement the age pension for individual Australians. Paul Keating, when speaking to members of the industry superannuation Australia in August last year, said, it is the great public bargain with the community. Defer consumption for working life and you will get a very low rate of tax and ownership of the funds. And of course, speaking of quoting Keating, I've seen the backbench of Senator Bragg, the coalition's superannuation wrecker in chief who is doing the best to undermine Senator Hume, has been quoting the Keating of late. He tweeted in August last year that Keating told the 1992 ACTU Congress in a direct quote, "'You are losing your industrial muscle. I have given you the opportunity to take, a, take on financial muscle. You will get that through your superannuation funds,' end quote from Senator Bragg. Quoting, he says, Mr Keating, the only thing is Keating never said those words. There is no record of him saying it. And you want to know more? And you know, want to know why? Because there was no ACTU Congress in 1992. But I'll give the senator a benefit of a doubt. Maybe he's thinking of the 1993 ACTU Congress in which Keating spoke. 
except the transcript of that speech has been up for years and there is no appearance of that quote. Maybe it's another speech by former Prime Minister Keating, except a pretty thorough check of all his published transcripts, so no results of that quote. Maybe a Hansard search would turn something out. Turns out no reference to that at any time either. Could it be that Senator Bragg is mistaken? Has he had a Ronald Reagan moment? Could it be that Senator Bragg, in his relentless quest to undermine super and become the finance minister, has incorrectly and falsely quoted the former prime minister and treasurer? Maybe it's another one of those conspiracy theories the senator thoroughly enjoys, like when he tweeted about the evils of George Soros and the left's web of money. Now, any senator caught in such a situation would, you think, immediately retract such a statement or offer the source for this quote. Instead, the senator sent a link to an article of the Spectre magazine that doesn't feature a direct quote and decried all the fact-checking as spin. This is coming from the man who spent years before being elected advocating and defending the most scandal-prone and the worst performing part of the finance industry, the superannuation run for profits by the big banks back when he argued against a royal commission into the banks. He argued against the future of financial advice laws that forced shonky financial planners to do the right thing by their customers. Now, the only difference between then and now is that Senator Bragg is lobbying for the banks in their interests right now while on the taxpayers' dime. Just one example of this phenomenon is Senator Bragg's bizarre attack on the news website Industry Superfact the New Daily and their commercial agreement with the ABC. Modern liberal defender and protector of all things commercial, unless it involves the ABC and news content that he disagrees with. Bragg was happy to deliver the keynote speech, uh, uh, deliver the keynote at the 2020 FinTech Awards, where the top gong, gong went to a payday lender before pay that charges only 5 per cent to lend up to $200 for a week, the equivalent of a 260 per cent annual interest rate. Says it all, doesn't it? That's the kind of commercial arrangement he likes, but he's unhappy with a commercial arrangement where a legitimate news website with respected journalists so pays the ABC to use their content just because he doesn't like their coverage. Well, presumably, he'll now go after BBC and Mamma Mia, two of the many news outlets that have legitimate commercial arrangements with the ABC for non-exclusive use of this new content, news content. Now, nothing has changed. Different workplaces, same agenda. He's not the only one. Bragg has joined in in Canberra by the member for Goldstein, Tim Wilson, who is running an inquiry into the Banking Royal Commission that isn't looking at the banks. Together, these stooges of junk retail superannuation are working hard to damage super, to trash the legis legislated superannuation guarantee, to cause as, many dam as much damage as they can to Australians' retirement by opposing it rising. Now, their agenda is not in the public interest. Their agenda is a partisan and designed to damage industry super funds, the best performing parts of the finance industry. They are on a wrecking mission sent to place by the banks to pursue their agenda. That's why they were sent here. But are also clutching at straws from the likes of Senator Bragg reveals how the Stooges' war on super is really a culture war based on ideological fantasies. It's absolutely not about workers and housing affordability, as they would have you believe. It's about vested interest. The Stooges and the shonky end of finances are inseparable. They are inseparable before the Hain Royal Commission, and they are inseparable now. It begs the question, who is running super policy in this government? Is it Senator Hume? Of course, is it Senator Bragg? Or is it the member for Goldstein? Are they running the show over there? Because it does look like the government is being dragged into lunacy by the Stooges. 
It does look like a serious attempt to tear down superannuation piece by piece. It does look like Minister Hume, the Minister for Ambivalence, has lost control of her own portfolio. With Bragg and Wilson's hands on the steering wheel, the Minister for Ambivalence has lost control. Because of the compounding nature of capital growth, every day delay in increases to the superannuation guarantee is money our country loses when it comes to funding our nation's retirement, our community. But there is more to be done than just pass the increase. We must look to end the inequalities in superannuation, extending superannuation to contractors and gig workers, and bringing the gap in retirement incomes for men and women to take care of breaks to support their families. This is what Labor is about. We believe in building power of working people. We believe in building power in the voice of working people. We believe in dignity and in retirement for everyone, regardless of their income and not just for the Prime Minister. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I'm delighted that all of the amendments presented by One Nation to the government in relation to this bill have been accepted by the government. As always, we had carefully scrutinised the proposed legislation and our representation to the government was based on our acting in the best interest of the Australian people. The amendments allow for voluntary transfers by trustees to the ATO, ensuring better efficiencies for the superannuation funds. The amendments have resulted from discussions with superannuation funds generally and as requested to improve the original government bill. During consultation, it was revealed the law would prevent some amounts being transferred to the ATO. This is because the relevant legislation, the Superannuation Unclaimed Money and Lost Members Act of 1999, relies on concepts of member and account to enable transfers. An eligible rollover fund is a fund that is eligible to receive benefits rolled over, as the name suggests, from another fund without member consent. During consultation, funds advised that some amounts they would ordinarily transfer to eligible rollover funds relate to former members who no longer have accounts. <coughs> The amendments rectify this situation by providing trustees the opportunity to voluntarily transfer any amount for any member, former member or non-member spouse. Currently, eligible rollover funds can only send accounts to the ATO if they meet very specific conditions under the unclaimed superannuation regime or the protecting your super regime. These amendments will allow trustees of eligible rollover funds to voluntarily transfer any amount to the Australian Taxation Office the ATO. Furthermore, these amendments will provide trustees a broad capacity to transfer superannuation to the ATO in circumstances where this is in the best interest of the member. We are advised there are currently over half a million accounts in eligible rollover funds. The rationale behind these amendments is by facilitating amounts eligible rollover funds transfer to the ATO should more proactively reunify funds to account holders rather than via eligible rollover funds with members, active superannuation accounts or, where appropriate, directly into people's bank accounts. Plus, Superannuation held by the ATO will be held in a fee-free environment and paid interest at CPI. Therefore, by reuniting those lost accounts members more quickly, it will result in higher account balances and account holders no longer paying multiple sets of fees by being placed in a no-fee environment where they will earn interest at CPI. The amendments provide obligations on the ATO to pay amounts received to a single fund on being satisfied in accordance with 22B2 of the amendments. One Nation is supporting the amendment and the bill. Minister. 
Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. First of all, I would like to thank those senators that have contributed to this debate and my engagement with Senator Hanson and other senators around the chamber. Um, this bill, the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 1 bill on eligible rollover funds, is a very important bill. It's part of a broader arc of very successful reforms that this government has undertaken. We know that our superannuation system has served Australians well, yet it is highly imperfect. There still remains a proliferation of duplicate accounts. The fees are way too high. Uh, insurances have been inappropriately applied, and there remains a tale of underperforming funds. The government's arc of reforms over the last two to three years have been slowly but surely chipping away at these inefficiencies very intentionally. Our first legislation was around protecting your super. That addresses the disproportionate erosion of low balance accounts, capped fees on low balance accounts, and proactively reunited lost and small balances with individuals' active accounts. And we, on, that was so successful that it actually successfully consolidated around $3.7 billion that was held in, in unintended multiple accounts on behalf of almost 2 million Australians. But I want to remind the Chamber that Labor opposed that reform. The Putting Members' Interest First Bill, which was passed on the 19th September 2019, uh, implemented further protections from erosion due to the application of unnecessary insurance, uh, particularly for those that are under 25, allowing them to opt out rather than uh, automatically, uh, allowing them to opt in rather than automatically opt out of insurance. Um, the number of accounts below $6,000 with insurance has now gone from around $3 million um, to around sorry, 3 million accounts to around 1.5 million accounts on the 31st of May 2020. Again, a very sensible reform that Labor opposed. The Your Super, Your Choice legislation passed last year extended the choice of fund to enterprise agreements and workplace determinations, and that started in January just this year. It's estimated that around 800,000 employees, representing around 40 per cent of the workforce that are, current, current, uh, that are covered by a current enterprise agreement, are now able to freely choose where their hard-earned retirement savings are invested. Again, a very sensible, common-sense reform that Labor opposed. The superannuation guarantee amnesty, which was passed in, uh, the, on the 24th of February 2020, was so successful that 28,000 employers took part, and a total of $760 million was paid into the superannuation accounts or banks of 700,000 employees. Again, a sensible reform that Labor opposed. In fact, the only legislation that we have passed so far with Labor's support in superannuation was for the early release of superannuation. Again, a highly successful program that uh, ensured the financial stability and security of millions of Australians. So for that, I thank Labor's support. And again, I thank Labor for their support in this bill. Again, a very sensible and common sense reform that will facilitate the exit of eligible rollover funds from the superannuation system by the 31st of January 2022. And it will also allow trustees to transfer amounts to the ATO where it's in the best interest of the person to do so. This bill is highly consistent with Recommendation 5 of the Productivity Commission's inquiry into superannuation and builds on the policy intent of the Protecting Your Super reforms to reunite lost and unclaimed super with its rightful owners. Through these changes, the government is building a stronger and more efficient superannuation system and improving outcomes for members. Yes, Senator Sheldon is right. It may well have been a Labor government that invented compulsory superannuation, but make no mistake, it's taken a coalition government to reform it. I commend this bill to the Senate. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken uh, as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Minister. I table a supplementary memorandum relating to the government amendments and request for amendments to be moved to this bill. Uh, Senator Hanson. I advise the Chamber that One Nation will not be proceeding with this amendment on sheet 8892. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Keep going. Senator Hancock. Come on. 
Clarity from the Minister. Uh, in tabling the material relating to the amendment, uh, are you seeking to move your amendments now, Minister? Right. Minister. I would like to move government amendment uh, on sh by leave on sheet. Sorry, forgive me. Where am I looking? Where's my numbers? <laughs> One sixteen. Thank you very much. One to sixteen on sheet eight eight nine two. May I speak to those amendments? Yes, Thank yes, you very yes. much. So the government amendments updates the required timeframes for when eligible rollover funds uh, need to comply with the requirement of this bill to ensure that the bill doesn't operate retrospectively. The amendment also provides for a mechanism for superannuation funds to voluntarily transfer amounts to the ATO where it's in the person's best interest to be transferred, for example, where they may have otherwise been sent to an eligible rollover fund. Uh, the ATO will proactively reunify these amounts wherever they possibly can. An eligible rollover fund is a holding account that's designed to receive the superannuation benefits of lost um, members and those with low balances that are no longer receiving contributions. The unclaimed superannuation regime, together with the recent passage of the Treasury Laws Amendment protecting your super a package of 2019, which redirects small and inactive accounts that may have otherwise been paid to an earth, uh, to the ATO, means that the role of eligible rollover funds in the superannuation system has significantly diminished. So this bill facilitates the exits of eligible rollover funds from the industry, but as a result of the timing changes in the amendment, eligible rollover funds will be required to transfer all accounts below $6,000 to the ATO by the 30th of June 2021, and that was previously the 30th of June 2020, and all remaining accounts to the ATO by the 31st of January 2022, and that date was previously the 30th of June 2021. The removal of eligible rollover funds from the market means that superannuation funds will need a mechanism to voluntarily transfer funds that previously may have been directed to an eligible rollover fund to the ATO. And so this amendment allows for such transfers. This amendment is needed to avoid small and unclaimed amounts held by trustees being eroded by fees. Importantly, the ATO will work proactively to reunify these amounts where possible, together with interest to the uh, two member superannuation accounts or, in some cases, directly to the individual. The bill is consistent with the recommendation with recommendation five of the Productivity Commission's 2018 final report, which was called Superannuation Accessing Efficiency. As assessing efficiency and competitiveness, which recommended the closure of eligible rollover funds within three years. And it also builds on the policy intent of the Treasury Laws Amendment Protecting Your Super Package Act of 2019 that ensures that members lost and inactive accounts are consolidated with active accounts. Uh, and I want to thank Senator Hanson for her work with the government on, uh, on these changes. Through these changes, the government is building a stronger and more efficient superannuation system and improving outcomes for members. Uh, Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I wanted to indicate that the opposition will be supporting the government amendment to this bill. Uh, as a broad principle, we are of course supportive of measures that target duplicate accounts and make the system uh, stronger, fairer and more efficient. We consider that these are small but important changes that will improve the operation of the regime as outlined in the bill. Uh, and we thank uh, all of the participants in the debate for uh, bringing this forward. So the question is that the request for amendments and uh, the amendments be agreed to. Those of that of uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to, subject to the request for amendments. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment Reuniting More Superannuation Bill 2020 and has agreed to it with amendments but subject to requests. Minister. I move that the, the report of the committee now be adopted. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a third time. Have I missed one? <laughs> All good? I, think, I think you're fine. Okay. The question is the bill will now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. 
the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. Clark. Government business, orders of the day, number two, financial sector reform, Hain Royal Commission response number two, bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the financial sector reform, Hain Royal Commission response number two, bill 2020, on behalf of the opposition. This bill implements three provisions of the government's response to the Banking Royal Commission. It is worth noting that the Treasurer had promised to deliver all of the provisions included in this bill last year, and we are still waiting for action on many other recommendations. Labor acknowledges that there may have been other worthy calls on the Treasury's time in the past six months, given the pandemic. But we also observe this. This is a government that has taken a go-slow approach to almost every consumer-friendly reform. It is a government that has dragged its feet on every measure that would keep the banking sector accountable. COVID-19 appears to have been a very convenient excuse for the Treasurer to drag his feet on delivering on recommendations of the Banking Royal Commission, and unfortunately this is consistent with a long-standing pattern of inaction. This is the government that voted against establishing a Banking Royal Commission 26 times. Uh, it is a government that continues to play down uh, any of the problems or risks for consumers in this sector. The provisions of this bill are worthy changes to financial services law. Labor will support them. Uh, it is consistent with our commitment to implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission properly. Uh, Schedule 1 provides for some enhancements to the framework governing the provision of financial advice to clients under ongoing fee arrangements in line with Recommendation 2.1 of the Hain Royal Commission. Schedule 2 sets out a new disclosure requirement for financial advisers. And that ensures that any advisor who is not independent must provide written advice to their clients, which specifies how and why they are not independent and where their interests may conflict with that of their client. And Schedule 3 sets out new requirements for advice fees being charged in superannuation, prohibiting ongoing fees being charged from most super accounts and providing any advice fees from being charged uh, and pre preventing advice fees from being charged without express consent from the member. I think many of the people here will remember too well the cases exposed through the Banking Royal Commission that lead to these changes before us today. Uh, perhaps the most notable of those, it became very clear that AMP knew that in charging fees to clients for extended periods of time for services that they knew they could not deliver and were not in a position to provide, that their behaviour was both unethical and illegal. These were issues that were raised by junior staff within that institution, drawn to the attention of senior staff, and senior staff proceeded anyway. They did it anyway, and it's for that reason that we're here today. The unethical and systematic exploitation of customers by financial service providers who charge hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees for services that were never provided absolutely undermined trust in our financial system. And it undermined trust more generally at a time when our society needs trust more than ever. And I hope that these new laws do combat the sort of misconduct that led to Commissioner Hain's findings. It is going to take more than this bill to rebuild trust in our financial system. It will require financial professionals themselves, financial services entities, to commit to cleaning up their own industry and ensuring that customers really do come first. And it will require a government and a treasurer that is firmly committed to improving our financial system. And sadly, I think we lack this latter element. The Liberal Party has never been fond of a financial system that serves Australia. They have always been first and foremost in favour of a financial system which serves the best interests of their mates in high paying jobs, in senior roles, in banks. That is behind 
the 26 occasions when they voted against establishing the Royal Commission into banking misconduct. This is a group of people. It is a government that has never had a vision for financial services beyond what their mates tell them over a very long lunch. And you need only look at the other bill that was put forward by this government at the end of last year, which would strip responsible lending obligations from almost all consumer credit contracts. It goes directly against the recommendation, the first recommendation of the Royal Commission, which explicitly told the government not to fiddle with those obligations. Those obligations were put in place by Labor in 2009 to ensure that banks and lenders were obliged to make sure that credit products were not unsuitable for their customers. And that was to prevent the kind of behaviour that we saw in the global financial crisis. This is nothing less than a big free kick for the big banks, stripping away necessary protective legislation just to save a few bucks on paperwork. The Morrison government did not ensure that the Banking Royal Commission recommendations were implemented in full before the COVID crisis. They dragged their heels on that. But the Australian public rightly expect that the Banking Royal Commission recommendations will be implemented and not glossed over, not twisted, actually implemented as intended. As I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, the Treasurer has blamed the pandemic for his go-slow on bringing forward legislation for implementation. It's an excuse that is very convenient. The reality is that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted on real people living and working in the real economy. They have lost their jobs, found themselves dependent on government assistance for the very first time in their lives and endured great uncertainty. And the last thing that people need at a time like this, at a time of great uncertainty, is to be exposed to financial misconduct as well. The evidence presented to the Banking Royal Commission demonstrated in volumes the devastating impact of financial misconduct on people who have done nothing wrong. People whose trust has been abused by individuals and institutions who too often got away with unscrupulous, unethical and illegal practice. And the government cannot continually delay, distort important and essential reforms. I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> the Greens welcome this bill, which will implement four recommendations of the Banking Royal Commission, specifically recommendations dealing with the on ongoing disclosure of and consent to fees by customers and the disclosure of any lack of independence on the part of, part of a financial adviser. This bill is one part of the end result of the Royal Commission into banks that the Greens fought so hard for for so many years. This is the Royal Commission that the government had to be dragged kicking and screaming to conduct, despite the fact that tens of thousands of Australians have had their businesses and their lives destroyed by the rapacious and profit-hungry conduct of the big corporate banking sector in this country. And as Senator McAllister said, the government voted against a Banking Royal Commission 26 times. It's probably worth pointing out here that Labor voted against it on multiple occasions as well. In fact, it was only the prospect of an insurrection amongst government's, government backbench senators that forced the government's hand. And they've shown just how much their heart isn't in it by using the cover of COVID to introduce legislation that would abolish responsible lending laws, in direct contradiction to the very first recommendation of the Royal Commission, Recommendation 1.1. As I said, it also took the Labor Party a while to see the light, no doubt slowed up by the fact that one of their number, Ms Anna Bly, heads up no less than the Australian Banking Association. In fact, in voting against a motion from Senator Wish Wilson, former Senator Dastiari described Senator Wish Wilson's motion as a stunt. Well, it wasn't a stunt. It was a concerted campaign to shine a light on the misdeeds of those given the privilege of managing other 
people's money. If there's anyone who should be thanked for the Banking Royal Commission, it is Senator Wish Wilson. And he should be thanked not only for the Royal Commission, but for this bill and other bills which implement the recommendations of that Royal Commission. It was Senator Wish Wilson who consistently pursued the banks for their misconduct and the regulators for their complicity in the Senate, in committees and in estimates. But as welcome as the Royal Commission was, and as welcome as the changes included in this bill are, it only scratches the surface, surface of a fundamentally broken system. After decades of privatisation and deregulation, giving everyone the freedom to be actors in markets to improve their lives, inequality has grown, employment is less secure, the provision of essential services has been eroded, the planet is cooking, we are in the sixth mass extinction event in the geological history of the earth. Neoliberalism and trickle-down economics are both massive cons and they have broken the Australian economy and have destroyed the Australian dream of owning one's own home. Home ownership rates have fallen back today to where they were in the 1950s. I'll say that again, colleagues. Home ownership rates today are back to where they were in the 1950s. And along with a reduction in the provision of public housing, this means more and more people are in private rental and more and more people are in rental stress. They are paying through the nose for their rents because house prices have been inflated by tax incentives for investors. Deregulated and deregulated bank lending, which, by the way, the government wants to further deregulate by abolishing responsible lending obligations. And since the pandemic, bucket loads of printed money have been funnelled into the financial system by the Reserve Bank of Australia. Perversely, these high rents then prevent renters from being able to save up for their own home. I mean, colleagues, turning homes into an asset class, which is exactly what neoliberalism has done, has destroyed the lives of countless Australian families and is in the process of pricing most of an entire generation of young people out of the housing market in this country. And around and around it goes. As I said, this hits young people the hardest, and there is also another group of people, which is older people who have been the subject to family breakups, who find themselves stuck in the rental market and in extreme rental stress. And part of the problem here is that Australia's house prices are amongst the highest in the world, and our level of household debt is amongst the highest in the world. Conversely, even after the pandemic, Australia's level of government debt is one of the lowest in the developed world, thanks to the su success of the deficit hawks in discrediting the value of government spending. As a result, we've underinvested in public infrastructure and public services, and we continue to underinvest in public infrastructure and public services. At the same time that public infrastructure and services are being neglected and people are being left to fend for themselves, workers are getting paid less. Wage growth is flatlining. The share of total national income going to workers has declined over the last two decades, and it hit the lowest rate on record recently during the pandemic. In recent years, wages growth has also been at the lowest rate since World War II, and wages have stopped growing in line with productivity growth. On the other hand, the share of income being directed to company profits is at the highest rate since World War II, and was so 
even before the start of the pandemic. So let's revisit that. Wage growth at the lowest rate since World War II, the share of income being directed to company profits is at the highest rate since World War II. So the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Not surprisingly, wealth inequality has gone through the roof because profits are up, benefiting people who are already wealthy enough to own shares, and because home ownership rates have declined, meaning that inflated land prices are benefiting fewer and fewer people. Wealth inequality has also increased because privatisation has concentrated the ownership of more wealth in the hands of the already wealthy. And what are the wealthy doing with all this wealth? Well, the rate of business investment has been slowing and actually declined. This is despite record low interest rates even before the pandemic hit. Accordingly, productivity growth is also stagnant. Before the pandemic, even with the cheapest money in history, businesses were investing less, businesses were giving less to workers in wages and instead giving more to shareholders, including business executives. And it's only got worse since COVID hit. So no, the wealth is not trickling down. It's not trickling down to wages and it's not trickling down to investment and is most certainly not trickling down to those who, because of policy choices made by this government, can't find any work or can't find enough work to make ends meet. We are selling out far too many Australians and particularly we are selling out far too many young Australians. And those young Australians are not just going to inherit a cooked economy, they're going to inherit a cooked planet. We need to do much, much more. The neoliberal agenda is destroying nature, it is driving species to extinction, it is cooking the planet, it is making the already obscenely wealthy even better off. It is skyrocketing wealth inequality. It is privatising, uh, uh, pricing young people out of the housing market. It serves nobody except those who are already wealthy and the big corporations in this country. That's why we need to make sure that the super wealthy and the big corporates pay their fair share of tax so we can fund the essential services that people want governments to deliver. Better hospital systems, better schools, better public transport systems, better support for people living with disabilities. We have the wherewithal to do those things and deliver those public services at a far higher quality than we are now and make them available to far more people than we make them available to now. And we can fund it by taxing the super wealthy and the big corporates. Make them pay their fair share of tax. The super wealthy and the big corporates have been making off like bandits, trousering obscene levels of wealth, while far too many people miss out. The planet continues to cook and the war on nature continues as it has tragically for so many decades. Colleagues, the system is broken. The ecosphere that provides for all life on this planet is groaning under the strain. And as a result, our social contract is beginning to fracture. This will lead to more and more people joining the ever-growing movement for real climate action, to protect nature, to oppose privatisation and deregulation, to make sure that the big corporates and the super wealthy 
pay their fair share of tax so we can fund the public services that Australians expect and demand their governments provide. Now, this bill is a step forward based on the recommendations of the Hain Royal Commission into the banks. That Royal Commission exposed criminal behaviour. It exposed a toxic culture based on greed and an obsession with profit. The banks need to be hauled into line, but this government is starting to waver. Recommendation 1.1 of the Hain Royal Commission not to change responsible lending laws has been screwed up and thrown in the bin by this government. So while we support this legislation, we want to make sure that people understand this government is starting to go weak at the knees in terms of bringing the big banking corporations to heel, and the Greens will fight them every step of the way if they start to once again roll over and let their big corporate donors and their big corporate masters tickle their collective bellies. We're watching you. We don't trust you, and we will hold you to account. Thank you, Senator. Senator Bragg. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise to address the Senate on the Financial Sector Reform Hain Royal Commission Bill, and I start this contribution by reflecting upon where this fits into the liberal tradition and the liberal philosophy in Australia. Uh, I mean, we have always taken the view that we will pursue law reform. Uh, whether it be to address wrongdoing in capital or wrongdoing in a trade union. Uh, that has been our tradition, and I think there is no, no doubt that it took too long to have this Royal Commission. Uh, and once it was up and running, uh, it did show that there was enormous malfeasance uh, going on in the financial sector. And uh, it was to the credit of people who pushed uh, for that particular commission uh, that we now have significant reforms already enacted by this parliament uh, with more to come today. We've already delivered quite a large number of the recommendations. Uh, by the time this bill is passed, 70 per cent of the recommended changes will be the law of Australia. And, uh, the Hain Commission was a broad-based review, so there are so many component parts. Uh, and a couple of them, which have already been enacted, which I think are quite important, uh, include putting a best interest duty in for mortgage brokers, uh, ending the, uh, the gravy train of uh, conflicted remuneration, uh, ensuring that there is a requirement for compulsory membership for AFCA, uh, getting rid of or stopping hawking, uh, but also putting in place laws which end uh, the, the trail of money between super trustees uh, and their clients, which is known as the host plus clause. Uh, so there's been this enormous gravy train washing around uh, in the financial advisor sector, in the super sector, uh, where all the, all the snouts have been in the trough for far too long. And these changes put an end to that and they they must ensure that the financial sector is focused on the, the people that they serve, their clients, their customers, the workers. Now, I think we have a particular duty to, to reflect upon the laws in this area very carefully as a parliament because of the existence of this quite extraordinary experiment of compulsory superannuation, uh, which takes away people's money and gives it to strangers to manage. Uh, usually poorly. Uh, so we must make sure that the workers' money is well looked after and uh, is not being uh, pillaged uh, by banks and by unions. Now, uh, this particular bill uh, deals with financial advice. And its three main components are to put in place opt-in arrangements so that uh, clients have to agree on an annual basis to fees. Now, that is uh, entirely, entirely reasonable and has been the subject of much consternation over the years, but I think uh, 
asking people to agree uh, for ongoing fees makes a lot of sense. Uh, it also takes us into this territory of requiring a disclosure of independence. Now, I, I would say that uh, too few Australians access good, good quality advice, and I think that good quality, good quality financial advice uh, can actually help all Australians. Uh, but it is important that Australians have confidence that that advice that they are receiving is actually in their interests and not in the interests of uh, some other financial fizz gig. Um, and that is what the disclosure requirements in this bill will require. Uh, so that people will know uh, whether or not their financial planner, their financial advisor is conflicted uh, in the advice that they provide. Now, these, this statement of independence, so, that, so basically uh, a planner will no longer be able to hold themselves out as independent uh, if they are not. And this bill will define how that is to occur. And then the financial planner must provide the client with a statement of their independence as part of the financial services guide. Now, there's no doubt the financial services guides are already too long, but I think if we're going to add one more piece of paper, then adding a, an insurance of independence uh, is important because it is true that there has been great malfeasance in this sector, and it, that is a, of great regret. Uh, but it is a sector which is important to our economy, and it's too important to, to let go and let go to the dogs. Uh, and so measures that are designed to bolster independence, credibility and standards like this are absolutely worthwhile doing, which is why the Commissioner recommended them. The third component of this bill puts in place arrangements uh, in relation to my super accounts, which are the default super accounts, uh, so that ongoing advice fees cannot be deducted from my super accounts. Uh, but the provisions will permit there to be uh, one-off or discretionary fees taken from my super accounts at the direction of the individual client. Uh, so there can be no more of the, of the ongoing gravy train where there's fees for no service that roll on forever and ever and ever. Uh, the only fees that will, will be permitted to be taken out of people's default superannuation accounts will be at their discretion and on an individual basis. And that is what uh, that will do. So those, those are effectively the, the three key changes which add to already a very good suite of reforms where, as I say, we have already delivered 70 per cent of the Royal Commission's recommendations. So when the Labor Party come into this chamber and say that we're dragging our feet, uh, it's just not true. 70 per cent uh, within two years is a significant achievement given the breadth and scale of this Royal Commission. Uh, and it's also not true uh, that we are avoiding Haynes' recommendation in relation to responsible lending. I mean, all these contributions are skin deep. Uh, where people say that we're, we're stripping away responsible lending. Responsible lending is embedded in the prudential standards and the, and the standards of law in Australia and will be for all time. When an individual goes to seek a loan from a financial institution, whether it be an ADI bank or whether it be a non-ADI, that institution will have to assess their capacity to repay that loan. And for low-income people, there will be additional protect protections. So, uh, unfortunately, the Labor Party don't seem to be able to muster more than a skin-deep, superficial economic policy and certainly uh, financial policy, other than to run these glib talking points. Responsible lending is embedded in the legal framework and the fabric of Australia, and it will be after our responsible lending reforms pass this parliament. And finally, uh, may I add that this is all incremental change. Uh, all of these changes from the Royal Commission will ultimately build confidence and improve the standards in the financial sector, but it's just one set of reforms. The other reforms we need to continue pursuing uh, is getting workers a better deal in their super, which is why there are structural changes announced in the budget which will further end the gravy train, where this huge experiment of superannuation has been to sit there for 30 years running its own book for its own interests and not considering the interests of the workers upon which the money is run. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy Prior. I, I too rise to make a very short
contribution on this bill. And I, I won't go into the detail of the bill. Senator Bragg's done that very well. Uh, and I will acknowledge uh, the presence of, of Minister Hume in, in, in the chamber at the moment. And I know Minister Hume has, through and with the other portfolio ministers in this space, has consulted extensively on the bill. I guess I do have a few philosophical reflections on the way this parliament and the executive needs to deal with royal commissions. I think it, we have to be very careful, and I'll, I'll use a phrase that's been used in other contexts here, to recognise that a royal commission report is a report to the government, not of the government. Uh, royal commissioners and royal commissions do not have a font of pure wisdom. They do not necessarily provide recommendations that always reflect um, the full breadth of knowledge and information that governments need to take into account. So I, I say that as a word of caution when people, uh, uh, and I say that to those opposite and those on the crossbench, that people uh, start thinking that uh, you know what a royal commissioner recommends has to be implemented 100 per cent is what this parliament's job is to do. I disagree with that. I think we need to look very carefully at royal commissioners' recommendations but then we have to do what is in the best interests of Australia. And I say that in the context of an environment where I want as many Australians as possible to be able to access high quality financial advice. And I, I do fear that uh, the suite of changes that have been made over the past decade have created an environment where the cost of advice will increase and some Australians will not be able to afford high quality financial advice and so we'll be forced to move into more set and forget products uh, like superannuation and I think that is a concern moving forward. So as these measures uh, are implemented I think we do need to send a very strong message to the regulators particularly that we need to always remember that the goal here is to ensure that the financial advice that is out there in the marketplace is of the highest quality but is also affordable and can be delivered in an affordable way so as many Australians as possible can access that advice. Uh, in an environment where you have uh, best interest obligations and where you have an end to trailing commissions, uh, I think perhaps something we could look at in the future is whether the yearly opt-in is the right time frame. To me, one year is not a magical number. Perhaps two years is a more uh, 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 regulatory friendly uh, period uh, to look at into the future. So I would like us to keep, as a chamber, as a parliament, thinking about these things. We need to create an environment where we actually allow Australians, Australian families, Australian businesses to access high quality and affordable financial advice. Thank you, Senator. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President, and I thank you for the opportunity to rise today to speak on the overdue financial sector reform Hain Royal Commission Response No. 2 Bill of 2020. And I want to point out to Australians who are listening, uh, who re do recall the Hain Royal Commission, that this is a really important uh, discussion that's happening here today, and it affects people's lives in a real and material way. People remember the Royal Commission, and it, it's kind of starting to become a bit of a, a back then memory. How long ago was that? You know, was it two years? Was it three years? That's the kind of conversation that will be happening in workplaces. Because it's taken an awful long time, despite the outrage that people felt when they found out what was going on in the back seat, it's taken this government way too long to do things to protect the Australian people. And I've said in speeches this week, I'm sick and tired of them coming in here and going, we, we understand. We understand the challenges. We, we, we care about your, your financial future. We will look after. We are the really good managers of money. I'm sick and tired of them saying how much they care and how little they're actually doing to bring that care into action to provide protections and improvements for the Australian people. And that's what is becoming more and more apparent with this government day in, day out. Two years late, two years late, this legislation. And it shows how reticent the government is to deal with misconduct in the financial sector. Now, this is, in fact, a government that voted against the Banking Royal Commission, let's remember that, 26 times. 
26 times. And, uh, this is a government that is now attacking the industry super sector. And that sector, the people will know it on the television by the two little hands up and down, where the government thought that they were going to have a real good go and attacked industry super. But when the Royal Hand Commission got into it, they found out that hey, hey, the government was wrong, actually. Industry super is doing a really good job looking after workers' money. They didn't like what they found then, and they'll do whatever they can to try and damage the sector that got the clean bill of health from the Hain Royal Commission. But you know, that battle will continue. Today we're talking about a particular matter uh, that concerns uh, financial investment in this country. We see ridiculous attacks coming from those opposite, including Senator Bragg, who's got some of the most outrageous ideas about the superannuation sector. Uh, representing the party in now in this place, who, who said from the very beginning that superannuation couldn't possibly work. They said it would never ever happen, that it would never be good, that the, every small business in Australia would go under. People need to remember the attitude to superannuation that this government had from the very beginning. The reality is, at this point of time, the government forget the massive misconduct in other sectors in the financial industry that needs to be addressed. It wasn't the industry super funds that were charging dead customers. It wasn't the industry super funds that were found to have breached anti-money laundering and counter-terror financing laws 23 million times. And it wasn't the chief of staff of an industry super fund that was found to have embezzled $23 million from members. It was banks and the retail sector that did all of that. The government was dragged, kicking and screaming, into reform of the banking and financial sector, and now its wildcat backbenchers are trying to drag its attention to the wrong industry again. And I think we should be very concerned um, by the comments that I just picked up from Senator Brockman in his very short contribution to this debate. And he is saying, trying to tell Australians that they shouldn't pay too much attention to a Royal Commission report. So let's be clear. 26 times this government, this Liberal National Party government, voted against having a royal commission. Then they were forced to have it because there was a revolt among the, amongst the Nats. And again, I'll, I'll reference uh, Senator John Wacker Williams for a lot of courage on that issue. And now they've tried to bury it for two years. Finally, they're having to do a couple of things. And we've got Senator Brockman saying to the Australian people, oh, look, royal commissions. Don't pay too much attention to them. They, they don't tell you everything that's important. But that's not what they were saying when the Royal Commission delivered their report. On the days after the Royal Commission delivered a report, the government was saying, we agree, we agree. We agree with the recommendations. Well, now, two years later, they're waiting for Australians. They're hoping that Australians have forgotten what happened in that Royal Commission. They're trying to convince Australians, in the contributions we've heard this morning here in this place, that they know better, that they know better about what to do with your money. They know better, the ones who didn't want the Hain Royal Commission. They want Australians to forget it. They want to forget the recommendations. They want Australians not to notice how slow this government is in acting. But right now we've got a government doing something dragged kicking and screaming into reform, and uh, we find we are at this point where there is a bill addressing some of the uh, recommendations. So, To be clear, the bill only addresses four of the remaining uh, 44 financial sector Royal Commission recommendations. Four out of 44. Not too much. Since the report was released in February 2019, five recommendations have been abandoned altogether by the government. And now they're looking to weaken the responsible lending laws, which would leave thousands and thousands of Australians open to predation from people who would exploit them. Now, despite, despite the Royal Commission report explicitly, explicitly saying responsible lending should not be changed, that is the path that the government is heading down. Treasurer Frydenberg is ignoring the expert advice the careful investigation done by no less than a royal commissioner with all the resources at his disposal 
And uh, Mr. Frydenberg is saying, trust me, trust me, my mates across Australia. You know, I'm good friends with, with Scotty. I'm good friends with you. I'll look after you. Trust me, trust me. And just ignore the expert advice and don't, don't pay attention to the fact that uh, I'm going to give dodgy lenders carte blanche to rip off ordinary Australians and leave people wallowing in debt. I heard evidence in the Townsville hearing on the government's new IR bill if, that the increasing casualisation of work is making it harder and harder for many workers to get ordinary lines of credit. Because their work is insecure, banks are saying, we won't help you. And it's into that climate that this government is introducing further risk. Further risk. Australia has one of the highest rates of household debt in the world, and the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, would rather add to that mountain than help give Australians a wage rise. The government in this legislation and so many pieces of legislation in this place reveals to us who are watching closely that they really don't care about workers. Seven years of government, they've still got no plan to raise wages despite industry and the Reserve Bank begging them to do so. Seven years in government and their only idea to get Australia out of a recession is to cut wages. And seven years of delay and distraction on financial sector reform. Now I read in the AFR that the Treasurer will further erode confidence in investors by winding back the continuous disclosure regime. Now this is supposed to allegedly protect directors from some imagined bogeyman of class actions, class actions against directors. But in fact, it's further obfuscating the actions of companies from their shareholders. And there are people in the financial market who are paying attention to this, who are seeing exactly what's going on with this government. You know, the thing is, though, I, I, I've said in, on many occasions in this place, when I was growing up, in Curran Street, Blacktown, in a fibro house that my mum and dad were very, very proud to be able to call home. There wasn't a lot of talk about superannuation in that street. That word didn't come across our dinner table. And when I think about hard-working Australians who are out there doing whatever they can, stitching together insecure work to try and feed their families, they are so busy just keeping their heads above water that they are requiring this government to act in their best interests. There's a degree of trust that's been given to this government that is being abused because this government should be looking after those people who are out there doing the right thing, working, working, work, working and working hard. But in every turn that they get, every opportunity they get, they build risk in for ordinary hard-working people and they constantly drive legislation through this place that advantages those who have the most. I just can't see what the government are doing has any assistance, provides any assistance at all to ordinary mum and dad investors. How does help helping the increasing number of retail investors in the stock market assist normal mums and dads? ASIC themselves have said that the continuous disclosure regime is a fundamental tenet of Australia's market. And for people who don't understand what a continuous disclosure regime is, and a lot of the words in this place seem to be a long way from what normal people talk about, it's about telling people the truth about what you're doing with your big business that's listed on the stock, stock exchange. That's it, pretty much in a nutshell. This is what's going on. And you can see what's going on, and we know if you know what's going on, then you can make sound investment decisions. It's, it's pretty simple, really, even though it's dressed up in those words. We should be strengthening this pillar of continuous disclosure. We shouldn't be bringing it down, yet that is what the government is attempting to do. Desperate times do indeed call for desperate measures, but this decision cements the temporary measures used in a global recession. They've just got wedged in there, and now they are advancing for the long term to the detriment of Australians, to the detriment of people investing in the stock exchange, to the detriment of great super funds seeking to invest for their members in the stock market. They are weakening the measures of this regulatory regime. And I think people 
well, actually, they, they are right, I suppose. They are relying. They are relying on people to be too busy to pay attention while they sneak this sort of dodgy stuff through this place. I watched gobsmacked last year as the Treasurer moved to kneecap litigation funders through rushed and cramped regulations that ASIC spent tens of thousands of dollars on, legal advice that they had to get trying to figure out how to implement the Treasurer's hastily made announcement, which occurred only eight days after he had called on this chamber to undertake an investigation. Everything that you look at with this government smells dodgy deals being done behind closed doors. So much corruption, so much of a lack of transparency. Like there's some special club. I won't even call it a boys' club because the girls on the other side are in on it as well. We, we who have money, we who have a high education, we who live in suburbs that separate us from the riffraff of Australia, we will own this agenda, we will manage it, and we'll just talk to those people at the top of the tree and keep them all on side with us. And they don't care about the long-term impacts on Australians, ordinary, hard-working Australians. It seems to me, uh, Mr President, that this government's learned nothing from the Financial Sector Royal Commission. Now, Mr Morrison can put on his baseball cap and claim that he's an ordinary suburban dad as much as he likes. But what's really going on is he's much more focused on letting large financial institutions off the hook. What he's interested in in his baseball cap is stopping any kind of scrutiny on large companies and on large financial institutions. He can say, and he does say every day in his daggy dad routine, that he's standing up for ordinary Australians, mate. But you just got to get a little bit behind the door, and the street angel is a house devil. Right? A house devil over in the chamber, the green chamber, and he's got a whole lot of friends in the red chamber bringing about his agenda. That's true. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Indeed, only the ones who get promoted. Mr Morrison saying he stands up for Australians is about as truthful as his responses to so many questions about his responsibility. We've got a bushfire. Mate, he's not holding the hose. Okay? We've got a terrible problem in aged care. It's not his responsibility. We've got a COVID pandemic. The states can look after that. And you watch him. He's going to be running from the vaccine problems that his government will inflict on this country. We've seen it already. They're days behind. They'll be weeks behind. I want that vaccine out. I want it in my community. But Mr Morrison is not to be trusted, and he's not to be trusted Order, on the piece Senator of legislation under debate today. Order. Senator O'Neill. Minister. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, firstly, I would like to thank those senators who have contributed to this debate. Schedule 1 to the bill strengthens the protections for consumers who are clients of financial advisers under, on, under ongoing fee arrangements to prevent fees for no service. Under this legislation, each year the client will receive a forward-looking summary of the fees that they will be charged <coughs> and the services that they will be entitled to, in addition to the existing disclosure of fees and services. The fee recipient will need to obtain the client's express written consent prior to fees being deducted from an account held in the client's name, and ongoing fee arrangements will need to be renewed annually instead of once every two years. Schedule 2 of this bill introduces a new disclosure obligation to ensure that financial advisers who are not independent in relation to the provision of personal advice clearly declare that they are not independent and explain the reasons why. Schedule 3 to the bill strengthens protections for individuals against paying fees for no service from their superannuation by prohibiting outgoing, uh, ongoing advice fees in my super 
and increasing the visibility of fees to individuals. And I would like to thank the opposition and also the crossbench for their engagement, uh, a very constructive engagement on all of these issues. The government has committed to establishing a single disciplinary body for financial advisers in line with the recommendation 2.10 or 2.10 of the Hain Royal Commission. In expanding the financial services and credit panel to perform this function, we're committed to ensuring that advisers act in the best interest of their clients and in line with professional standards. Standards are integral to the professionalisation of the financial, services, uh, financial advice industry, and we will work to ensure that the framework that is in place for the industry to enforce these standards is strong. These are very important reforms uh, that will restore the confidence, in, in, uh, uh, the confidence of Australians in Australia's financial system, and I commend this bill to the Senate. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to the financial sector and for related purposes. Yep. Uh, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? Are you saying no? Um, say, I, I, I wish to deal with my amendment, that's all. Sure, I'll just get to the second part. There being no objection, it is so ordered. And uh, Senator Griff, you've got the call. Yes. Senator Patrick, sorry. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I'm sorry, I never went to senator's school, so I don't understand some of these intricacies. Um, the <laughs> um, I just wanted to check with the minister. I heard your summing up uh, speech. I just want to clarify, you're aware of I, I have an amendment um, that has been circulated. I, my understanding from your, from your summing up is that uh, you intend to look at the issues that would remedy uh, the concern that I have in my amendment. Minister. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, on Senator the, Patrick. On that basis, I will not move my amendment. So you withdrawing it? So the question is, the bill standards stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So the question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the financial sector reform Hain Royal Commission response number two, Bill 2020, and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that uh, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I, <laughs> I move that this bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to the financial sector and for related purposes. The government business order of the day number three, Higher Education Support Amendment Freedom of Speech Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Deputy President. Uh, Mr President, Labor will support this bill. This bill uh, adopts uh, the recommendations from the French Review and aligns the current legislation with the French Model Code to strengthen protections for academic freedom and freedom of speech in Australian universities. This legislation inserts a new definition of academic freedom into the Higher Education Support Act and replaces the existing term, free intellectual inquiry, in relevant provisions with the allied concepts of freedom of speech and academic freedom. These are reasonable measures. The Labor Party supports academic freedom. University students and researchers should absolutely be free to follow their intellectual curiosity, to express their opinions and beliefs, and contribute to public debate. All universities have agreed voluntarily to adopt the French Model Code, and the agreement is now included in their mission-based compacts. This should not be a controversial statement. Australia has world-class universities with a reputation for intellectual freedom and academic independence. Gough Whitlam told us that academic freedom is the first requirement, the essential property of a free society. 
more than trade, more than strategic interests, even more than common uh, systems of law or social or political structures, free and flourishing universities provide the true foundation of our Western kinship and define the true commonality of the democratic order. That is as true today as it was then. The fact is, Morrison and the Liberals only like freedom of speech when it suits them. When Senator Birmingham was the Minister for Education, he alone vetoed more than $4 million of Australian Research Council grants because he didn't like the sound of them, an act to universities called reprehensible and which undermined the impartiality of the whole grant process. Former Chief Justice French himself says in the report, and I quote, that from the available evidence, claims of a freedom of speech crisis on Australian campuses are not substantiated. The only reason this bill has been introduced when it has Order. is that Senator this McAllister, government you will be has done a deal with Pauline Hanson. When Hansen. debate resumes. Senator Dunham. Uh, thanks, Mr President. I table a response to Senate Order for Production of Documents No. 1034 on the matter of the re reviews being undertaken by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinets. Thank you. It being 11.45, I'll ask for notices of motion for another day. Are there any notices? Senator Fieravanti Wells. Mr. President, pursuant to notice given yesterday on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw business of the Senate notices of motion numbers one to three for the next day of sitting, business of the Senate notices of motion numbers one and four for five sitting days after today, and business of the Senate notices of motion numbers four and six for eight sitting days after today. Thank you. Senator Macdonald. Uh, I withdraw general business notice of motion number 1035 standing in my name for today. Thank you. Is there a report from the selection of bills committee? Senator oh, sorry, Senator Urquhart, my apologies. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted, Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Keneally for Thursday, the 25th of February 2021, for personal reasons. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Smith. Mr. President, I also seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Molan. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Molan for today for medical reasons. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I will now proceed to. Um, is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Smith. There is. Thank you very much. Mr President, I present the third report of 2021 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Smith. I move that the report be adopted. Oh. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Senator Dunningham. Uh, Mr President, I move that a government business orders of the day, as shown on today's order of business, be considered from 12.45 pm today. b government business be called on after consideration of the bills listed in paragraph A and considered till not later than 2 pm today. And c general business notice of motion number 1038 be considered during general business today. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I will call the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Oh, sorry, Senator Smith. Uh, Mr. President, if I may, I'd just like to move an extension. Oh, sorry, the authorisation of a committee to meet during today. Leave granted. Leave is granted, Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the chair of the Select Committee on Autism, Senator Hughes, I seek leave to move a motion to enable the committee to meet during the sitting of the Senate today. So I'll take it. Leave has been granted and put the motion. Those in support of the motion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. That the Select Committee on Autism be authorised to hold. I've already done that, Senator. Smith. Oh, great. Thank yep. you, Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I um, withdraw General Business Notice for Motion Number 1039, standing in the name of Senator Carr for today. Thank you. Um, the clerk has no um, postponements or extensions, so there being no other matters, I will proceed to the discovery of formal business. And it being Thursday, I'll go in the order on the notice paper. So, business of the Senate matter number one, Senator Hanson. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator 
Uh, business of the Senate, matter number two, in the name of Senator Kitching. Is there, I'm not sure if you're in a position, Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I uh, move that business of the Senate, number two, standing in the name of Senator Kitching, for today. Um, is there any objection to that being taken? Sorry, as be moved. <laughs> Sorry. There being none, I'll take it. Senator Urquhart has just I moved move the it. motion. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunyam, Government Business Number One. Uh, Mr. President, I ask that Government Business Notice of Motion Number One be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunyam. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Special Recreational Vessels Act 2019, and for related purposes. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunyam. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Special Recreational Vessels Act 2019 and for related purposes. Senator Dunham. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? It's been granted in accordance with Standing Order 111. Further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 11th of May 2021. I'll now proceed to general business. Senators Hanson and Roberts, 1029. Senator Hanson. Yeah, thank you. I ask that general business notice of uh, motion number 1029 be taken as the formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr President. Um, in November 2018, the government announced uh, its response to the Callaghan Review, uh, which is available on the Treasury website. The government has implemented a majority of the recommendations from the Callaghan Review, including reducing the uplift rates that apply to carried forward expenditure. The government has also set up processes to address other recommendations relating to gas transfer pricing for LNG projects. Uh, legislation giving effect to the key changes came into force on 1 July 2019. I'll go to Senator Waters, then I'll come to you, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thanks, President. I too seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, President. Uh, the Greens do support this motion, but we have a different view of why a gas-fired recovery would be a disaster for this country. Gas companies have sacked 10 per cent of their already small workforce. They've taken our gas resources royalty-free. They've polluted our atmosphere. They've avoided tax but somehow kept up their political donations, and they've shipped the rest of their profits offshore. For the last year of tax data, 28 gas companies operating in Australia generated $55 billion of revenue and did not pay one single cent of tax. $55 billion revenue, zero tax. Australians do not want these guys to be the so-called saviours of Australia's COVID recovery. The Callaghan Review only mildly reigns in future gas projects, which of course the International Energy Agency has said we cannot allow if we want to avoid a climate breakdown. Implementing the recommendations won't touch the tax-avoiding, planet-pilfering, profit-shifting gas projects that are currently in operation. So while we support the intent of the motion, even if it were adopted, it would not change the exploit and loot culture of Australia's gas Order, industry. Senator Waters. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Senator Roberts and Senator Hanson have clearly identified the government's failure to deliver affordable gas supply to Australians. Labor has consistently advocated for robust government action to ensure affordable domestic gas supply. Despite its spin, the government has consistently failed to deliver on gas policy, contributing to record prices in recent years. This is typical of the government's chaos and division on energy policy, including 22 policies in just eight years. We won't be supporting this motion today, but the Petroleum Resource Rent Tax Review made many sensible recommendations and the government should report back on their implementation. The question is the motion moved by Senators Hanson and Robert 1029 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1029 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith. Tell off the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 45, noes 20. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber. Senator McMahon, could I come to your matter number 1036? Senator McMahon. Motion number 1036. Sorry, I'll wait till your microphone gets turned on, Senator McMahon. Okay. Go. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1036 relating to juvenile crime in the Northern Territory be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I seek leave to move uh, general business notice of motion 1036 and for the motion to be determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? No, leave is not granted. I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent general business notice of motion number 1036 being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. It requires an absolute majority. I appoint Senator Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Lambie, teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 64, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Dunningham. Question. The question is the motion number 1036 be agreed to? Yes, Senator Thorpe. I'll ask them to turn your mic on because everyone. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a one minute statement. Um, I I think we are tabling at this particular point, but you can do anything by leave. Would you like to table it or would you like to ask for leave to speak to it, Senator Thorpe? I uh, seek leave to make a one minute statement. Is leave granted? And leave is not granted, but you're welcome to table it, Senator Thorpe. I've been informed. Seek leave to table. Leave is granted to table it. Senator Gallagher? Leave to table um, the Labor Party's response to notice of motion 1036. Leave is granted. I'll now put the motion, number 1036. Those of that opinion say aye. Those, does someone want to vote? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. On both sides of the chamber, across the chamber, please. Senator Thorpe.
lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1036 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith, tell off the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell off the noes. Order. The result of the division is eyes 33, noes 28. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Could we come to matter number 1037, Senator Patrick? Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I ask the general business notice of motion number uh, 1037 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senators Pratt and Kitching, number 1040. I'm not sure if. You're in a position there, Senator Urquhart? Uh, I am not, but I will try and get through this if my memory serves me. I uh, move uh, general business leave. motion 1040. And is there any objection to that motion <laughs> being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Urquhart, there is. Okay. Senator Gallagher. I seek leave to move motion number 1040 and that it be determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? Senator. This would prevent me from moving motion number 1040 and that it be determined without amendment or debate. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. It requires an absolute majority. I point Dean, Senator Dean Smith, tell her for the ayes. Senator Lambie, tell her for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 62, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber. The bells will be rung for one minute. Senator Gallagher. Um, notice of motion number 1040 in Senator Pratt's name. Senator Dunningham. Uh, statement from the government on our position on this motion. Thank you. The question is that motion number 1040 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The doors. Question is motion number one zero four zero be agreed to. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell for the eyes and Senator Smith tell for the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator McKim, could I come to your matter number 1041, please? Uh, thank you, President. I inform the Senate that Senator Wish Wilson will co-sponsor this motion, and I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1041 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr. President. The Bob Brown Foundation and the Greens only have themselves to blame. As has been advised, their activity was denied because they have a history of conducting unsafe and unauthorised events on land managed by Sustainable Timber Tasmania. In contrast, those undertaking safe Order. recreational activities are regularly welcome to STT managed land. Runners, bushwalkers, fishers, bike riders, and kayakers are among the many users who have access and importantly provide support to surrounding regional Tasmanian tourism Senator businesses. McKim. And STT will always welcome events organised for those who do so safely. Order. The question is that motion number 1041 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1041 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. need silence to count. Senator McKim, the whips need to be able to um, talk to the tellers.
The result of the division is eyes 50. Oh, sorry, eyes 12, nose 50. The matter is resolved in the negative. We have one last matter to deal with. Senators, matter number 1042. The name of Senator McAllister. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1042 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is being none. The motion is moved. The question is the motion that motion number 1042 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Yeah, yeah. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1042 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes and Senator Smith tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. I know Senator Gallagher is going to seek the call to. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Could I ask that Senator Hanson's name be added to motion number 1040? Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator, Senator Hanson's Hansen. name is added to that. Senators, if they could take their seats or vacate the chamber for our next items of business. The President has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of a committee. I call the Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that Senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the Chamber. The question is that the motion moved by the Minister be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence, the Fair Work Amendments supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2021 and Regulatory Powers Standardisation Reform Bill 2020. I call the Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and uh, be now read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by the Minister be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Fair Work Amendment Supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2021, Regulatory Powers Standardisation Reform Bill 2020. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the Fair Work Amendment Supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2021 and move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned and the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Narcotic Drugs Amendment Medicinal Cannabis Bill 2021 for concurrence. I call the minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Narcotic Drugs Act 1967 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, in accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 11th of May 2021. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number three, Higher Education Support Amendment Freedom of Speech Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McAllister, I believe you're in continuation. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, earlier in my remarks, I was reflecting on the reason that this bill is before us today, because former Chief Justice French has said that from the available evidence, claims of a freedom of speech crisis on Australian campuses are not substantiated. So why the rush? Well, the truth is that this, like so many other things propagated by this government, is all about politics. And the only reason the only reason this bill has been introduced is that this government has done a deal, another deal, with Senator Hanson and One Nation to pass laws to cut funding to universities and to jack up fees. Because Mr Morrison and his ministers are 
absolutely nowhere to be seen when it comes to actually standing up for Year 12 students. Our Year 12 students who, after a year from hell, are dealing with remote learning, the uncertainty of a global health pandemic, the uncertainty of the economic crises arising from the pandemic, the worst jobs market for decades. What is this government delivering for them? Well, American-sized debt. Debts of up to $60,000 to get a basic degree. Shame. No Australian should miss out on the job they want or the education they need because they can't afford it. We're in a recession. One in three young people are looking for work or wanting more hours, but Mr Morrison would rather see them on the dole queue than getting an education. We should be encouraging as many young people as possible to get a university education or to study at TAFE in order to get the skills they need to rebuild Australia. And the fact is that despite the ridiculous rhetoric coming from the government, these changes will not deliver on what they promise. This legislation is built on perverse incentives. Experts have pointed this out. The commentators have pointed this out, including the former Liberal Education Minister, Julie Bishop. This legislation will actually achieve the opposite of what the government says it will. It will discourage universities from offering STEM places. That's what the sector is telling us. Overall, the Liberals' new funding model will cut total funding for these degrees. Science and Technology Australia have said that the Job Ready Graduates package will cut the level of funding for universities to teach STEM courses by $690 million next year alone. It will lead to a 17 per cent drop in funding for maths courses, a 16 per cent drop in funding for science and engineering courses, a 29 per cent drop for engineering courses. Universities have provided evidence that the practical effect of these, courses, uh, these changes will be to limit the number of STEM places that they offer. And at the Senate inquiry into the bill, the interim vice-chancellor at the University of Adelaide told us this. And I quote, if a university is one science student below its quota, its cap, then adding one science student takes it up to its cap, or it could add 15 humanities students instead. Adding one science student is going to net the university around 24,000. 15 humanities students will net around 235,000. 235,000, 24,000. I think I understand what a rational actor in this system would choose. Swinburne University has told us that 46 per cent of its students are in fields that will experience reductions in net funding. And these cuts will have enormous impacts on our universities and enormous impacts on our labour market. Universities have also told us that these funding changes for STEM will lead to further cuts to research staff in this sector. Labor will always encourage students to follow their passion, to do what interests them. That is what leads to a fulfilling and productive career. That is what leads to the kind of innovation, productivity, the kind of contribution that is necessary to build a rich, deep, complex economy capable of sustaining Australian communities into the future. A student is not going to take up a degree because it's a bit cheaper. There is no evidence for this. After wide consultation, the James Cook University Student Association overwhelmingly found that their members do not pick courses based on fees. A student who is passionate about studying in the humanities will not enrol in a nursing course simply because nursing is cheaper. Early data from university admission centres is already showing us that this is the case. The Queensland Tertiary Admission Centre has shown that applications for enrolment in society and culture courses have actually increased by more than 10 per cent. And the available New South Wales and ACT admissions data tells a similar story. Labor will support legislation that strengthens academic freedom in our universities, but it is disgraceful that Mr Morrison and the Liberals and Nationals have teamed up with One Nation to introduce this bill purely in order to get a vote to pass their university fee hikes, making it harder and more expensive for Australians to get a university education. Uh, thank you, Senator McAllister. Uh, I'm in the hands of the Chamber, Senator Faruqi. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak on the Higher Education Support Amendment Freedom of Speech Bill 2020. Um, this bill amends the Higher Education Support, Support Act 2003 to provide a new definition of academic freedom. 
um, that enshrines in law principles of freedom of expression and substitutes the existing term free intellectual inquiry in relevant provisions with the term freedom of speech and academic freedom to align the language of provisions within the model code proposed by Robert French. Universities have been voluntarily adopting the model code or variations of the code since 2019 and this bill would have the effect of ensuring that the relevant academic freedom provisions of the Higher Education Support Act fairly closely reflect what is being adopted on campuses across the country. Academic freedom is essential in our universities. University staff must be free to conduct their teaching and research and feel comfortable testing and extending the boundaries of academic debate and academic inquiry. Mm -hmm. Simply, our universities should be places where the envelope can be pushed and where mainstream thinking can be challenged. Indeed, some of the great civil rights struggles in this country from feminist and LGBTQI movements to First Nations justice movements in the 1960s, um, of which staff and students of our universities were part and parcel of, because they were unafraid Order. to challenge Senator dominant Faruqi. orthodoxies. It being 12.45, we move to non-controversial government business, and I have a message from the House of Representatives. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the National Collecting Institutions Legislation Amendment Bill 2024 concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by the Minister be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, I call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to national collecting institutions and for related purposes. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to exempt this bill from the bill's cut-off order. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to this bill. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I table a statement of reasons justifying the need for this bill to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Brown. This bill impacts six of the national collecting institutions, the Australian National Maritime Museum, the National Film and Sound Ar Archive of Australia, the National Gallery of Australia, the National Library of Australia, the National Museum of Australia and the Nat National Portrait Gallery of Australia. This bill was subject to a short Senate inquiry on which all six institutions appeared to give, appeared to give their views and discuss the consultation process. I thank those who appeared for their time. There are two main parts to the bill. Schedule 1 makes a major change to the investment mandate of these institutions. Under the current Public Gover Governance Performance and Accountability Act 2013, the institutions are subject to a high level of restriction in terms of how they can invest any funds they receive which exceed their operating costs, such as private donations. For instance, in the current ultra-low interest rate environment, some of them are having to hold these funds in cash. The inquiry heard that this was an impediment to private philanthropy as donations wish to know that their money is being used to the maximum financial benefit for the institution. The change contained in this bill would allow for the institutions to invest in higher risk, higher return investments with the hope of attracting greater private philanthropy. There would be important checks and balances to ensure funds were invested properly. Representation, uh, representatives of the inst institutions gave evidence at the inquiry that they, ha that they had requested this change themselves, and so Labor accepts there is a valid, ne valid need for change. I would, ha however, like to echo my colleague in the House, the Shadow Minister for the Arts, who raised concerns that this change m must never be used as a pretext to lessen public funding for our national institutions. The government has a terrible track record in terms of funding these vital institutions, which, which are the keepers and promoters of Australian stories, most notably 
through cuts administered under the Abbott government, so Labor will be monitoring the situation closely. Section 2 of the Bill makes a number of changes which the explanatory memorandum of the Bill explains as an attempt to harmonise the legislation that governs the six institutions so that it is more consistent. What this means is that some of the institutions are subject to rules and regulations for the first time. For instance, both the National Library and the National Gallery would join the other institutions in becoming subject to ministerial direction. Any provision which allows for potential ministerial interference in terms of how a national institutions are run should be treated with caution. However, Labor is reassured by evidence given at the recent inquiry hearing that this power has never been used for any institution since 2013 and that any direction must be of a general nature only. Again, Labor will be monitoring this situation to ensure the expansion of this power to the National Gallery and National Library is not misused. In summary, Labor will not stand in the way of this piece of legislation given the supportive evidence heard from the institutions themselves at the Senate inquiry. In conclusion, however, I would urge the government to not think its job is done by just giving these, the institutions what they want in terms of legislation. They need funding after years of being undermined by, the gov by government cuts. They are in too, too important to lose. I commend the legislation to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Brown. Minister. Uh, I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that this bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to national collecting institutions and for related purposes. I understand there will be no committee stage required on this bill unless anyone in the chamber wishes to ask for it. Uh, therefore, the question is, uh, therefore I call the minister. The bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to national collecting institutions and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number four, education services for overseas students amendment, refunds of charges and other measures bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you. Labor will support this bill. This bill will enable the minister. I'll order Senator Brown. Senator Faruqi. You'll have the call. Sorry, oh, this is sorry, not Senator that. Sorry, Senator Faruqi. Oh. We've still got one more. Non sorry. That's all sorry, right. Sorry. <laughs> I know that you have the call once we do go back to, non uh, to um, government business. Thank you. Senator Brown. Thank you. Uh, Labor will support this bill. This, this bill enables the minister to provide regulatory fee relief through the refunding of charges charges in the, future, in the future if special circumstances are met. It also makes administrative changes to the operation of key costs, registration re requirements to make it easier for international students to take on additional training courses while complying with their visa rules. Labor is not opposed to these changes. However, we will continue to monitor the, monitor the operation of the refunding regime to ensure that it is used only in exceptional circumstances and not just to line the pockets of dodgy providers. Thank you, Senator Brown. Minister. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator? Oh, apologies. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Education Services for Overseas Students Act 2000 and for related purposes. I was getting ahead of myself, Clark. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I call the minister to move the third reading. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Education Services for Overseas Students Act 2000 and for related purposes. I just have one message before we return to business. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Treasury Laws Amendment News Media and Digital, Manda uh, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2021. I call the clerk. Business of a, uh, sorry, government business, order of the day number three, Higher Education Support Amendment, Freedom of Speech Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, as I was saying, 
Academic freedom is essential to our universities. University staff must be free to conduct their teaching and research and feel comfortable testing and extending the boundaries of academic debate and inquiry. Simply, our universities should be places where the envelope can be pushed and where mainstream thinking can be really challenged. Indeed, some of the great civil rights struggles in this country, from feminists to LGBTQI movements to First Nations justice movements in the 1960s, um, had staff and students at our universities as part and parcel of those movements because they were unafraid to challenge dominant orthodoxies. They expressed their free speech in support of oppressed people and in opposition to significant government positions such as Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War. Sometimes free speech on campus can stray into territory that can be uncomfortable for governments and other authorities. But academic freedom is under challenge. In recent years, we have seen examples of education ministers intervening to deny funding to Australian Research Council grants. After one such incident in 2018, when the then education minister, Senator Birmingham, denied ARC funding to numerous researchers, the president of the Australian Academy of Humanities characterized the intervention as political interference, which was entirely at odds with a nation that prides itself on free and open critical inquiry. We know that this government hates arts and social sciences. They actually hate universities as well, hence the job-ready graduates package of fee hikes and funding cuts. Late last year, though, of course, this parliament passed um, new foreign interference laws that universities were deeply concerned about, given the power they provided ministers to overreach and rip up agreements between Australian universities and international organizations or governments that underpin vital research and arrangements for joint degrees, cultural and student exchanges. The Greens moved to have universities excluded from the bill, but this was shamefully not supported by either the government nor the opposition. While defending academic freedom and freedom of speech, though, we must be clear that these freedoms are not absolute. Hate speech is unacceptable on our campuses and everywhere else in society. Over time, this parliament has passed landmark legislation, such as the Racial Discrimination Act, which acknowledges that there are limits to acceptable speech in our community. But too often in this country and in this chamber, zealots who wish for nothing more than the freedom of expression to be hateful and have bigoted views have justified their advocacy through appeals to an overriding principle of freedom of speech at all costs. Well, people in this community pay the cost of that. Thankfully, though, this is not what this bill will do. Another aspect of this bill concerns criticism of universities by their own workers. University staff must be free to critique their institutions without fear of reprisals. This is particularly important at a time when higher education staff are facing substantial disruption to their workplaces. The latest estimates from Universities Australia suggest that upwards of 17,000 jobs were lost in 2020. There may be many more casual staff that aren't even being counted in these numbers as they've been collected. Universities are embarking upon substantial and not uncontroversial job slashing and cost cutting plans caused at least in part by the government's failure to support the sector during the pandemic. It's important that staff feel they can criticize their institutions without any adverse consequences. The Greens support efforts to protect academic freedom. On this principle, we do not oppose this bill because it will provide some clarity on what is meant by academic freedom on our campuses. But the bill shies away from tackling the real matter at hand, enforceable and meaningful protections for academic freedom. The government should be ensuring that academic freedom is legally protected 
and an enforceable part of bargaining agreements. The Greens also have concerns about the scope of the bill. We are concerned that the current drafting is too narrow with respect um, to which staff the academic freedom provisions apply to. And I will be moving an amendment to ensure that instead of exclusively academic staff benefiting from the provisions, the provisions relate to all staff engaged in ac academic activities. As a former university professor, I know all too well that academic work is not the exclusive domain of those in the institutions who are formally classed or formally employed as teaching and research academics who obtain um, doctorates and follow a traditional academic career pathway. Much academic work is undertaken by others in the university system, perhaps most obviously professional staff who may from time to time deliver lectures, engage in research, and otherwise contribute to academic activities of their institutions. Research assistants can also fall into this category and are employed as professional staff at certain institutions. It makes no sense for this bill to carve out academic freedom provisions to only pertain to academic staff. It does not recognize the nature of work in a modern university where many staff from across the institution may engage collaboratively in teaching, research, and scholarship. I note that institutions adopting the model code have considered this limitation already. The University of Sydney, for example, has drafted uh, its Charter of Freedom of Speech and Academic Freedom to encompass all staff in the course of their academic activities. While giving our support to this bill and proposing an amendment that would expand its scope um, to more university workers and affiliates. I should note that the Greens are under no illusions about where this bill principally came from. It was a dirty deal, firstly done between um, the coalition government and One Nation. Uh, there are, or there has been, something of a confected free speech crisis on our campuses as well which was a favorite of fear-mongering campaign of right-wing culture warriors several years ago and has been kicked along for the benefit of a select few Murdoch columnists. It has to be said, though, that it feels a little bit stale in 2021. The French Review concluded in no uncertain terms, claims of freedom of speech crisis in Australian campuses are not substantiated. So we know where the bill has come from, at least in part. But despite this, the bill does to an extent clarify universities' rights and responsibilities regarding freedom of speech and academic freedom. So the Greens can provide our support and we look forward to discussing our amendment at the committee stage. Senator Ferravanti Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to make a contribution on this uh, important bill, and I'd like to start my comments by referring to an article, uh, uh, an opinion piece in the Australian by Professor Greg Craven, on the 27th of July last year, and he states. Uh, on this issue, and he'd been talking about academic freedom, and most particularly in relation to Peter Reid, and I'll come to that later. And he states, the problem is that those outside the uh, academy increasingly suspect universities are more interested in their public image and not upsetting their department of woke than protecting fundamental academic freedom. He says, uh, universities typically have two types of problem with freedom of academic expression. The first is corporate. That is where an academic writes something that could rile a major stakeholder, a sponsoring corporation, a government partner or, frankly, China. And we've seen pl plenty of examples where that has happened. Vice chancellors, he goes on to say, understandably but not heroically, feel for their institutional wallet. The second assault, he says, on academic freedom is more insidious because it is internal. An academic strikes trouble because he or she writes something counter to the accepted wisdom of their faculty or university as a whole. This was the challenge, of course, um, that we saw with the Ramsey Centres. 
and there was a lot of uh, kerfuffle uh, about that. And they did not, as Professor Craven uh, correctly points out, they didn't fit the dominant paradigm, which was one the subversive uh, position. Now, in an editorial in the Australian on the 4th of January this year, uh, the editorial goes on to talk about the blinkered, narrow approach of some universities has been clear in recent years in, controver in controversies over Chinese-backed Confucius Institutes, Danish economist, economist Bjorn Lomborg's futile uh, efforts to set up a centre in Australia, James Cook University sacking of outspoken physicist Peter Reid and problems encountered by the Ramsey Centre on various um, uh, campuses. And I commend uh, those comments uh, to the Chamber. Of course, the recent threats that we've seen from uh, the Chinese ambassador and, of course, China itself most um, clearly in uh, recent times is symptomatic, symptomatic, and I have said this repeatedly, of the predicament we find ourselves in, noting that there, were, there have been years of questionable, defective foreign and trade policy which has made us vul vulnerable to economic coercion. And those who have been responsible for our fellow traveller foreign policy were prepared to ignore communist China's skullduggery so long as the rivers of gold continued to flow. A very bad business model. And nowhere was it more obvious than at our universities in their failure to diversify and reliance on overseas students and most especially on the China market. In fact, it was so clear um, that they, they weren't even following the basic 101 uh, business uh, practices of their own business schools about diversification. They were happy to take a lot of money from China in exchange being prepared to stifle free speech so long as those rivers of gold were flowing. And this was very clear in the evidence that was presented to the Senate uh, hearing uh, and Senate inquiry, which I participated in in relation to the Foreign Relations Bill. And I'd like to reiterate uh, concerns that I have previously raised and I raised in my second reading speech in relation to those bills. And at that time, I specifically referred to the evidence that had been given by the university sector and how concerned I was to note the negative attitude of the universities, not just to the bills, but also that the government would even presume to affect that sector's activities through the enactment of foreign relations bills. Very happy to take the taxpayers' coin, but not happy, not happy to conform with Australia's foreign policy and find themselves having to comply uh, with um, a set of norms and parameters, but more importantly, happy to take the taxpayers' money but not conform to principles of allowing free speech on their campuses. Now, as I said, the university sector, together with, I have to say, a wide chorus of businessmen and women, have urged us to effectively ignore the communist regime's many excesses in favour of the continuation of the rivers of gold. So what has been happening on our university campuses? Now, we know um, that they have, uh, many of our universities in Australia have relied on funds from the Chinese Ministry of Education called Hanban through the uh, Confucius Institutes. And of course, let's not forget that the Confucius Institutes at our university provide teachers, textbooks and operating funds. Uh, and in Australia, the first institute was established in 2005. And since then, there are now 14 Confucius Institutes located on 13 university campuses. And one only has to look at the disgraceful uh, conduct uh, of universities and university academics led by their chancellor 
and vice chancellor at the University of Queensland and what happened to young Drew Pavlou to see um, the insidious way that uh, the Chinese communist regime has infiltrated our universities. And of course, we also let's look at the tentacles that the communist regime has um, inserted uh, into our university sector through the Thousand Talents program. Now, we know that universities do incredibly important uh, research often, and they receive large large sums of public money. And of course, we need to protect um, that intellectual property. We need to protect it from cyber attacks and incursions, especially on free speech. And as I said, it's been very, very clear that an, quite a number of our universities here in Australia have been happy to turn a blind eye to the activities of the communist regime, so long as those rivers of gold were flowing into their coffers. And, uh, that, I think, necessitates uh, this government uh, now enacting a freedom of speech uh, bill. And the fact that we actually have to do this, uh, I think, reflects poorly on the university sector. Now, this bill will provide uh, protections in relation to academic freedom and freedom of speech. It gives effect to the recommendations uh, of the French uh, review, the independent 2009 review into freedom of speech in higher education. Now, the bill will provide a new definition of academic freedom uh, that enshrines in law those principles of freedom of expression that are so important to the life of universities, both for academic staff and for students. Um, now, the definition closely aligns with the recommendation of the French Review, but it also includes some modifications recommended by the University Chancellor's uh, Council, which were developed in consultation uh, with former uh, Ch uh, Chief Justice French. Now, this modification excludes one element uh, the freedom of academic staff without constraint imposed by reason of their employment by the university to make lawful public comment on any issue in their personal capacities. That was part of the definition originally recommended by uh, Mr French and included in the proposed model code. As part of the consultations on the proposed definition, it has been suggested that this element is more about freedom of speech than academic freedom and ought not to be conflated with the definition of academic freedom. I have some concerns uh, about that, uh, but um, I, I think that um, uh, at this point uh, in time, uh, it is important that we do, um, whilst I appreciate the argument for a clear delineation between academic freedom and freedom of, of speech. Um, that is what we're really talking about here, and um, uh, I will reserve my comments on that uh, for another time. I'm very pleased to see that in the Illawarra, where my electorate office is based, and the University of Wollongong um, was very quick to respond uh, to the finding of the French review and completed its own internal uh, review of its existing policies and procedures and to ensure uh, that it fully complied with the model code uh, proposed by the French review. I'm also very pleased that the University of Wollongong was at the forefront with the establishment of a, its own Ramsey-backed degree in Western civilisation. Um, whilst there was some uh, controversy, uh, I have to commend the university uh, for the way that they handled that and um, the rather smooth transition to the establishment uh, of the um, Ramsey degree at the University of Wollongong. Of course, one of the very um, nasty episodes that we have seen in relation to freedom of speech uh, is in relation to uh, Professor uh, Peter Reid. And as um, the uh, former Education uh, Minister uh, Dan Tian said uh, and was quoted in an article uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald on the 28th of October uh, last year. Um, he ad advocates that the legal definition of academic freedom, which had been resisted by some universities, would have protected the sacking of marine phys uh, physics academic Peter Reid. 
And, uh, indeed, he said on Sky News that the legal advice that I have is that they wouldn't have, uh, have been able to prosecute Peter Ridd if this law had been in place. In, indeed, um, in an um, uh, editorial in The Australian on the 9th of December uh, last year, uh, the editorial says time for action on uni speech. Uh, it notes nothing, and I quote, nothing better epitomises the conformist climate on our campuses than the appalling treatment of Peter Reid by James Cook University. Professor Reid reluctantly became the focal point in the battle for intellectual freedom on our campuses following his termination by JCU. And it then goes on to say that there is a crisis of intellectual freedom and freedom of speech in universities, um, which is beyond dispute, and the Ridd case is but the most conspicuous symptom of the malaise. For years, the anecdotal evidence has mounted of, triggers, of trigger warnings, safe spaces, and no platforming of figures such as Bettina Arndt, who challenged the modern canon of um, identity uh, politics. Uh, indeed, um, I'm very pleased now to see that the High Court will be uh, making a determination in relation to Peter Ridd, and I do sincerely hope um, that uh, it does come down in his favour. I want to conclude my remarks today of say, uh, to say that I hope that this model code uh, will change uh, practices on university campuses. However, I won't be holding my breath. When I see two incidences, and I'd like to uh, put those on the record, one was uh, referred to in an article in the Sydney Morning Herald of the 4th of August last year, and it relates to the University of New South Wales, which boldly urges its students to bring your differences. However, uh, recent ex experience, and I quote from the article, suggests that the university might be more interested in damage control than an open marketplace uh, of ideas. And this, but this is a test of academic freedom that UNSW can't afford to fail. And of course, it relates to uh, the actions taken in relation to Australian Director of Human Rights Watch and adjunct um, lecturer at the uh, university. Uh, Elaine Pearson and the disgraceful behaviour of the university in relation uh, to um, what she had been saying um, in relation to the Chinese government's threats to academic freedom in Australia. But I conclude with something which really appalled me, and which was the front page of the tele Daily Telegraph, um, which says, Woke kills mum and dad, uni radical new gender neutral parenting guide. I cannot believe that my former alma mater, the, the Australian National University, is prepared to go down the road with this sort of garbage. And can I say to its chancellor, after having served in this place for so long, how can you possibly allow this sort of thing to happen at one of our universities, which is supposed to be one of our leading ones? Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. This bill inserts a definition of academic freedom and freedom of speech into the Higher Education Support Act. Including such a definition was a recommendation of the French Review into Freedom of Speech in Higher Education. Most in the university sector are prepared to live with this bill, although I'm pretty sure that they are tired of the government devoting so much of its time in higher education uh, to culture wars on student campuses. Including it was also a condition of One Nation's support for the job ready graduate program, another example where this government uh, has made concessions to One Nation and we should retain some vigilance about the government's preponderance to reach agreements uh, with the One Nation party. The genesis of this bill tells us a great deal about the government's priorities. The bill, as I said, is the product of the French Review. A great deal of time, attention and government resources has been spent responding to a single protest at the University of Sydney. In September 2018, Bettina Arndt was invited by the Sydney University Liberal Club for a talk, talk entitled, Is There a Rape Campus on Campuses? Is There a Rape Crisis on Campuses? as part of her fake rape tour across university campuses. The talk was picketed 
by members of the Sydney University Women's Collective, uh, an organisation that was founded before some of the senators in this place were born uh, and has played a very good role at the University of Sydney advocating for women's rights. That uh, exclusively women's picket uh, of an organisational event, uh, mostly of men, uh, became violent and police were called. Mazant has a history of extreme views on sexual assault and domestic violence. She's, replete, she's repeatedly downplayed domestic violence. She claims it's a myth and a feminist narrative. She's claimed that the high incidences of sexual assault and rape on university campuses is a fiction cooked up by Australian feminists. She's repeatedly lied about being a clinical psychologist. In 2005, Arndt discussed with convicted pedophile Robert Potter in an article in the Courier Mail, a scoutmaster who had molested four boys. She described Mr Potter as a good bloke, argued that such minor abuse rarely has lasting consequences. In 2017, Arndt interviewed a twice convicted pedophile on YouTube. A 17-minute video with Mr Nicholas Bester, a teacher convicted of raping his former student. The title was Feminists Persecute Disgraced Teacher. Mr. Arndt accused the victim, Ms. Arndt accused the victim of sexually provocative behaviour. She said, the question that remains for me is whether there is any room in this conversation for talking to young girls about behaving sensibly and not exploiting their seductive power to ruin the lives of men. That's what she said. The victim of that assault was Grace Tame, who is now the Australian of the Year. Most recently, Ms Arndt suggested that Rowan Baxter, who murdered his wife and three children in a suburban Brisbane street, might have been driven too far. It is quite reasonable that students who are concerned about the treatment of women in universities would object to those views being spread on their campus. Particularly since only a year earlier, a survey was released reporting that 25 per cent of women in, in University of Sydney residential colleges had reported sexual harassment, an endemic culture of violence and harassment. Rather than being ashamed that a university branch of their own political party would be associated with such views, the Morrison government decided that it reflected a crisis of left-wing protesters shutting down speech on campuses. The then minister, Mr Tian, said, we must ensure our universities are places that protect all free speech even where what is being said may be unpopular or challenging. And so retired High Court Justice French was appointed to lead a review of freedom of speech. And as a lingering insult to those students, to the victims of sexual assault on campus and to women across the country, the Morrison government awarded Ms Arndt the Order of Australia Medal for her services to gender equality. There is no crisis of freedom of speech on Australian university campuses. Those aren't my words. Robert French is very clear in his final report. He says, from the available evidence, however, claims of a freedom of speech crisis on campuses are not substantiated. He then goes on to say, this review has been instigated in part because of a perception by some in government and by elements of the community of a restrictive approach to freedom of speech at Australian universities in its freestanding sense and as an aspect of academic freedom. That perception has developed as a response to a relatively small number of high-profile cases. Those are the words of a government-initiated report, chaired by their hand-picked justice. And this confected, self-serving, grievance narrative from people on the other side about free speech on campuses, just because somebody who was smarter than you at university told you that you were wrong in a tutorial doesn't mean there's a crisis. They might have actually done the reading. They might have actually done the work. They might have got there on merit, and they're entitled to their view. If you really want to be self-appointed warriors for free speech, here are some real causes that you could take up. You could defend journalists who risk prosecution to report on war crimes in Afghanistan. You could stand up for the right of public servants to express political opinions on their private social media. You could reform our, outdoor, our outdated defamation laws that are too often abused by the rich and powerful. But that would involve standing up for people who are not on your side. From those on the other side, it's not a matter of principle. 
It's a matter of retribution, and there are consequences that flow from this. The reason that this bill is before the Senate today is because a university liberal club wanted to hold an event saying that women lie about rape. Disgracefully, they weren't the only such club. The La Trobe University Liberal Club, the Macquarie University Liberal Club, the University of New South Wales Conservative Club, all of them hosted events saying that women lie about rape. What an indictment of the youth wing of your political party. They tolerate those views in their university societies. If they reward those views with our highest civilian honours, then what message does that send to the young women who work here? After Bettina Arndt's comments about the death of Hannah Clark and her three children, senators on the other side finally did the right thing. Exactly one year ago today, every senator bar the One Nation Party voted to support this motion. The Senate agrees that, one, Ms Arndt's comments are reckless and abhorrent, two, the values that underpin Ms Arndt's views on this horrific family violence incident are not consistent with her retaining her Order of Australia. The motion was sent to the Governor-General and the Governor-General did nothing. In Senate estimates, we found out why. While the Governor-General does have the power to unilaterally rescind the Order of Australia, the Governor-General's secretary said, in practice, the Governor-General does always act on the advice and recommendations of council. And who selects the council of the Order of Australia? The Prime Minister does. Every coalition senator in this place vowed to strip Bettina Arndt of her Order of Australia, and so they should. Bettina Arndt still has our highest civilian honour because the Prime Minister wouldn't pick up the telephone. Because, as we've learnt from the last few weeks, the Prime Minister is all too happy to look away when it comes to matters of violence against women. He obfuscates. He hides. He apparently only acts on the advice of his wife. Because he will not do anything for Australian women that requires an iota of moral courage. And then, one month ago, he stood up and awarded Ms Tame Australian of the Year. Grace Tame, who fought for and won the legal right to tell her story of her sexual assault. Grace Tame, who would know what it actually means to fight for freedom of speech. Grace Tame, who Bettina Arndt blamed for her own sexual assault. It was Bettina Arndt's sympathetic public interview with a convicted pedophile, the man convicted of her rape that precipitated Ms Thames' legal battle in the first place. I don't know how the Prime Minister could look her in the eye. The previous year, Ms Thames had this to say about Bettina Arndt's Order of Australia. It might seem trivial to take away one individual's award, but it's about a principle. There is a principle at stake here, and it's about demonstrating to people that we cannot reward people who validate abusers and people who capitalise on the weaknesses and vulnerability of others. Those are words that should echo throughout the halls of this building. It's not a crisis of freedom of speech on university campuses that should concern this government. It's a crisis of moral courage of this government to deal with violence against women, and it comes from the very top. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In my maiden speech to the Senate in 2019, I spoke about the importance of free speech in an open and democratic society and my deep concerns regarding the steady decline of academic freedom and diversity of thought on campus. True freedom of speech, I said in my first contribution to this chamber, means the right to express your views and the rights of others to respond and they say that they find your views ridiculous, not to run off to some authority and take action against you on the basis of disagreement. Surely, I said at the time, universities should be places which encourage consideration and debate on a range of views, not dismiss certain perspectives out of hand while endorsing other views without scrutiny. Now more than ever, we need universities to be committed to those principles of academic freedom and diversity of thought. The Higher Education Freedom of Speech Amendment Bill is an incredibly important piece of legislation. Nothing can be more fundamental to the prosperous future of our universities and, indeed, our society as a whole than the protection and promotion of freedom of speech. 
In recent years, we have seen the emergence of social justice theories, which suggest that individuals and groups need to be protected from certain ideas, that words alone can constitute literal violence and cause distress and harm, that if a particular group takes issue with someone's ideas or comments, then those ideas constitute hate speech and must be banned. Universities around the world have been enthusiastic adopters of these theories and have rushed to create ideological safe spaces and assure their students and staff that they shouldn't have to be subjected to certain ideas that they don't like or they disagree with. Clearly, this creates an environment where free speech and rigorous intellectual debate is under serious threat. That's why last year a group of 150 of the world's most prominent academics, writers and activists signed an open letter expressing deep concern that a new set of moral attitudes and political commitments are weakening norms of open debate and toleration of differences in favour of ideological conformity. Many universities seem to have forgotten that the only kind of free society worth having is one in which the people you disagree with can speak freely. The old free speech idiom, I disagree with what you say but will defend to your death the right to say it, has fallen completely by the wayside on our university campuses. Nowadays, you're more likely to hear staff and students saying, I disagree with what that person is saying and it's a breach of the code of conduct and how dare the university provide a platform for these views. Reports into academic freedom and censorship in the United Kingdom have shown that radical activists within universities are generating and coordinating formal complaints and protests agitating for academics to be fired or deplatformed. Too often, the response by the university in question is not to support the academic freedom of its own academics, but to give in to a Twitter pile-on. As a result, Academics and experts are increasingly self-censoring and staying away from topics which may draw the ire of activists and result in attempts to have them sacked. That is a hugely concerning and anti-intellectual trend which must be arrested. Conspiring to have an academic fired or make it impossible for them to give a public speech or presentation are not the actions of people who support free speech. Criticise all you want. Even better, Engage with the points someone you disagree with is making and seek to rebut their stance with facts and logic. But seeking to have someone sacked for having a different opinion is fundamentally inconsistent with the principles of free speech. Alternative views to your own and facts which don't fit with your narrative on an issue are not hate speech. They are not literal violence. Clearly, if you are not exposed to ideas you don't agree with or that you find challenging, you're not receiving the rigorous kind of tertiary education that university is supposed to provide. And if academics aren't prepared to engage in good faith with different ideas and think and discuss matters beyond the current orthodoxies, how can they help to inform the challenges of today and the future? In my maiden speech, I shared with honourable senators my own experience as a university student and a well-known conservative university student at that. A decade ago, the views I espoused in my political science classes were regarded with shock at best and complete disregard at worst by tutors and fellow students alike. My opinions were dismissed on the basis of my political affiliation as if that meant my views were of less value because I'd seemingly been indoctrinated by members of my own party. Setting aside that we have reached a very sad state in our democracy, if we're at the point of denigrating someone's views purely because they're a member of a political party, the fact that any alternative viewpoint was disregarded in an academic environment should be concerning to most Australians. Our students go to university to grow and develop their ideas about how the world works and the impact they want to have on society. This simply cannot happen if they aren't able to have those ideas challenged and, in turn, challenge the views of others. As I said in my maiden speech, I found my experience as a conservative on university campus as one that was intellectually galvanising and only strengthened my political convictions. But in the intervening decades since I was at university, the state of free speech on campus has degraded even further. These days, it isn't just the ridicule of fellow students or disregard of lecturers that students must withstand. Time after time, we are seeing the progressive shutdown of debate on any issues that challenge that very same ideological conformity that those 150 prominent academics referenced in their open letter last year. 
The Morrison coalition government has quite rightly been concerned about academic freedom and freedom of speech on campus for some time. That's why, in 2018, the former Education Minister Dan Tehan initiated a review into free speech at universities undertaken by former Chief Justice of the High Court, the Hon. Robert French AC. Unfortunately, the take-up of the French Model Code has been less than adequate. A review of the implementation of the Code by Professor Sally Walker AM found that only nine of the nation's 42 universities have adopted policies aligning with the Code. That is, by any measure, an incredibly poor response by the Australian university sector collectively. It's abundantly clear that when it comes to free speech, our universities either don't get it or don't want to get it. It's going to take firm leadership by this government to continue to push universities towards understanding the importance of free speech. And that's why this bill that we are debating here today is an important step to amend the Higher Education Support Act to better incorporate the principles outlined in the French Model Code. I congratulate the former minister and the current minister for education, Alan Tudge, for their work in promoting freedom of speech on university campuses, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Carr. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Now, this bill seeks to implement the recommendations of the independent review of the freedom of speech in Australian higher education providers, commonly known as the French Review. And that reported to the Minister for Education in March of 2019. And in assessing the bill, it's important to begin with some facts. The former Chief Justice Robert French stated in his report, I quote, claims of freedom of speech crises in Australian campuses are not substantiated. And he reiterated, there is no evidence of a free speech crisis on campus. Chief Justice French was quite clear. I'll re repeat this. There is no evidence of such a crisis. And the government knows that. And yet here we are, once again pursuing the fantasies of the hard right of this government. What we have is debate on a crisis that doesn't actually exist, except in the imaginations of the right-wing cultural warriors of this government. It's a confected crisis, which the government, of course, is happy to pursue, and has done so for seven years or so, because it helps develop what is in fact an unrelenting and systematic hostility of this government to universities. That's an irony, given so many of the government's own members are products of the university system itself. It's extraordinary that so many members of this government who were employed in universities feel that those universities are such threatening places. It's ironic that they regard these institutions as places that harbour people with dangerous ideas who uh, seek to undermine our way of life. It's a paranoid view of the world. Impossible to take seriously if you actually know anything about how universities actually function. And surely you would expect, given the breadth of experience of any government, the government benches would know better. Now, of course, the point of all of this is that this is a government that needs to secure the votes of One Nation senators to pass critical legislation, as the Job Ready Graduate Bill is an indication of, a bill that in fact cut the funding for student places by a billion dollars, a bill that severed the nexus between the funding of undergraduate places and the funding of research. 
a bill that clearly demonstrated that the question of the long-term funding of research in Australia has yet to be resolved. A question that neither the minister at the time, Mr Tian, nor his successor, Mr Tudge, have been prepared to answer. Now, Mr Tian justified the legislation by saying the revised student charges to be introduced would create incentives to enrol courses needed in the modern economy. Incentives to avoid other courses, such as the humanities, that supposedly don't produce job-ready graduates. Labor proudly opposed that legislation. We did so because we knew the damage that was going to be done to our universities by such a hostile, such a punitive approach to universities that have been persistently pursued by this government. And we opposed the bill. It should have been defeated. It was only carried by the one vote, which of course provided by one nation. And simply because the bill's underlying assumptions were wrong, as the previous iterations of that bill had been throughout the life of the Conservative governments over the last seven years. Humanities graduates do have job-ready skills, and the Business Council, of all people, hardly again a centre of Bolshevik agitation. They acknowledge how important the humanities are to the future of the country. And of course, the fact remains that price signals are an ineffective means of influencing student choices. We've already seen the government's ill-considered plan is unravelling. The report on the front page of The Australian just earlier this week by Richard Ferguson stated that the demand for university humanities and law courses is growing, despite the Morrison government's more than doubling course fees in a bid to redirect students to critically employment areas in the post-pandemic recovery. Enrolment in courses in society and culture category, in the other words, in the humanities and social sciences, have been hit by increases in student fees by 113 per cent under the job ready legislation, yet enrolments in these courses are up by 6 per cent for the 2021 academic year. So, with the government's spin machine in overdrive, the increase in enrolments in some categories of courses, in agriculture and healthcare, and it was seen to be some sort of indication. But that's been the trend for years. Not just something that happened this year, but for some time. Mr Andrew Norton, former Liberal adviser, conservative academic at the Australian National University, made the very simple point in The Australian. The government has managed to plunge universities into a funding crisis without as much as a gain in the terms of its own objectives. So with the bill before us, we have the price the government was prepared to pay in terms of its arrangements with One Nation. We're not going to pose this bill because it implements the French Review's recommendations. It does very little in real terms, but of course it foresees a circumstance where you can maintain a rhetorical war, cultural war, against the universities, and that's its main purpose, isn't it? A public propaganda war against intellectualism and against the university system. Now, just as there's no evidence of a crisis in free speech on Australian university campuses, what we saw is that there was a proposal adopted for a model code setting out principles of academic freedom and free speech. Universities have in principle accepted the code, although Professor Sally Walker, in another report commissioned by the government, has criticised them for being too slow on the uptake. This is the irony here, isn't it? The government talks about how important it is for universities to have autonomy, but when they don't take up the proposition of a voluntary code, there's something allegedly wrong with the universities themselves. The Australian Today, the ANU professor, which actually wasn't today, it was so, so it was yesterday when we were writing these notes, the 
ANU professor and former University of Melbourne vice chancellor, a very fine Australian, a very leading public intellectual in this country, Professor Glyn Davis, made the point that there is an arrogance and an ignorance for this government. He quotes him, there is an irony in the government's deciding to investigate academic freedom when the government frequently emerges as the largest threat to such freedom. Professor Davis criticised the attitude of Mr Tien. He said, Minister Tien accepted the recommendations of Justice French and called for the universities to act. He then became more insistent in later media statements criticising the universities for using their autonomy. And it should be remembered why Mr French recommended the model of the code. He said, and I quote, there is a range of diverse and broadly framed institutional rules, codes and policies which leave uh, from afar the varying exercise of administrative discretions and evaluative judgments. These are capable of eroding the fundamental freedoms of speech, that freedom of speech which is an essential element of academic freedom. And if that happened, Mr French said, it would make the sector an easy target for criticism. So that led to the backbench agitation and prompted the government to commission the French Review. Well, we know that the real deal is what pushed this through, the real deal being the deal with One Nation. And we know the incidents were reported in the media. We know the situation, for instance, the unfair dismissal case involving Dr Peter Ridd at James Cook University. All right, we know the case which is being heard by the High Court. I do presume, Senator Betts, you regard the High Court as still part of the legal process in this country. And I'm sure you'd appreciate that how important it is. And, and you, well, well, you, would, you would commend them in regard to uh, uh, Cardinal Pell. Uh, you would, of course, commend them, I'm sure, when they bring forward their judgment in regard to Dr Peter Ridd. Where, of course, we've seen the appeals in the card of Dr. Reed, which, of course, found that the position he'd taken right, was that he had breached his employment contract. It was not a question at all of freedom of speech. You should remember that the university had insisted that Dr. Reed was sacked for denigrating colleagues and science organisations. The university argued that his attacks on colleagues went beyond academic disputation. We all know how academics like to squabble and argue the toss about the number of angels on, on pins, but we do also understand how important these codes of conduct are within universities. We understand how important it is not to damage the reputation of universities or violate the codes of conduct. Dr Ridd argues that he was taking the action that he did at the university was a breach of the guarantees that he believed he had in regard to intellectual freedom and his contract of employment. Now, I think this case will be resolved in, through due process at the High Court. But it's in context that's interesting to note that the bill has govern, this government has presented to us removes a clause from the original model code which is actually proposed by the French Review itself. That clause contained in the code's definition of academic freedom stated, and I include, the freedom of academic staff without constraint imposed by reason of their employment by the university to make lawful public comment or on any issue in their personal capacities. This cause was removed by the government in consultation with the sector. No, this is because the government withdrew that clause, having the, also claiming that it's now implementing the French Review, when it clearly is not. It's done so in regard to its consultation with the sector. Universities were, in fact, concerned that if removed their ability to sanction staff or misconduct or damage the institution would conflict with their terms of employment. Now, I find it extraordinary that this is a government that's going to pursue this line of argument in the name of the freedom of speech, when, of course, what we're dealing with here is a position that the freedom of speech and academic freedom for exist uses existing language of the Higher Education Standard Act, which reads that free intellectual inquiry, learning, teaching and research, the bill inserts into the Higher Education Standard Act and the Texer Act a definition now of which is different. 
The definition states that academic freedom means the freedom of academic staff to teach, discuss, research and disseminate and publish the results of the research, the freedom of academic staff and teachers to engage in intellectual inquiry, to express their opinions and beliefs, to contribute to public debate in relation to subjects and study research, the freedom of academic staff and students to express their opinions in relation to higher education provider which they work, the freedom of academic staff to participate in professional and representative academic bottoms, the freedom of of students to participate in student societies and associations. Interesting idea for a government that's been so opposed to voluntary student unionism. The autonomy of the higher education to provide relationship with the choice of academic courses and offerings, the ways in which they are taught, the choices of research activity and ways in which they are targeted. None of these should be contentious, none of them, in anyone that actually genuinely holds freedom of speech. What the definition of the adoption of the model code by the universities do is replace a variety of institutional rules and measures with a common set of terms as the French Review recommended. Now that should clarify academic freedom is, under, is understood. But the good thing is here, we must remember the French Review, and I repeat this, found that there was no crisis, no crisis of freedom of speech in Australian universities, despite the fact that the right-wing zealots and cultural warriors within this government had sought to confect one. It's time for the government to stop listening to the cultural warriors uh, and to start talking so people actually know something expired. about education. Thank you, Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, colleagues and those listening in might be forgiven for thinking that was actually a speech against the bill, but as I understand it, the Australian Labor Party are committed to supporting it, if I'm correct. Is that correct, Senator Carr? You'll be, you'll be voting for the bill. So what a wonderful, what a wonderful speech in favour of the bill. And uh, it nearly now seems superfluous for me to speak because it, it was so articulately put as to why people ought to be voting uh, for this legislation. The fundamental point surely is this, that each of us, hopefully in this place, believe that we are all possessed of a God-given or human right of freedom of speech. <laughs> and, and that freedom of speech, if it is to be allowed anywhere, should surely be allowed to prosper at our universities and tertiary institutions in this country. The sad thing is that it hasn't happened. And it is a matter of genuine regret that legislation of this nature has to be brought to the parliament and legislated to ensure and guarantee that which, for centuries, universities have prided themselves on, namely freedom of speech, freedom to express opinions, to be able to lock horns with interlocutors and argue points, sharpen each other up with the activities that should be part and parcel of universities, rather than this groupthink which is now pervading through our universities. And look, are there issues within the university? Senator Carr would tell you that everything's great in the garden. Well, let's have a look at what happened at the University of New South Wales, just as one example. An academic uh, posted on Twitter, and might I add a left-wing academic, supporting the pro-democracy people of Hong Kong. And what did the university do? They took it upon themselves to take down that tweet. And then they took it upon themselves to issue an apology acknowledging that what they had done was wrong. They put out one apology in English and another in Mandarin. Oh. And guess what? You try to translate the two and they didn't marry up. Talk about a lack of fundamental integrity. And then, when I had the opportunity of questioning Professor George Williams about this at a Senate hearing, all he could assert was that a mistake had been made. Oh. But when I then pursued him further as to whether this was just an accidental mistranslation or not, no, 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 this was about nuanced messages. In other words, Broadcasting, or narrow casting, I should say, to the English speaking community one version of events, and narrow casting another version of events to the Chinese speaking community. Um, 
when, uh, and the person of whom I speak, the academic, is a Ms Pearson of, uh, and Human Rights Watch uh, were also concerned as to what the UNSW, the University of New South Wales, had done. And, uh, the reason for this was because pressure had been brought to bear on this university through that rag known as the Global Times. And Global Times said UNSW is under attack from outraged Chinese students after it published an article denouncing the human rights issue in Hong Kong. Although the article was soon deleted, students are still furious and demand an apology. I sort of think I know where that talk comes from because I've been subjected to it myself from uh, similar uh, rags uh, that are simply the mouthpiece for the communist dictatorship in China. Judge but Mr. when Mr. you have got a university dancing to the tune of an organisation such as that, taking down tweets, sending out different <coughs> messages, you know you've got a problem. But let's go to my uh, old university, the University of Tasmania, where an article was presented by a very, very accomplished uh, um, academic, one Professor James Parkinson from uh, Queensland, Senator Scar. And uh, his article was rejected. And uh, a Garrick Professor of Law at the University of Queensland, one Professor James Allen, who may also be known to Senator right Scar, right he had a look through it all. And this Professor um, Allen, was the sole editor of a G8 University Law Review at UQ for uh, 13 years. For a decade, he was the sole editor of New Zealand's oldest law review at the University of Otago. So with almost a quarter century under his belt as an editor of leading law reviews, I think he might know his way around peer review and law publishing. He had a look at this banned article because the assertion was made it was not up to scratch when anybody that knows Professor Parkinson and his credentials and Professor Allen with his credentials, the only conclusion you can come to is that politics trumped ex open expression of views that were presented and clearly, and was very clear, the editors of that particular law review disagreed with his views on the topic of the laws in Tasmania relating to the transgender um, aspects of the law. So it was de facto censorship. And the University of Tasmania, I've written to them seeking an explanation, and you get all the verbiage in the world, but no justification as to why Professor Parkinson's clearly acceptable article in relation to its uh, intellectual integrity and acuity and robustness uh, was rejected. And so basically what the University of Tasmania's law review has to accept and understand, I think, is that if you don't like somebody's view, you don't shut them up, you don't censor them, you actually put in a response and say, I or we disagree with this article because, and then you have the engagement which is so vital for any genuine university. And sadly, my own university failed that fundamental test. We can go uh, to other academics who have felt constrained to speak out as they should because of the funding that might be coming their way. They're too scared to speak out. And one of the um, researchers, Michael Schellenberger, who for 30 years was an activist in the climate change area, and in his book, Apocalypse Now, he debunked a lot of the myths that have been perpetuated by far too many universities and academics. And when asked the fundamental question as to why he hadn't spoken out earlier, 
He was willing to admit that one of his stated reasons for not speaking out earlier was his fear of losing funding. In other words, if you don't sing the tune or whistle the right tune for the university or the research institutions and might present a counter view, you will be denied funding. Is that really what we want in our research institutions, in our universities? It was great to see Senator Wong come in to listen to my contribution. Uh, <laughs> Order. Order. And you are still frozen in opposition, Senator Wong, so I'm more than happy to be here. So I'm more than happy to be here, Senator Wong. But, uh, but, uh, but, but, Mr. President, I suppose I invited that uh, exchange. But, uh, but our universities are struggling with the question of integrity in that fundamental area of freedom of speech. And that is why the government, quite rightly, has taken it upon itself to deal with this issue, to seek to ensure that, that those fundamental freedoms are to be maintained. And indeed, one of the freedoms that the legislation seems to guarantee is the freedom of students to participate in student societies and associations. And of course, I'm sure that also means not to participate in student societies and associations if that is what the student wants, because one of the great freedoms Order. of freedom Senator of Abetz, association. You will be in continuation upon resumption. Questions without notice, Senator Stirl. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Sadly, my question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Two days before Christmas last year, Lee received a call from her 86-year-old father's aged care home, Regis, Netherlands in Perth, telling her he was in an ambulance to the hospital. Her father, Brian Hunter, was, and I quote, slumped over in bed and his back was exposed. I could see his back was really terribly burnt. His whole back was burned and he was not speaking to us. He was semi in and out of consciousness. Brian, a double amputee who had lost both legs due to diabetes, had been left out on a rooftop terrace on a 40-degree day for two hours. Nobody noticed he was missing for two hours. Brian tragically died on the 20th of January this year, more than 12 months after the Royal Commission's interim report entitled Neglect. Minister, how is this neglect continuing on your watch? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Stirl for his question. Um, we are all very disturbed by any circumstance of uh, poor treatment, poor care of any resident in an aged care facility in this country, Mr. President. Uh, and, Mr. President, it should not keep happening. To, to your point, Senator, uh, Senator Watt, it should not keep happening, uh, Mr. President. Can I say I, I, I will be very cautious with respect to the allegations that are currently being aired with respect to Regis, because I know uh, that there are a number of investigations that are being undertaken with respect to the allegations that apply to this particular facility. Uh, I've had uh, quite a number of briefings uh, with respect to this from the Quality Commission and my department, and I've also had a number of conversations. Uh, elsewhere with respect to uh, this matter. And, Mr President, can I say um, I am very concerned that these allegations have come to light. There is a coroner's review that is underway, Mr President. There has been a police, a police investigation that has found no circumstance of criminality with respect to the allegations that are currently being aired with, in, in relation to Regis, Mr President. Uh, and, of course, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has issued both a sanction and a notice to agree against Regis Netherlands uh, with respect to the allegations that are being raised. Uh, all of these allegations, Mr. President, are very, very concerning. Uh, the government, members on this side, are just as concerned yeah. as anyone in any other part uh, on the chamber, Mr. President. Uh, we, are, we all remain concerned. We are concerned for the families 
uh, and, and the circumstances that they find themselves in, and we would like to get to the you bottom of this matter Senator as much Colbeck. as anybody. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. The day after Brian's hospitalisation, the hospital reported Regis to the Morrison government's regulator, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Nobody visited Regis Nedlands until the 11th of January, three weeks later. When did the minister first become aware of Brian's tragic death, and what action has he taken to ensure this neglect never, ever happens again? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, in, the, in relation to the specific date that I became aware of uh, the resident's death, I can't give you that specifically, but I'm happy to provide that information to the chamber, Mr. President. Uh, but as, I, as I've said, the, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has issued both a sanction and a notice to agree on uh, Regis Nedlands. Uh, that, that is an appropriate process. And Senator, I will take your intervention. You are right. It should not agree. It should not have occurred in the first place, Mr. President. Uh, and that, Mr. President, goes to well, that, Mr. President. Order. Mr. President, that's why we call the Royal Commission. That's why one of the first acts of Prime Minister Morrison was to call Order. the Royal Commission to undertake a forensic review of the aged care sector and so that we could put in place the reforms that will stop these sorts of events, lift the entire sector, uh, and so that we do have a better Order. and world class Senator aged Colbeck. care Senator system in this country. A final supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. Regis Nedlands had been sanctioned in November 2019, 14 months before Brian died, for putting the safety and health of residents at risk. How many more older Australians will tragically die because of the ongoing neglect in the Morrison government's aged care system? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, unfortunately, what Senator Stirl has done is neglected to advise the Chamber of other assessments of this organisation, who, you are correct, did receive a sanction at that point in time, but were subsequently assessed to be compliant with the standards. And so they had had a problem, they would put in place corrective action to fix it and subsequently been assessed. Mr President, a sanction is not a life sentence. It is a process to improve the capacity of the service, Mr President, uh, and that is what I expect. That's what all of us expect should occur, and Mr. President, that's what Order. I expect from Regis in the context Order. of the circumstances that are occurring right now, Mr. President. Regis Senator are McAllister. currently under both a sanction and a notice to agree, and both of those tools are designed to improve the quality of service at the facility. And Mr. President, that is what I expect. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister update the Senate on the national COVID-19 vaccine rollout and how this is underpinning our health and economic recovery? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Fawcett, for your question. Mr President, it has been an important week for all Australians. We are now into day four of the max the mass vaccine rollout across the country. We are prioritising the most vulnerable in society, as we should, to receive the vaccine first. Aged care residents, border quarantine and frontline health workers have the opportunity to have their first dose of the vaccine this week. Mr. President. Both the Pfizer, BioNTech and the AstraZeneca vaccines require two separate doses for a person to be fully immunised. Pfizer BioNTech 21 days apart, AstraZeneca 12 weeks apart. Phase 1A remains on track for the first round of doses to be delivered within a six week period, Mr. President. Under the Australian Government's plan, quarantine and border workers and aged care residents are on track to be vaccinated by April. You can be assured that the vaccination rollout is well underway in your home state of South Australia. Senator Fawcett, I am advised that 933 people have had their first dose in South Australia, and we expect those figures to ramp up significantly as weeks progress. We thank all Australians, Mr. President, particularly the frontline health workers, for their commitment and hard work to rolling out this vaccine across the country. 
our vaccination program will underpin our health and economic recovery. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister provide an update on how many Australians nationwide have been vaccinated in this first week of the rollout? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Fawcett. Mr. President, the aged care rollout is part of phase 1A. It will progressively ramp up as the week progresses. It's one of the things that we have asked the providers to do is to start cautiously to make sure that things are moving progressively. There have been more than 17,500 vaccines reported to the Commonwealth as having been administered across the country. So far this week, our vaccination teams have visited 71 residential aged care facilities and almost 4,700 residents have received the vaccine. We expect health care teams to visit an additional 20 facilities today and vaccinate a further 1,600 residents. Mr. President. In coming weeks, the program will reach more than 2,600 residential aged care facilities and more than 183,000 residents and 339,000 staff. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, could you outline what results are being seen around the world as a result of vaccination programs? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and thank you, Senator Fawcett. Data is coming in from around the world on other countries' vaccine rollouts. For example, there are very encouraging uh, results coming out of Scotland. Among Scotland's 5.4 million people, they've administered over 1 million doses of vaccine. They're using the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine, as is Australia. Uh, Mr. President. And the study has looked at the numbers admitted to hospital with COVID, those that have had those and those that have not had the vaccines. Research led by Public Health Scotland found at four weeks after the first dose, hospital admissions were reduced by 85 per cent for the Pfizer vaccine and, Mr President, 94 per cent for AstraZeneca jabs. So these are very encouraging early results, two leading vaccines that work against the severe end of the spectrum, and there's further evidence that it's working in a real-world setting, so very encouraging news. Order. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. My question today is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Lisa's father. 94-year-old Dick Lee was allegedly abused at Regis Nedlands. A report details that he was found, and I quote, on the floor near the entrance of his room, completely unclothed and sitting in his faeces, with a carer standing over him. I asked the carer, did he fall? And the carer said, no. The carer was later witnessed dragging Mr Lee into the bathroom. More than 12 months after the Royal Commission's interim report entitled Neglect, how is this neglect still continuing on this minister's watch? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Pratt, for the question. Um, Mr. President, I will continue to be, in the answer to this question, uh, cautious with respect to what I say about the specifics of the allegations that have been made in this case, uh, as I was in the question from Senator Stirl. Uh, the, these cases are subject to coroner's inquests. They are subject to independent review processes that have been commissioned, and of course they have also, uh, they have also been, Order. Mr. President, subject to a police investigation. Mr. President, Order. Uh, what I will say is that nobody in this place wants to see mistreatment of any senior Australian resident Order. in aged care in this country. That is why we called the Royal Senator Commission Watt. to into uh, aged care quality and safety so that we could conduct a comprehensive review of the sector and Order that we could left. put in place the appropriate regulatory regimes that support high quality care for all senior Australians in Order. the country. Mr. President, I'll take the, the interjection from the other side, Mr. President, because at the, at, the last, at the last budget, when we put billions of dollars into aged care, 
What did the opposition put in respect of aged care in order. their budget and reply? Not a single dollar, Mr. President. Order. They, they, order. A lot of Senator crocodile Colbeck, tears, a lot have, of crocodile tears on I the have other Senator side, Mr. President, but order. they have done nothing for I, decades. Senator Colbeck, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. I didn't hear anything unparliamentary. Senator Wong is on her feet. And to get into withdrawals, we also have crocodile tears, which impugns what we are asking when we're asking about neglect. But I don't propose to go down that path. I'm raising an issue of direct relevance. Uh, and this minister is asked, not. I'm sorry. Order. I can't. Order. Senator Wong has got the call. Interjections if, if, if are Senator always Lips disorderly and particularly unhelpful. Feet. I missed something completely. Senator Wong on the point of order. Let's... No, I order. don't actually. I just want to make order. my point. Mr. President, we're asking questions about some very serious uh, allegations. There is one question that the minister has been asked, which is how is the neglect continuing on his watch more than 12 months after he's received the Royal Commission report? I'd ask you to remind him of the question. Um, Senator Wong, um, I believe the minister was being directly relevant and then, and then responded to interjections, which was not being directly relevant. Um, I will remind the minister of the question. I'll also remind people not to interject and therefore the distraction and the opportunity won't occur. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank, thank you, Mr President. Mr President, and of course, with respect to the interim report of the Royal Commission uh, and of course the COVID-19 report of the Royal Commission, the government has responded to both of those reports. We have continued to reform the sector, passing new legislation which places additional responsibilities on the sector, the Serious Incident Response Scheme, which was passed through this uh, place only last week. Mr. President. So we have continued to reform the sector. Um, as, a, as while the Royal Commission has continued, and we will order. continue to do so. Sorry, Senator, Senator Birmingham, on a point of order. Uh, Mr. President, make a point of order in relation to conduct in the chamber and interjections. Senator Wong, in making her point of order before, demanded complete silence in the chamber before she spoke. And yet, since Senator Colbeck got back on his feet, Senator Wong has shown nothing but lack of courtesy in listening to that answer and showing double standard in relation to the behaviour that she expected when she was on her feet. All interjections are disorderly. Order. I, I, I'm going to ask that people at least stop the interjections while I talk. It's the end of a fortnight. I'm going to ask people to restrain themselves. I was attempting to call the chamber to order. I will start raising my voice if I need to. But interjections are not helpful and they are disorderly. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. A few days after the alleged neglect, Mr. Lee became ill, and his daughter's concerns that something was seriously wrong were dismissed. Mr. Lee was eventually rushed to hospital where he was in a coma, had liver failure, and he died the next day. So I ask, when did the minister first become aware of Mr. Lee's tragic death, and what action has he taken to ensure this neglect? Never happens again. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I say it is really um, th this whole matter is, and, and the allegations that surround it are extremely distressing, distressing for us all. But can I say the matter is not helped by questions from the opposition that leave that, that, Order. that leave that leave Order. out vital Order. facts that are a part of Order. this case, Mr. President. That leave out Senator vital Colbeck, facts. Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. I can't hear the minister's answer. I need to be able to hear it. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, it is really disappointing that the opposition leaves out vital elements of uh, what was even in the media this morning as part of their question uh, to cast an impression that actually isn't true. Mr. President, the, the, the gentleman concerned was attended by a GP. The gentleman concerned was attended by a GP. This was not an act of the aged care facility. So for the Labor Party to come in here and try and create the impression that it was is quite frankly completely dishonest. And I've been very, very careful with respect to the circumstances and the detail Order. that I put Senator on the Colbeck, table with respect the to these things. And I'd ask the Senator, Senator Pratt, a 
a final supplementary Many question. older Australians in residential aged care have died this year as a result of neglect. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, every person in this chamber would abhor any circumstance where a senior Australian has had that circumstance occur. Every single, every single one of us would have, done, would, would have uh, that view. That is why this government, that is why this government called the Royal Commission, because we want to reform this sector in a way that provides high quality care to senior Australians. Order. That is our objective. Senator, Mr. Senator Colbeck. Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Point of order on relevance. Um, the question was very direct. Um, there was no preamble. It was how many Australians have in residential aged care have died this year as a result of neglect. Um, I'd ask the minister to come to the question, answer of the question. Quite right, Senator Gallagher. Um, I have previously ruled that where there is a specific question that relates to the search for a fact, directly relevant, will be applied very, very tightly. I call the minister to turn to the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, there, there, there have been over the, the course of the last 12 months um, a number of allegations of neglect in aged care, and we're dealing with some of those as a part of the questions that we're being asked today. Mr President, well, Mr. Mr. President, uh, Senator Polly interjects and says that they're more than allegations, but can I say that's exactly what they are? They are allegations at this point in time, Mr. Order. President. Order, Senator and, Colbeck. And I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator, I'll, I'll call Senator Wong when senators on my left give her an opportunity to be heard. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I repeat, Senator Gallagher's point of order. Um, yes, this was a specific factual question that. For, for which an answer can be provided or a discussion of the topic in question. Um, I have previously ruled that where there is no preamble or commentary or politically contestable terms, that questions need to be taken strictly at their face value. So, Minister, I remind you of the question. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, I have allegations of people who may have died of neglect, but I have no direct evidence of anyone who has died Order. of neglect. Senator Colbeck. Thank you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister. In an extreme act of violence, an Aboriginal woman and her baby were attacked by a Nazi with a flamethrower this week. Why hasn't the Prime Minister had anything to say about this? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Mr. President, and, uh, and I thank Senator Thorpe for her question. Uh, I am aware um, uh, of an investigation by WA Police into a reported assault. Um, I have heard media commentary uh, along the lines of, uh, of that which you have described, uh, Senator Thorpe. Um, let me make very clear: if those uh, facts are true, um, then of course they are to completely and utterly be condemned. They are shameful. All forms of hatred and division are unacceptable and should be condemned. And I have no doubt Sorry, Senator Prime Thorpe, Minister— Sorry, uh, Senator Thorpe, on a point of order. Senator Thorpe. Uh, relevant, uh, President, my question is why hasn't the Prime Minister said anything, or the so-called leader of this country? Um, Senator Thorpe, um, I, the Minister has been speaking for 39 seconds. Um, he was discussing directly the first part of the question, which I think is directly relevant. I've allowed you to restate the second part of the question, but I believe he's being directly relevant by addressing the facts that you outlined at the, at the context for your question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. As, as I was mid-sentence saying, I have no doubt the Prime Minister would share my condemnation of the events, the horror of all Australians. Order. Order. Order would share the condemnation, I am sure, of all fair-thinking Australians of the events. Senator Thorpe, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This government's silence is violence. Why does this government condone these attacks by saying nothing, which just means you contribute to the problem? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I reject the question entirely. 
the government in no way condones such horrific events and unreservedly condemns them. Order. Order. I'll call, I will call Senator Thorpe when there's silence. Senator Thorpe, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. What are you doing about these white nationalist terrorists? If these terrorists were anything other than white, you would have moved heaven and earth to find them. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, the government rejects extremism in all of its forms, including right-wing extremism Order. or any other. Order. Our Order. increase in funding and support. Our increase in funding and support for agencies such as ASIO to be able to respond to extremism Order. Enables, enables the security agencies, as they have done, to identify the rise in different types of extremism, including the rise in right-wing extremism. The government has funded the agencies to do that work because we know that it needs effective law enforcement and intelligence activities to respond to it. That's why we've taken that action. It's why we support that work of our agencies, and we will continue to do so regardless of whatever type of extremism it relates to. Order. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. The Respect at Work report was delivered almost a year ago. In his speech at the International Women's Day breakfast this morning, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, my hope is that we will live in a society where we can truly say that women are respected, because from the disrespect of women all the other challenges flow. It starts with the failure of respect for women. Can the minister explain why the Attorney-General, Mr Porter, has sat on the Respect at Work report for almost a year without implementing a single substantive legislative recommendation? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And uh, just to clarify, Senator McAllister, I believe you asked me as Minister for Women, but I do also represent the Attorney General uh, in this place. As the Senator has, uh, has indicated, this government commissioned the Respect at Work report into sexual harassment in Australian workplaces, uh, which, as the Senator has indicated, was tabled by the government last year. Sexual harassment in Australian workplaces, which of course has been uh, in its most uh, appalling, uh, in its most appalling representation, uh, the subject of significant discussion in this place in the last weeks. It is an issue that can affect any workplace, and so the report by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner uh, and her team uh, is a very important uh, report, which needs, we believe a unified national response from all Australian governments as well as from employers and industry. So as part of the budget, uh, last budget, 2021, including in the 2020 Women's Economic Security Statement, the government announced uh, $2.1 million over three years to provide practical support to employers and employees to prevent and address sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. That funding will contribute uh, towards the implementation of key recommendations from the AHRC's landmark report. Uh, and that includes uh, the Council itself, which will be led by Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins, will bring together existing leaders from bodies with a role in preventing and responding to workplace sexual harassment. The Council will work to promote safer workplaces and provide high-level advice Payne, to I have the Senator government. Senator McAllister on a point of order. Senator McAllister. Uh, I have been listening to the answer, but my point of order goes to relevance. I ask specifically about the failure to implement a substantive, any of the substantive legislative recommendations. I'd like the minister to address that part of the question, which was a narrow question. I've uh, allowed you to remind the minister of the question. I, I think it is in order and being directly relevant for the minister to be discussing other measures the government has taken, and that is a, an opportunity that can be debated after question time as to 
uh, the Senate's consideration of those answers. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I was referring to the recommendation in relation to the Council, which will be led by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner. That funding through the budget will also support the implementation of nine other key recommendations from the report, including uh, the development of the Order. online information Payne, platform. Time for the answer has expired. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. The Australian Human Rights Commission has recommended the amendment of the Sex Discrimination Act to, and I quote, introduce a positive duty on employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate sex discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation. Will the Morrison government amend the Sex Discrimination Act to reflect this recommendation? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The uh, government is, as I was uh, saying, Mr. President, considering the recommendations of the report. It was a very wide-ranging report, and deliberately so, uh, Mr. President. It considered matters that are relevant to business, to industry, to independent agencies, to e education providers, to state and territory governments, and to the Commonwealth. I referred to the online information platform, Mr. President, which is Recommendation 48, Recommendations 9, 34, 36, 37, 40, and 50. Concerning the, uh, the package of training Senator and education resources. Point of order. Senator McAllister. Yes, my point of order is relevance. Um, the question went to a specific recommendation made by the Australian Human Rights Commission. I've asked the minister: Will the government be implementing that recommendation? I have not asked about the other recommendations in the report. Um, you have reminded the Minister of the question, and again I remind Ministers that where there is a very specific question, and I do consider this question relatively specific in nature, referring to a recommendation, I believe I, is the language I caught, um, that the comments should be addressed to matters that are directly relevant to that particular issue. Senator Payne to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. I believe I still had uh, half of my time available to me to respond to the Senator's question. Uh, I was referring to those other recommendations and recommendation two in relation to a uh, 2022 survey, a specific recommendation to evaluate the effectiveness of these new measures to track levels of sexual harassment. The government is considering the other recommendations, including the one that Senator McAllister has referred to, uh, and will respond in due course. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thank you. When launching the Respect at Work report, the minister said, and I quote, I take these recommendations very seriously and I'm committed to ensuring that sexual harassment is eradicated from workplaces in this country. A year on, with not a single substantive legislative recommendation implemented, what is the minister doing to deliver on this commitment? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I have already alluded to the recommendations uh, in the report that were taken up in the Women's Economic Security Statement in October last year, the specific recommendations that I actually don't think Senator McAllister wanted to hear about, those specific recommendations that are being pursued through that process. The Attorney General, who, uh, with whom I work on these matters and now welcome very much the opportunity to work with my colleague Senator Stoker. Uh, who has specific portfolio responsibility in this area with the Attorney-General as the Assistant Minister. Uh, we met uh, indeed uh, in this parliamentary sitting, uh, Mr President, to discuss these issues. It's a matter the government takes very seriously. There were, as I said, I think 50, uh, 55 recommendations uh, uh, in total, 20 to the co for the Commonwealth Government, uh, another four that uh, did propose to the Respect at Work Council, 12 that are shared between the Commonwealth and State and Territory governments, uh, 13 for government agencies and regulators, three for education providers and three for business and industry. It's a whole of government, whole of community, Order. whole of Senator Australia Payne. responsibility, Time Mr President. And we are Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy, Senator Sezelja. Minister, the Western Australian Liberal National Party opposition has committed to shut down Western Australian coal power by 2025. In the place of reliable baseload coal power will be $16 billion of wind and solar power. The role of maintaining backup power into the entire Western Australian grid when wind and solar fail, as they inevitably do, will fall on a battery. Minister, can you please explain to the House how Western Australia's 2,500 megawatts of average daily power use can be met by a battery and how many calm, rainy days in a row will put the entire state into a blackout? The Minister for Energy and Emissions, representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Roberts for the question. 
Uh, in terms of the detail of the Western Australian uh, Liberal opposition's uh, policy, I can't speak to the absolute detail of that, so I could take some of that on notice. Uh, but, when it comes to, but when it comes to energy security uh, and the need to take action, uh, our government, of course, has laid its priorities on the table. And so uh, those priorities, of course, Order. include a, a strong focus on reliable and affordable energy, and whether that's uh, with our plans when it comes to gas, uh, whether that's in record investment in renewables, uh, whether that is in extending uh, the life of other uh, baseload power, whether that is in Snowy Hydro 2.0, uh, whether that is the work we are doing with the battery for the Order. nation. Uh, we have a proud record of ensuring uh, that we have reliable and affordable power whilst investing in renewable energy, meeting our emissions reductions targets on an international scale uh, and creating jobs and supporting manufacturing. But in terms of the detail of uh, some of those policies you go to, I'm happy to take those on notice. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, the Liberal Nationals' plan is to build 4,500 megawatts of wind and solar to replace the 1,050 megawatts of baseload power that coal provides. What is the reliability factor of wind and solar? Because this policy puts wind and solar deliverability at just 23 per cent of rated capacity. Senator Seljo. Uh, well, thank you very much. And again, going to the detail of that policy, I'm happy to take some of that on notice. Uh, but it, there is no doubt uh, that when it comes to delivering on these policies, we have made it very, very clear over a period of time uh, that wind and solar and renewables, uh, and of course we've got record investment in renewables uh, in Australia at the moment, uh, they are very important, but you do uh, need to ensure you have baseload capacity. Uh, to ensure that uh, we don't see the kind of uh, situation that we saw under the former Labor government in South Australia, uh, where, where the lights are going out, where electricity is not being delivered. Uh, Order. Well, well, no, th thank, you Order. For the, thank you for the interjection, Senator Wong. It, it, is, it is true that uh, the only statewide blackout that I'm aware of in recent times did happen in South Australia under the watch of the South Australian Labor government. Uh, but when it comes to actual investment in energy, uh, it is absolutely Order, important. And, and I'll, just, I'll just state it again. I'll just state it again. Uh, Order, I've run Senator out of time. Seljo. I might do it on the next sub. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. President, thank you. Minister, how many workers will lose their jobs from the coal industry in Western Australia as a result of this Liberal National Party policy? Senator Seselja. Senator uh, well, th I, thank, I thank Senator Roberts for the question. And again, going to the detail of that policy, uh, without having read that particular policy document, it would be impossible for me to comment uh, one way or another. But what I can tell you uh, is that our Liberal National Government uh, has been focused on ensuring that we are growing jobs in the economy, bringing job back, jobs back as we recover from COVID, investing in our energy resources so we can support a strong manufacturing sector, uh, whether that is in our technology focus, whether that is in our focus on gas, whether that is in, in our investment in renewables, whether that is in extending the life of power stations, whether that is in areas like Snowy Hydro 2.0. We have a comprehensive policy uh, that supports energy, relies and affordable energy. We are bringing prices down. Uh, that supports a viable manufacturing industry, amongst other industries. Uh, that's our record. That's what we're going to continue to fight for, to bring back jobs and support reliable and affordable energy. Senator Small. Thanks, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. With the vaccine rollout underway and continuing signs of economic recovery across the country, can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic supports through COVID-19 have helped small businesses to ride out the crisis and Australians to stay in jobs? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I uh, thank Senator Small for the question and again acknowledge to the Chamber Senator Small's background in particular as being a small business owner back in our home state of Western Australia and the fact that he really understands what it's like uh, to build a business for scratch, from scratch, to employ people, you know, to pay wages and to certainly have sleepless nights. And Mr President, as we now know in Australia, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout is underway and so is Australia's economic recovery. 
According to the latest Australian Bureau of Statistics Labor Force Statistics for January, we've seen a net increase in jobs of 29,000. And that, of course, came off the back of the creation of 59,000 full-time jobs. We've also seen, as Senator Payne notes, uh, women's workforce participation return to the near record levels it was prior to the pandemic. Underemployment is now falling, and as we know, over 93 per cent of the jobs lost during COVID-19 have now returned back to the economy. Mr President, all of this, all of this has been possible because of the support that the Morrison government has provided uh, to, in particular, you know, small and family businesses across Australia. Uh, we put in place policies that have kept Australians uh, in work because we put in place the policies that kept businesses in business. These, of course, included JobKeeper, apprentice and trainee, wage subsidies, the cash flow boost that, of course, gave people back their own hard-earned money, the SME guarantee scheme, the early withdrawal of superannuation. We put in place a suite of policies, and this suite of policies have all played a vital role. In fact, when you look at the uh, RBA research, it estimates that JobKeeper saved over 700,000 jobs in the first half of 2020. Uh, Mr President, in our supporting apprentices and trainee wage subsidy, it's now supported over 59,000 small businesses to keep 119,000 apprentices on the job where we need Order, them to Senator be. Cash. Senator Cash, a small or supplementary question? Thanks, Mr President. Minister, can you outline how the labour market has, res has responded to the tapering of JobKeeper and other COVID-19 economic supports implemented by the Morrison government? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as I've said, we've seen now 93 per cent, or around 93 per cent, of the jobs that were lost as a result of COVID-19 return back to the economy. And what we are seeing is that the transition to the second phase of JobSeeker has been successful. And what it is doing is ensuring that support is targeted to those who need it most. In fact, between September and December of 2020, we saw the level of economic support for by $30 billion. At the same time the support was tapered, the economy added 320,000 jobs. New analysis of tax microdata by Treasury shows that the number of phase two JobKeeper workers who are working zero or very low hours has now been decreasing over time. But what we've also seen is record numbers of previously unemployed people finding new jobs. And in fact, Mr President, uh, to November 2020, we saw a record of 170,000 unemployed Small, people into the workforce. Order, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. As the original COVID-19 supports begin to conclude, how will the Morrison government continue to support small business through the jobs recovery over the course of 2021? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as the Prime Minister has always said, our number one priority as a government is getting Australians back into work, keeping businesses in business and getting Australians back into work. We, of course, have our $74 billion job maker plan. That is, as you know, it's supporting employers to hire, to bring on additional people into their workplace. We're supporting Australians to train, to upskill, to reskill. And of course, we're supporting hardworking small business owners to grow their own business. Our economic support measures have boosted family and business balance sheets. We now see over $200 billion extra in savings over the last year. We're also unlocking confidence to spend that money, which is a good thing, particularly in our small businesses. And as we know, small businesses, they are the backbone of the Australian economy, uh, and we need to do everything that we can to support them. We know that there's a long road ahead, uh, but we are committed to boosting the confidence of Australians and, of course, ensuring that Australians Order, remain Senator in Order, Senator Cash. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. Minister, the US government sought extradition of Australian citizen Julian Assange from the UK for espionage. Espionage is a political offence for which extradi extradition is expressly barred from the US-UK extradition treaty. Minister, given the political nature of extradition, have you personally made representations to the incoming Biden administration to drop the US appeal against the UK court decision to not extradite Mr Assange? And if not, will you? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Rice uh, for her question. Uh, Senator Rice, as I 
believe I have advised the chamber previously. Uh, I have raised the situation of Mr Assange uh, with my previous United States counterpart, former Secretary of State uh, Pompeo. I have not uh, yet met with uh, Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken, uh, but I am sure that in the course of uh, such a meeting that this matter would be raised. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. Um, Minister, my question is, you know, basically, will you commit to picking up the phone to be asking the US administration to drop the charges against Mr Assange? Um, Minister, there were reports that the Trump administration in the latter days of the Trump term was close to pardoning Assange and may have done so if they had received representations from the Australian government. Will you pick up the phone to the incoming Biden administration? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. As I again have previously advised the Chamber, Mr Assange is subject to a legal process uh, in another country. Australia does not interfere in the legal processes of other countries and has long held that position across multiple governments. Uh, as we would not expect other governments to, to interfere in legal processes in our country. Mr Assange is currently the subject of a United States appeal against the decision of the British courts uh, that he is ineligible for extradition due to uh, the court forming a view in relation to a risk of self-harm in the US prison. That appeal was lodged on the 12th of February. I don't intend to provide a running commentary on the details of the case, as it is before the courts. We, consider, we continue to monitor Mr Assange's case closely, as we do for Australians in detention overseas. Senator Rice, a final supplementary question. Minister, when is enough enough? Julian Assange has suffered so much, and the judge in the UK case has basically said that extradition to the US is effectively a death sentence. The, US, um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture has said that the failure of the judgment to denounce and redress the persecution and torture of Mr Assange leaves fully intact intact the in intended intimidating effect on journalists and whistleblowers. So it's, is it the Australian government's position that extraditing Order. Julian Senator Assange Rice, to the US is acceptable? Time for the question has expired. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, members of my office and of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade met with Mr Assange's legal team uh, in this uh, sitting period to discuss a range of matters, including the matter of Mr Assange. This government has sought, through our consular uh, officials and through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the High Commission uh, in Britain, to support Mr Assange in an appropriate consular fashion in any way we could. We have done that by seeking his consent to discuss any prison condition issues with prison officials to offer him consular assistance. We have done that on 21 separate, time, separate occasions. On 21 separate occasions, no response has been received to that correspondence Order. from Mr Assange or Senator from Wish his Wilson. representatives. Uh, the Wish government Wilson. has endeavoured to provide him with that appropriate support. We will Senator continue Wish to do that. He withdrew consent for us to consult in relation to any of his circumstances, his health or his welfare, in 2019. We have continued to raise Order, with Senator UK Payne. government Senator officials Wish Order. Time Our for the answer has expired. Senator Wish Wilson, I called you to order and you kept interjecting while I was doing so. Please cease. Senator Walsh. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. This morning, the Home Affairs Minister claimed he is not allowed to disclose information provided to him by the Australian Federal Police. But he also admitted to breaking that rule and providing information to the Prime Minister's office about Brittany Higgins' case on February 12. Who in the Prime Minister's office received that official information and at what time was it received? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and uh, I thank the Senator for the question. Um, I understand that the Minister for Home Affairs has been asked this question in the House, uh, but the information that, again, I have before me uh, that I can provide you with is uh, basically what I've said, stated yesterday. AFP Commissioner Kershaw first advised Minister Dutton of Ms Higgins' allegations on Thursday the 11th of February 2021. This was the first time the minister had been advised of Ms Higgins' allegations. 
Uh, as I advised yesterday, he received further updates from Commissioner Kershaw during last week and this week. Uh, he was advised that his office was not aware of Ms Higgins' allegations prior to his briefing from Commissioner Kershaw on the 11th of February 2021. Uh, and again, I think, as I stated yesterday, uh, as senators would know, the handling of allegations and investigation of criminal conduct, including briefing to ministers, uh, is a matter for the AFP. Uh, further information that I can provide, uh, the minister, as the minister responsible for the AFP, has stated that he regularly receives confidential briefings from the commissioner. He has a responsibility to protect the integrity of investigations and the information discussed in these briefings. Uh, he has stated that it was his judgment that he should not disclose the information provided to him, as this was an ongoing operational matter. I understand he's also advised that his chief of staff contacted the Prime Minister's office the next day on the 12th of February following the receipt of media inquiries. And that's the information that I have before me. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. At any time was this minister aware of any estimates briefing being prepared in relation to the events of the night of 22-23 March 2019? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I've referred to Mr Dutton's evidence uh, that he has advised that his office was not aware of Ms Higgins' allegations prior to his briefing from Commissioner Kershaw on the 11th of February 2021, and also his evidence that the AFP Commissioner Kershaw first advised him of Ms Higgins' allegations on Thursday the 11th of February 2021, and as such that was the first time he was advised of Ms Higgins' allegations. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. In October 2019, the minister left a message from Ms Higgins saying, and I quote, Daniel has got everything under control, I promise you. At that time, Senator Cash was the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs in the Senate. What did Daniel have under control? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, Senator Walsh, I actually responded to that question uh, when Senator Watt asked it of me, and I would refer you back to that answer. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the minister outline what the government is doing to deliver on Australia's commitment to provide COVID-19 vaccines to our neighbours in Southeast Asia and Minute. the Pacific? Sorry, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, thank Senator Abetz uh, for his question. Mr. President, Australia's security, our safety, and our prosperity are intertwined with those in our region. We are working in close partnership with our neighbours to implement our over $500 million regional vaccine access initiative and our $80 million contribution to the COVAX Facilities Fund for developing countries. That fund began its first delivery of vaccines yesterday to protect some of the world's most vulnerable people. We're consulting with 18 partner countries across the Pacific and Southeast Asia to align their national vaccine deployment plans and to directly address their priorities. Our support is deliberately end-to-end. -end. So we're providing technical advice to support the rollout of vaccines under the COVAX facility. We have already assisted Vanuatu, Kiribati, Samoa and Tonga in this way. In particular, we're supporting Tonga to develop and implement a new national vaccination register. We're deploying Australian specialists to work with these partner governments. Our National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance is deploying a specialist to Timor-Leste to support preparations for their national rollout. Australia's Therapeutic Goods Administration is providing advice to our partners, which is critical in building that trust in the safety and efficacy of vaccines. Our support includes identifying target populations for early vaccinations, developing public health materials, strengthening cold chain and medical supply management, and establishing monitoring and evaluation arrangements. For example, we'll shortly be training Solomon Islands epidemiologists in data collection and analysis. My Indonesian counterpart, Retno Marsudi, and I have agreed a strong package of support for Indonesia 
to procure vaccines and to provide technical assistance. I also discussed uh, our support with uh, Secretary uh, Loxon, Teddy Loxon, the Foreign Secretary of the Philippines, this week uh, as well. This is a program which is meeting the pledges that Australia has made to support our shared regional recovery from the pandemic. Order. Senator Bex, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that very interesting answer and ask, will the minister advise what the government is doing to coordinate with our partners on this vaccination program. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. And co cooperation with our partners is absolutely critical. By coordinating our efforts with New Zealand, with the US and with France, we will cover the vaccination needs of the Pacific. And this is a matter which the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Sir Selger, and I have been engaging on with counterparts across the region. We're talking with other potential suppliers, including India and Japan. We're working with the World Health Organization, with UNICEF, with multilateral development banks, the Pacific Island Forum, the Pacific community and with ASEAN to ensure support that meets international standards. We'll purchase vaccines through organisations such as UNICEF and we'll share vaccines from our own supply pipeline with both the Pacific and Timor-Leste. We're also vice chair of the Gavi board, Mr President, and through that we've negotiated to ensure all eligible Pacific Island countries are covered by the COVAX facility, which will deliver over one million doses to the Pacific and Timor-Leste by the middle of this year. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Will the minister explain how this important initiative will deliver improved regional health security and economic recovery? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. This is a very important question from Senator Abetz because vaccination is a critical public health measure to take control of COVID-19, to end the pandemic and to ensure recovery. So timely access to safe and effective vaccines will improve our regional health security and also reduce burdens on regional health systems. It will pave the way, importantly, for the reopening of borders, for re-establishing transport routes and restarting economies. It will boost critical sectors, including seasonal work, so important to our region, international tourism, vital to our region, and a range of agricultural industries that depend on the availability of regular international transport services. It's important that our region works together to vaccinate populations, to bring about that shared economic recovery. We will ensure that we support our neighbours in this process and that we deliver on our COVID-19 development program pivot on partnerships for recovery. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday, following COVID vaccine overdose, overdoses by a doctor in Queensland, the Minister for Health and Aged Care claimed, and I quote, the specific training of this Australian-trained doctor were all carried out in accordance with procedures, and every one of those steps has been checked and rechecked, and none of those steps had been breached. He and this minister were then forced to correct the record, advising the doctor had not completed the required training. Why has the minister let this rollout commence in aged care homes without ensuring that everyone administering the vaccinations had the required training? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, both the Minister for Health and Aged Care and myself believed that it was important that we put on the public record as quickly as possible uh, the information that we had available to us with respect to uh, the circumstances that occurred at the aged care facility in Queensland. Mr. President, we were assured. We were assured by the Deputy Chief Health of Medical Officer uh, that by Healthcare Australia that the, that the uh, doctor involved had in fact undertaken the required training. Uh, we were subsequently advised on further investigation and inquiry that that had not been the case, Mr President. So what we have done is taken specific action to ensure, via our own circumstances, that every worker working through and working on the uh, vaccine rollout in aged care across the country is independently ordered by us. Mr. President, I think it's very, very. The Labor should be very cautious about the language that they're using with respect to this matter, Mr. President. They should be very, very cautious. Order. They are contributing, Order. Mr. President. Labor Party are contributing with their language Order. 
to an undermining of the confidence in the vaccination process Order. across the country, Mr. President. Their language is directly, their language is directly contributing to the undermining of the confidence in the vaccination process across this country, Mr. President, which we all Order. agree is absolutely vital, Mr. President. Absolutely vital that we maintain confidence in Order the vaccination process left. around the country, Mr. President. And I'm very pleased to note Senator that Ayers. the acceptance rate, the con confirmation rate of residents in aged care facilities around the country remains high. It remains high, which is exactly what we want. Because, Mr. President, we want senior Australians Order. protected Senator Colbeck, by time the time for the answer has vaccine. expired. Senator, what a supplementary question? Thank you, Mr. President. Did the general pr practitioner who was responsible for the overdoses have conditions on his registration? If so, why were these conditions permitted under the contract entered into by the Morrison government? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, I'll have to take the specifics of any details Order, in relation Ayers. to the doctor Senator Gallagher. concerned on notice, Mr President. Uh, Mr. President, my advice is that it wasn't. A general, he's not a general practitioner. He's, he's a doctor. Uh, my advice is that he's not a general practitioner. Order, Senator Gallagher. Mr. President, and so I will take any any specifics in relation to this. The doctor, the doctor was an Australian Order. trained doctor, uh, but I will take any specifics of any conditions that he may have had. Uh, there is currently an investigation being undertaken by the Defe Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Michael Kidd, into the circumstances of this case. Once that information is available to me, Mr President, I'm very happy to provide it to the Chamber. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Order. Thank you, Mr President. What clinical governance has the government put in place to ensure everyone administering COVID vaccines is properly and fully trained? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I indicated in my previous uh, first answer, uh, the Australian government is taking an independent audit across all of those people who are working on the vaccine rollout into aged care in the country, independent of the processes that exist within the organisations that are taking that are taking out the rollout. Uh, we have also asked the former chief nurse and midwifery officer to be a part of the Healthcare Australia, uh, be, be embedded into Healthcare Australia. So we are undertaking our own independent oversight to ensure that all of those who, have, who are participating in the rollout are pro appropriately qualified and trained. Senator Birmingham. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, I also just wish to add a little information to the answer I gave in relation to the question from Senator Thorpe. Uh, I am advised that earlier this week uh, the Minister for Home Affairs, Mr Dutton, uh, reposted a statement from West Australian Police. He did so adding his own comments and the Minister for Home, Affair, Home Affairs stating that I quote, very disturbing reports out of WA. The actions of this individual as reported are disgraceful and have no place in our society. Anyone with information should contact the police. Thank you, Minister. Thank the Senate. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Stuhl and Pratt. Well, this morning as I was leaving home and listening to the news, as many of us do, I was shocked to yet again hear new allegations of extreme neglect in aged care facilities in our country. New allegations have come to light concerning severe neglect of elderly Australians in the Regis Nedlands aged care facility in Perth. And the details of those allegations as they have come to light, despite how many times we have heard these sorts of things occurring on this government's watch, still were appalling and shocking. Two days before Christmas last year, on a 40-degree day, Lee received a call from her 86-year-old father's aged care home, Regis Nedlands in Perth, telling her he was in an ambulance to the hospital. Her father, Brian, was, and I quote, slumped over in the bed and his back was exposed. 
I could see his back was t really terribly burnt. His whole back was burned, and he was not speaking to us. He was semi in and out of consciousness. Brian, a double amputee, had been left out on the rooftop terrace for two hours. Nobody knew where he was for two hours. And tragically, Brian died on the 20th of January this year. There were further allegations concerning the Regis Nedlands facility as well. In the days before Brian Hunter's death, six nursing, home, nursing students were sent to Regis Nedlands for their first clinical placement, where they witnessed abuse, widespread neglect, rough handling and sexually inappropriate behaviour. One of the abused residents was 94-year-old Mr Lee. The report details that one of the students found, and I quote, Mr Lee, who is always in a wheelchair, on the floor near the entrance to his room, completely unclothed and sitting in his faeces with a carer standing over him. The nurse, nursing student said that she asked the carer did he fall, and the carer replied with no. The student later witnessed the carer dragging Mr Lee to the bathroom. It is terribly sad and shocking that we continue to hear stories like that emanating from aged care facilities around the country. And they are only two of the stories that have emerged this week alone. For years now, we have been bringing to the attention of the Senate the, exactly these sorts of stories, and we have been getting exactly the same kind of answers to our questions that we saw from Senator Colbeck today. We get the fake concern. We get the, this shouldn't be happening to anyone. We get the, I'm as appalled as anyone. And there's just one fact that Senator Colbeck and his predecessors continue to omit from their explanations, and that is that they have every power required to actually do something about this and fix this system so that we don't keep seeing and hearing these types of stories. You would think, listening to Senator Colbeck, whether it be today or last time we asked him questions, or last year when we repeatedly brought these kinds of stories to the uh, chamber's attention, you would think that Senator Colbeck is just some innocent bystander, as appalled as the rest of us by what is going on. He is probably, uh, you're right, Senator Polly, he is probably the one person in this chamber and in this government who can actually do something about it. The clue is in Senator Colbeck's title. Minister for Aged Care Services. Senator Colbeck has every opportunity to do something about this, and he has repeatedly been warned about the huge systemic problems in our aged care services due partly to this government's lack of funding and due even more so to the funding cuts that this government has imposed, particularly while the now, now Prime Minister was the treasurer of this country. I'm getting pretty sick and tired of hearing Senator Colbeck and other members of this government continue to stand there and, and empathise and express concern and say that we none of us want to see this when they actually could be doing something to fix this. Now we do have a Royal Commission underway, and tomorrow I understand the government will be receiving the final report of that Royal, Com Royal Commission. But several months ago the government received an interim report from this Royal Commission titled Neglect if there was any doubt about what is going on in our aged care system. And still, despite a Royal Commission report, we still continue to see and hear these stories. The fact is that this government just doesn't care about what's going on in our aged care facilities. They just don't care that elderly Australians are being neglected, are being treated like this, when they deserve all of our support. In their, in their twilight years. This government has had every chance to fix it, and they just thank keep you, ignoring Senator it. Senator Watt, your time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. And look, I, I thank Senator Watt for um, bringing our notice to this issue. Um, the allegations are absolutely abhorrent, and Senator Watt is quite correct that we shouldn't hear about um, allegations of neglect uh, in our aged care system, and indeed our government is working to improve the system. Um, it is difficult. We have a large and extensive you know, aged care industry in Australia. We do have systems in place to ensure that we do uh, review 
and monitor the quality and care in our residential care facilities across Australia. Indeed, this specific issue that Senator Watt uh, is talking about is still under investigation. That is ongoing. So I will let that investigation proceed without further comment on those specifics. But I do want to remind the chamber that uh, our government is committed to looking after our aged citizens, uh, that every year under our government our home care packages have been increased, our residential care places are up, and every year we are providing more funding for our aged care system. We are delivering record investment across the aged care system and over the forward estimates, whereas under Labor um, we've increased it since when it was under what it was when it was under Labor. It is estimated that funding for aged care will grow to more than 27 billion by 2023 to 24. That is, on average. 1.5 billion of extra support for older Australians each year over the forward estimates. We are committed as a government to making improvements to the aged care for all senior Australians, and it continues to be one of our priority areas. That is why the Prime Minister called for the Royal Commission into the aged care quality and safety, and it is why we are acting on that. As Commissioner Briggs has stated as part of the final hearings of the Commission, and I quote, I have, however, detected over the last year, Council, a growing determination among officials and in the government to fix the problem of the aged care system and to pursue a genuine reform agenda. And we are committed to pursuing that genuine reform agenda. We will continue to focus on the gaps in aged care, and we will continue to have our uh, aged care quality uh, commissioner undertake spot audits. Um, we will continue to have the commission review the performance of our aged care residential facilities and, where appropriate, to issue notices to impose sanctions and, where appropriate, if found, to actually revoke um, licences or the services accreditation. Um, those, however, those processes, we have them in place and they must be allowed to be undertaken without um, interference to ensure integrity in the system, to ensure that we don't have our system compromised by perception. And our government will continue to provide senior Australians with the support they need, but the best support of all is support that they can get in their own homes. And that is why we are committed to funding more home care packages. Our home care packages have increased from just over 60,000 under Labor. It's increased by 224 per cent. More Australians are getting care in their homes now than they did under Labor. And we continue to be committed to home care packages so that people can grow old with dignity, surrounded by their own family, in their own home, um, in a comfortable manner, with the necessary care and support they need to make their final years as comfortable as, pro as possible. But we will not turn our back on the challenges of the future, and we will continue to review and go through the Royal Commission's findings and implement reform where needed and where appropriate. Thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, Senator Polly. Tomorrow, the federal government will be handed the final report by the Royal Commission into aged care in this country. It will be the 22nd report in the last eight years that it's been presented to this government who will accept, quite frankly, no responsibility for the inept administration of the aged care sector in this country. Over the last eight years, yes, there has been additional funding put in, 
But when Mr Morrison was Treasurer, he used this sector as an ATM and gutted it by almost $2 billion. Now, we know that the interim report into um, aged care was handed to this government over 12 months ago. And what have we seen since then? Further neglect. Now, you would have thought that perhaps the title of their interim report, Neglect, might have given them a hint that they might have to do something sooner rather than later. But what they've done is they've just used the Royal Commission as an excuse not to take the courses of action that have been well documented and raised by, as I said, 21 inquiries and reports into the aged care sector. Now, they have known that the ACFI funding instrument has been broken for a considerable period of time and it needed to be fixed. They also know that there has been in excess of 100,000 older Australians who are still waiting on the aged care, uh, the home care waiting list for the level of care that they have been assessed as needing. We know that almost 30,000 30, older Australians have died waiting for that assessment level of care that they should have been receiving in their own home. We know that almost half of residential aged care older Australians in this country are malnourished. Only today we had aged care workers visiting Parliament House talking to parliamentarians, including myself, hearing again, not that I hadn't heard this time and time and time again, of the difficulties that these workers are faced with every day, not having enough time to provide the care that older Australians deserve. Hearing about an old, older gentleman who fell and was left without adequate medical care for days with broken ribs, broken ribs, can I say, having difficulty breathing. Now, this was happening because there wasn't enough time and enough workers to give this gentleman the care that he needed. He died. He died. That could have been prevented. Now, this government and this minister comes into this chamber day after day when we're asking questions, and he accepts no responsibility for the failings. The reason we had a royal commission called in the first place was because of this government and the previous Liberal governments over the last eight years have failed older Australians. They've failed older Australians and their families, and they've failed those workers in the aged care sector day in, day out. Now, we know that there needs to be more money put into aged care, but it's got to be done properly. There has to be transparency. You can't be spending these billions and billions of dollars year in, year out without knowing that the older Australians are getting the care, the dignity and the respect that they deserve in this country. We hear time and time again what a rich nation that we have, and we we respect our senior Australians. That's what the minister says, and yet we're hearing case after case of neglect in this country. Another story shared with me this morning as a woman who was 200 kilos in her residential home, they didn't have a lift that was able to help the staff. So when she collapsed, and in fact when she died in the hallway in that home where all the other residents could see her. They had no equipment to ensure that dignity and respect was shown to this woman so that they could return her 20 metres to her own bed so they could prepare her. That is a disgrace. It's a national disgrace. And it's unfair that Australian workers in the aged care sector are put in this situation you, day Polly. after Your day after day. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And let me just say from the outset that the Morrison government is committed to ensuring a high quality of aged care for all senior Australians. Um, however, I refute the argument, uh, particularly from Senator Watt, that the Minister Colbeck is the only person who can fix the problems uh, with, a, with the aged care sector. There are a 
the aged care sector has thousands of employees, and it is up to all of us um, to make sure that we carry out our fiduciary duties and to actually lay the blame solely at Minister Colbeck's feet is just typical Labor smearing. Uh, they themselves haven't got a policy or released a policy on what their so-called solutions are. They'd rather sit there and throw dirt day in, day out, attack the individual rather than address the crux of the matter. Uh, and it should be noted that the Morrison Commonwealth Government has made improvements uh, to aged care for all senior Australians, and it's why the act and, the, and it's you know the, it's the, re you know, the reason why the Prime Minister actually called a royal commission into the aged care was so that we could actually find the right solutions, and we were totally open and transparent about it. Now, Labor Party didn't call a royal commission into the aged care sector. They're not interested in actually finding solutions. They're only interested in looking at the problems and then laying blame at, at the, uh, Minister Colbeck's feet rather than actually delivering real substantial outcomes. Real substantial outcomes. And it's worth noting that the coalition government is actually delivering record investment across the aged care system and since 2012-13, uh, we've invested over $13.3 billion, uh, sorry, $21.3 billion in 2020, year ending 20, up from $13.3 billion since the last Labor government. So that's an increase of about 50 per cent in the seven years of the coalition government, uh, or works out an extra about $1.5 billion every year uh, in extra support for senior Australians. Uh, we've also invested in additional home care packages. Uh, we've announced a record $5.5 billion for an additional 83,000 home care packages since the 2018-19 budget. So in the last two years, we've uh, added another 83,000 additional home care packages. Uh, and overall, there is now almost 200,000 packages uh, that have been fully funded. And that compares to just 60,000 when Labor will last in government. So, just you know, it's worth thinking about that. We have increased by 300% the number of home care packages available to senior Australians, on top of the extra 50% or seven billion dollars invested into aged care homes. Uh, importantly, around 99% of senior Australians waiting for a package at their assessed level have also been offered support from the government, including an interim package uh, of a Commonwealth Home Support Program. And of course, it should also be noted that they continue to have access to our world-class healthcare system, which has done a, a fantastic job in the last 12 months uh, at supporting uh, our seniors uh, throughout the COVID crisis. Um, we believe the coalition, the Mor Morrison coalition government, believes in a strong aged care sector with a high quality and skilled workforce that will provide senior Australians with the care they rightly deserve and give all Australians confidence that our elderly are cared for with kindness, respect and dignity. The government so far has acted on the, its interim and COVID-19 reports and will carefully uh, consider final recommendations when they are handed down later this month. And obviously, we will also take uh, very seriously and seek to act upon the advice from the Royal Commission. Making improvements to aged care is actually one of the Morrison government's key priorities. As, as Commissioner Briggs of the Royal Commission stated as a final, as a final part of the hearings in the Commission, um, he has detected a number of problems in the aged care system and is determined to pursue a genuine reform agenda. And so just I'll, complete, I'll finalise this again. We, the Morrison government, are committed to providing senior Australians with the utmost high-quality aged Reddick, care. Thank you, Senator Reddick. Your time Service. has expired. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. My mum spent the last five months of her life in aged care in northwest Tasmania. She loved it. Once she moved in, she repeatedly said that she wished she had made the decision to move into care earlier. She loved the company, the activities, the clean modern room and the staff. 
As the Aged Care Royal Commission looks deeply at issues in aged care and more and more families and aged care staff find their voices describing the horror of witnessing their most vulnerable loved ones mistreated, neglected and abused, I've realised that my mum won the lottery, a lottery with increasingly uh, lengthening odds. During this pandemic, we have witnessed a system unable to respond, terrified residents, traumatised families, overburdened staff and appalling lack of resources that they need to take care of our vulnerable older Australians. An aged care so riddled with flaws and a lack of appropriate support that it simply could not move fast enough to protect life. An aged care system that is the responsibility of this federal government, a responsibility the Morrison government and a minister who sits in this chamber has run from, hiding from, ducking and weaving, causing trauma and costing lives. We've heard so many voices and so many horrific stories of neglect. In the news today, a woman described the appalling neglect of her father, saying, they were treating my dad like an animal to be slaughtered, burnt, stepped on and left in bed to rot. The degrading treatment, the lack of respect, the disregard for the most basic of human rights needs and horrifies us all. It's a disgrace. And yet we've got a government and a minister for senior Australians and aged care services that shows no shame and no humility. This government has, has abrogated its responsibility to older Australians and their families time and time again. Today the, the country is bracing itself for the final report of the Aged Care Royal Commission due tomorrow. We've already seen its interim report titled Neglect. That says it all. <clears throat> a report that found aged care residents literally starving, with maggots in their wounds, and what workers in aged care and good providers, and I quote, succeeding despite the aged care system. Aged care should not be some kind of lottery. It is outrageous that it's become so. And yet that is exactly what this government has turned it into. Make such, making such a fundamental decision as moving into aged care should not be wrapped in terror and you will be subject to neglect and abuse. Many older Australians are genuinely, genuinely afraid and so are those who love them. Aged care workers are exhausted and stretched to their absolute limit. Older Australians built this country. They and the families who love them deserve so much better than the chaotic, unsafe system that has evolved under the Morrison government and this minister in this chamber. And here we have this minister constantly expressing concern with a furrowed brow and taking no responsibility for the wreckage that the, his government has brought. Let us never, ever forget that this crisis is this government's doing, a direct result of seven years of neglect. Seven years of neglect. A government that has made savage cuts in aged care, and I heard Senator Polly earlier talking about this, like the $1.7 billion in funding that was cut in 2016-17 and 2017-18, on top of scrapping the pay rise that staff had secured back in 2014. The truth is this government only called the Royal Commission because it was shamed into it by the Four Corners media scandal. That's the only reason we've got a Royal Commission. If that Four Corners story had not have run, we would not have had the Royal Commission that would have uh, shone a light on all this neglect that we are seeing. And they've had seven years. The Morrison government have had seven years to address this properly and to look after our older Australians. They've failed 21, 21 major reports into aged care during that seven years. They have received those reports during their seven years, and they have failed to act on them. And we completely continue to see the sheer gall of this government that won't face up to its responsibility, and they show no respect for our elderly Australians. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Thorpe. 
Thank you, Chair. I move that the Senate take note of Senator Birmingham's response to my question and Senator Payne's response to Senator Rice's question. The Minister's answer to my very, very clear question, why hasn't the PM had anything to say on an Aboriginal woman and her baby being attacked by a Nazi with a flamethrower this week? The silence from the so-called leader of this country is violence by saying nothing at all. He is saying it's okay that these racially motivated terrorist attacks are okay. ASIO, this country's very own spy agency, has said that the far-right extremism is growing in this country and that it is a threat. And what does the PM do? Nothing. When Labor senators in this place tried to get a motion through this chamber about a significant rise in far-right extremism, those opposite deleted all references to it. Why? Because those opposite are responsible for this, either because of what they say or because of what they don't say. The Prime Minister was today the guest of honour celebrating International Women's Day in this place. That in itself is a joke. But he was standing in the Great Hall saying that women should be protected. And he's right. We do need to be protected. Protected from the Liberal Party. The leader of this govern government must be some kind of magical being. He has this ability to just vanish or just simply knows nothing. Or he has something, nothing to say when the country needs him most. Maybe someone should tell him the reason why the limousine picks him up every day is because he's meant to be the Prime Minister. Do your job. Grow a spine. Condemn racism every single time, otherwise you are condoning it. Thank you. Uh, Senator Thorpe, Senator Wright. Thank you. Minister Payne's response to my question about justice for Julian Assange, to be taking action to free Julian Assange, taking action to reach out to her US counterpart in the incoming Biden administration, was distressing. It was the same old, same old. Basically, complete abrogation of the responsibility, you would think, of this government to actually be protecting the rights of a US citizen. Julian Assange is in prison in the UK at the moment as a political prisoner. He is there because of a political decision by the Trump administration to charge him with espionage. It is a political action that was taken then, and it is a political action that needs to be taken by our government to be protecting his rights. And yet, when I asked, would she pick up the phone? Would she pick up the phone so that Julian Assange could be freed from the awful conditions that he is still experiencing in the Belmarsh prison in the UK? Her answer was that I haven't yet met with my counterpart, Anthony Blinken, but I'm sure that in the course of a meeting this matter would be raised. I mean, this is appalling. There is no urgency there. There is no commitment. There is a willingness to just let Julian Assange continue to suffer in jail, basically shrugging her shoulders at the potential of the US appealing the court judgment that basically that said he shouldn't be extradited, but shrugging her shoulders at the potential of the appeal winning, at the potential of Julian facing up to 175 years in jail, of the year, uh, jail in the US. There is no recognition by this government of the political nature of the charges against Assange and no willing to, willingness to use the power that, as foreign minister, she has to, to engage on a political level. I mean, this decision to charge Julian Assange by the Trump administration was because he was a whistleblower, because he published evidence of war crimes. He revealed the murder of innocent men, women and children, crimes which the US Defence Force had covered up. Yet our Australian government has abandoned him. Look, the US, they are meant to be our mates. 
You would think that if you had an Australian citizen that is being held as a political prisoner, the least this government could do would be to use their power to reach out to attempt to free Julian Assange. Thank you, Senator Rice. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Thorpe, to take note of various answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to the tabling and consideration of committee responses and government uh, response, government reports. So, um, uh, yes, Senator Davey. Send additional information received by committees relating to estimates. Thank you. Uh, Senator Davey. Again, uh, on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present the Human Rights Scrutiny Report number two of 2021. Thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, no other documents? Um, so we'll now move to further consideration of documents which are listed today on pages 9 to 11 of the notice paper. So we'll deal with just um, the uh, first documents on page 9. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I take note of documents 2, 3, 4, 6, 8 and 9 on page 9 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Senator Seawitt. Uh, thank you. And I uh, take note of item 12 on page 9 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. We will now move to documents on page 10. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take note of documents 14, 15, 16, 20 and 21 on page 10 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Seawitt. And I um, take note of item 13 and 22 because I think 14 was included in the. Um, yes, that's correct. As it was. was 20 and 21. So 13 and 22 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Um, and we'll now just do. The documents at the top of page 11, 24 to 27. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take note of document 24 and 25 on page 11 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Seawitt. Okay. Uh, and I uh, take note of item 26 on page 11 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. And then we'll just deal with those committee reports. Uh, Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I believe uh, now would be an appropriate time for me to seek leave to table a non-conforming petition. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank Senator you. I, uh, thanks for the leave. I thank colleagues. I table a document in the form of a non-conforming petition signed by 36,923 people calling on the government to immediately release people seeking asylum and refugees from immigration detention facilities and commit to their resettlement in a safe, permanent home by World Refugee Day, which is the 20th of June 2021. Thank you, Senator McKim. So we're now dealing with uh, committee reports and government responses. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I take note of documents two, three, and four. Uh, sorry, the committee reports and government responses numbers two, three, and four on page eleven, and seek leave to continue my is remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Seawitt. Thank you. Um, I take note of item three and five on page 11 um, in committee reports and government responses and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. And I just remind senators that any document to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Um, we'll, I think we have dealt with all of that. Yes. Uh, are there any ministerial statements? Doesn't appear so. Uh, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of general business, and I call the clerk. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Seawitt. Sorry, could I draw your attention to the state of the chamber? Yes. Uh, quorum required. Please ring the bells. Yeah.
quorum is present. We now proceed to the Senate consideration of general business. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you. Uh, oh, I beg your pardon. I haven't called the clerk. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Call the clerk. Uh, general business notice of motion number 1038, standing in the name of Senator Griff regarding e-cigarettes. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I inform the chamber that Senators Seawitt, Sheldon and Urquhart will also sponsor the motion. Uh, I move the motion. Look, it was absolutely great to read in the weekend AFR that Australia's premier retail association parted ways with big tobacco. That association, the Australian Retailers Association, ended its contract to promote vaping once it learned that money was being funnelled from a major tobacco company. It is, of course, disappointing that the ARA even accepted that contract in the first place. But with association groups, sometimes the lure of new funds overrides good practice. But better late than never. The current CEO and board must be congratulated for very much taking the right stand. The weekend AFR story was a reminder of the tactics employed by Big Tobacco. Big Tobacco are not the ones standing front and centre in the vaping debate. Instead, they work in the background, puppet masters pulling their puppet strings. They want us to believe that vaping cuts at the very core of their business model. And even some in this place want us to think that anyone who opposes vaping is doing the devil's work. Because e-cigarettes are a threat to big tobacco. Well, this straw man argument conveniently ignores that Australia has been steadily driving down smoking rates for over 30 years, all without widespread vaping. In reality, e-cigarettes are a robust replacement arm of Big Tobacco's business model. Big Tobacco doesn't care how many people start on the path to nicotine addiction as long as they become addicted to nicotine. As we saw with the weekend AFR story, industry players such as Philip Morris International are actively working behind the scenes to try and weaken Australia's regulatory approach to e-cigarettes. The industry has sought to buy legitimacy for its arguments by getting employer and other industry groups to be its mouthpieces and to do its dirty work. It wants e-cigarettes to be treated as consumer products, as easy as buying a can of beer or a can of Coke. This odious industry wants to renormalise smoking after Australia worked so hard to drive down smoking rates over the past three decades. It absolutely hates that vaping is so heavily re uh, regulated. It really hates that nicotine e-cigarettes are prescription only. We all have to be on guard against these tactics. Indeed, it is actually Australia's obligation under the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control to, and I quote, be alert to any efforts by the tobacco industry to undermine or subvert tobacco control efforts." End of quote. As members of this place will be aware, the Senate last year held an inquiry into e-cigarettes under the euphemistic title of Tobacco Harm Reduction. Perhaps it would have been more accurate to call it the Inquiry on Promoting Nicotine Addiction. I know Senators Hughes and Senators Canavan, Senator Canavan were patting themselves on the back for getting the Senate inquiry up. I know the industry would also have been patting itself on the back because another inquiry, so hot on the heels of the 2018 inquiry in the other place, is another opportunity to put forward its self-serving arguments and try to advance its agenda. I think it's pretty clear that the purpose of putting up the Senate inquiry was not to objectively assess the evidence and regulatory frameworks as the terms of reference stated. The purpose was to argue for the liberalisation of e-cigarettes in Australia. I wasn't going to let that go unchallenged, so I participated in the inquiry. And I have to say I recall the newly appointed chair of that inquiry coming up to me soon after and stating, and again I'll quote, 
congratulations on getting yourself on the inquiry you don't believe in. End of quote. Well, Mr Speaker, that comment betrayed to me the true motivation of the inquiry and the lack of objectivity. And this was demonstrated in the content of what became the dissenting minority report. During the course of the inquiry, my office received correspondence from the National Retailers Association, the organisation which the AFR suggests has now taken up where the ARA left off. The NRA's letter was accompanied by a survey purporting to be uh, about the health of South Australian retail workers, even though it hadn't actually surveyed retail workers. It has surveyed a small number of SA residents, some of whom had worked in retail at some time. It was a pretty obvious attempt to push the vaping barrow. In amongst the meandering stats about fruit and veg intake and crime in retail and awareness of smoking rates, uh, it was all uh, for a call to look at legalising vaping products. It was a very poorly disguised attempt to push the vaping barrow. In that regard, I have also held concerns for some time about the charity status of the pro-vaping Australian Tobacco Harm Reduction Association, otherwise known as ATHRA. It has a tax deductibility status and, rather incredibly, I think, is registered as a health promotion charity. However, it almost exclusively only peddles advice and information about vaping and e-cigarettes, rather than TGA-approved cessation methods. Of most concern, however, is that AFRA reportedly received start-up funds from vape manufacturers in 2017 and also accepted donations from overseas groups which themselves have received funds from Big Tobacco. AFRA is one of the groups that clings to a flaky statistic that you often hear in these debates, and that is the claim that vaping is 95 per cent less harmful than smoking. The thing to understand about that statistic is that it is pretty much made up. If I'm being generous, you could call it a best guess. The figure comes from a 2014 study by a group of researchers across a very wide range of disciplines, which estimated the harm of tobacco cigarettes across a range of indicators, including economic cost, crime, injury and environmental damage. This is the figure they came up with, and it was repeated even in government publications in the UK often without reference to the original source. Vaping proponents cling to it like a life raft. But it is misleading to use that stat to describe a health benefit because that is not how it was calculated. And even that study said of e-cigarettes, and I quote, there is concern that these devices should not be introduced in an unregulated way until potential associated harms are adequately evaluated. End of quote. What is important to understand is that vaping may be less deadly than tobacco, but that does not make it safe. That does not make it healthy. While some in this place would have us believe that e-cigarettes serve the greater good because they're not as evil as tobacco, the inquiry was presented with compelling evidence to the contrary. The inquiry heard that the safety of e-cigarettes, particularly the long-term safety, has not been established. Neither has their effectiveness as a cessation tool. The Cancer Council and the National Heart Foundation warned that e-cigarettes pose significant health harms and risks to the Australian population. Vapors breathe in ultrafine particles, volatile organic compounds, heavy metals and other toxic substances that should not be inhaled, including formaldehyde. This risk extends to the nicotine-flavoured liquids marketed at young people because the ingredients used are designed to be ingested, not heated to vapour and inhaled. And because these cigarettes are a relatively new product, there is little research about the health effects beyond two years. There's concern that vaping can be a gateway to tobacco use in never smokers. ANU research showed e-cigarette users who had never smoked were, on average, three times more likely to try smoking conventional cigarettes and to transition to regular tobacco smoking. So as a nation, we would be stupid, plain stupid, 
to open the gates to nicotine vaping and make it freely available. Two wrongs don't make a right, and giving e-cigarettes free reign to counter the ill effects of tobacco is the health equivalent of introducing cane toads to deal with cane beetles. And we know how that ended up. It will be short-sighted and may have undesirable long-term consequences. As Professor Simon Chapman told the inquiry, we had no idea for 40 or 50 years after cigarette smoking became widespread that lung cancer would move from being a rare disease to becoming the number one cause of cancer death. We can't be complacent or take lightly the long-term risks posed by vaping. I am pleased that the inquiry majority report supported Australia's cautionary approach on vaping regulation. While other countries with more liberal laws lament the escalating rates of youth vaping, and indeed in the US the Surgeon General has called it an epidemic, Australia is able to take a measured and evidence-based approach. Australia has its eyes wide open. In the face of uncertain evidence, it has struck the right balance. Vaping is restricted and nicotine liquid is available on prescription if smokers feel it will help them quit. In doing this, they will have some medical supervision which may actually assist their attempts to quit. As the Australian Medical Association told the committee, it is not a success to turn a smoker into an e-cigarette user. The success is turning the smoker into a non-smoker and a lifelong non-smoker. Vaping may have helped Senator Hughes and others quit smoking, but without doubt they are in the minority. The stone-cold fact is that the vast majority of smokers who quit successfully go cold turkey. Australia's approach will help reduce the risk that we get people hooked on vaping and that the next generation of smokers don't start as a generation of vapors. Thank you, Senator Griff. Um, I had Senator Sheldon. Um, well, Senator Canavan, um, well, allow me to speak. Senator Canavan, this was what the whips gave me, and I understand this has been cleared by the government whip. That's said with respect, Senator Canavan. That is Senator Griff. Uh, Senator Canavan, Senator Canavan, please resume your seat. Please resume your seat. The custom in here is that we go by the list. I accept that a senator who seeks to stand to have the call may must be given the call, but I am trying to abide by the custom and practice that the government, Senator Griff and the opposition have put forward. But if you are pressing the point, then I will call you, Senator Canavan. So I'm pressing the point. I mean, I was on my feet clearly first. Senator Canavan, I've given you the call. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Because sorry, sorry, um, Deputy, uh, Deputy President. Because clearly here, Senator Griff has not only brought in a motion that's full of conspiracy theories, full of uh, of of, spur, of slurs and misinformation. He has then tried to concoct a speaker's list that doesn't give any scrutiny to these claims. Because 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 none of the speakers he knows very well Senator, Senator that none Canavan, of the speakers please resume your seat i've got it um, sorry to send it Urquhart, i've got Senator, but Senator Henderson was next on the list so he should stop accusing Senator Griff of uh, concocting the debate Senator Seward, I appreciate the sentiment, but that's not a debating. That's not a breach of the standing order, Senator Canavan. Exactly, Senator, uh, please resume your seat. Senator Urquhart was also seeking the call. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I was going to point out that the list is a convention that we have had an agreement with the government for a very, very long time. I understand it is not a standing order, but is it, it is a convention that we have agreed to and we have honoured, and we have people from various parties who come in here and try and dispute that over a period of time. 
out of absolute rudeness for the, for the convention that we have a good agreement with this government on. And I would ask that that convention continue. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. I have made that point to Senator, Can Senator Can Canavan, but I'm respecting the standing orders that he sought the call. Uh, Senator Smith, on much. a point of order. Point of order. Yep. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Just to reinforce uh, the comments that have been made by other senators in the last few moments. Uh, the chamber does run on courtesies and the chamber does run on um, arrangements that are set in place by the whips, which ensures that the chair can guide and steward the chamber in a very, very constructive way that allows everyone to make a contribution. I think it's fair to say that because this particular part of the day has started earlier than people anticipated, we will get more of a debate in this general business time than we would have done in previous Thursday afternoons, because we are now at the general business part of the day, because other opportunities were not taken with documents and ministerial statements, etc. So I'm very, very confident that all the speakers that are listed on the informal speaking list will get an opportunity to make a contribution. Thank you, Senator Smith. I have allowed some leeway in, a, in giving the whips an opportunity to speak, but I now want Senator Canavan to continue his remarks and not be interrupted. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, and, and the Chief Government Whip makes a very good point there that normally in this debate, normally sometimes the last speaker actually wouldn't get on. And so the fact that, that the only speaker, and Senator Griff knows this, I believe he, was, he put the list forward, he knows that the only speaker on this list that would have been opposed to his point of views was, in fact, me. Uh, was, was me. And so he, uh, before knowing that this debate would have first started earlier, potentially tried to imp impose and not have anybody speak against his motion in this debate. And that does show that does show the sensitivity here of those pushing this issue. And I take Senator Urquhart's point that this is a convention. It's never been a convention that I've ever disregarded. But conventions have to be in the spirit of the standing orders and the standing orders clearly say the standing orders clearly say that that the call should go round the chamber uh, with the spirit and with the intention of encouraging debate this list that's been concocted by senator griff was clearly an attempt to override that intention and spirit of these standing orders and and remove debate i'm not afraid of debate senator griff i'm not afraid of debating these issues with you because you may want to make slurs and innuendos about me and other colleagues, you ran the inquiry like that, but I'm happy. I'm happy to look you in the eyes and take you on. I'm happy to, because you didn't want me to speak Senator tonight, Canavan, but I'm happy to Senator do the same. Senator Canavan, please resume your seat. May I ask you to direct your comments to the chair? And I am looking forward to you covering the subject matter of today's motion. Senator Seaward, are you seeking a point of order? Uh, yes, I am. I, well, I seek to table the list that's circulated in the chamber that clearly shows there was a speaking list and Senator Henderson was next. So Senator Canavan continues to mislead the chamber when he knows very leave? well that what he's saying is not true. So are I seek leave to table the list. Is leave granted? Uh, just a moment, Senator Canavan. I'm going to call it again. Um, Senator Seawitt is seeking leave. Is leave granted? I've had a yes. I'll seek some further advice, but in the meanwhile, please continue, Senator Cameron. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Madam Deputy President. So, as I was saying, Madam Deputy President, this, this, this motion is full of conspiracy theories about money and funding and connections. I think Senator Griff has, has got the, 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 the ball of wool out and the cork board and started tying different tacks between different people to make connections. There are more conspiracy theories in this motion than a Q thread on Twitter, uh, Madam Deputy, Deputy President. In fact, I think Senator Griff, by moving this motion, is in fact the Q shaman of the Australian Senate. He just needs a, needs, needs a Viking cap, uh, some, some, some body paint. And we'll be away here. We'll be away because this is this debate is absolutely descending into conspiracy theories, not the facts, not the relevant information. Because I listened closely to Senator Griff's uh, contribution there early, Madam Deputy President. There was absolutely no attempt, no attempt to deal with the real evidence that exists around the world, the decisions uh, and uh, law changes that have been made in other countries that firmly believe that the use of e-cigarettes can cut smoking rates and save lives. 
No attempt. No attempt at all from Senator Griff to engage in it. I'm happy. I'm happy to say that I recognise that our regulatory authorities, our TGA, our Department of Health, has a different view from those other people. They have a different view. But they are very much an outlier. They are very much an outlier. Almost every other country in the world, certainly developed country like us, has taken steps to legalise vaping or to at least allow and promote its use as a, as a useful uh, smoking or quitting aid. Uh, but there's no attempt here in Senator Griff's motion to actually deal with those issues and confront that evidence. It's just, oh, there's people getting money here and, and someone is friends with that person over there and there's an article in the paper that says bad things. Uh, therefore, they all must be evil and terrible. Well, let's actually take it back to the evidence and the data because this debate, these issues, involve real people's lives. They involve real people's opportunities. And the real people in this debate are often ignored and derided, as we saw through the sham of the Senate committee process often uh, with, this, uh, with this debate in the last few months. Real people are derided. Real people are told they don't know what they're talking about. Real people are told that they should just go cold turkey and uh, not worry about using things that have helped them get off a terrible, terrible habit. And I want to say up front that all of us, all of us share the view that we'd like to see smoking rates fall. All of us share the view that smoking is a terrible habit that we hope people don't get addicted to, and all of us agree that smoking kills far too many people in this country. It is still the largest, largest killer of, of uh, Australians um, uh, through, through, illicit, through, sorry, through, through drugs, through, through the use of alcohol or drugs. Uh, um, uh, and all of us as well, all of us, myself and other advocates for the legalisation of e-cigarettes, don't want to see people take up e-cigarettes either. We don't want that to happen either because we understand that there are risks around the use of nicotine. Uh, it is clearly uh, the case that e-cigarettes are much less harmful than smoking, and Senator Griff can, can argue the toss over whether it's 95 per cent lower or 50 per cent, but he can't walk away from the fact that the Department of Health, the Federal Department of Health, have ruled that vaping or that e-cigarettes are much less harmful than cigarettes. They said that in the Senate inquiry. They are much less harmful. Now, uh, what percentage figure in that? I don't know, but I'd love to see people use less harmful things rather than more harmful things. It's a pretty simple rule, so I'd love to see that happen. But it's it's hard to have that happen in this country because because we continue to uh, uh, lag the world in the use uh, and the use of the latest evidence and the the legalisation of these products, so more people can quit and improve their lives. Their lives, you know. And I want to make sure that this. You know, there's accusations that um, all these views that I take or others take are all because big bad companies want us to and all this rubbish. Well, I want to say it's actually real people that I've had connection with that have influenced my views on this issue. I don't smoke. I, I hadn't vaped until the inquiry. I uh, first I vaped for the first time somewhere at a Christmas party, I think, over Christmas. I don't like it. I'm not going to take it up. But it was never something personal for me. But it was real people that I knew who, who these products had helped them quit. Real people. Real people who contacted me after the government announced a ban on the importation of liquid nicotine to, to take effect within a week that were very worried about what was going to happen to their lives, what was going to happen to their mental health in the middle of a pandemic. That's what caused me and triggered me to get involved in this. A few months ago, I was touring around coal mines, um, as, I, as I like to do from time to time, and, and, I, and I went to a crib room, spoke to a couple of truck drivers, and one of them there said, oh, yeah, I know you, I know you, I'll get your emails. And I thought, well, this bloke probably knows that I kind of like coal, despite Labor Party's attempts to shut it down. I want to support their jobs and support their livelihoods. Um, uh, and I thought he might be on that, that email distribution list. And no, straight away said, no, you're, you're the vaping guy. You want, you, want to, you want to let me keep vaping. I like you. Because guess what? At the mines, a lot of people wouldn't notice. A lot of the Labor Party centres wouldn't notice anymore because they don't go to mines and these sort of places anymore. At the mines, quite often, smoking is banned. Banned. Uh, because you know, it's, it's not a useful thing to have, particularly at a coal mine. Don't want flames around, so it's banned. So those people who are unfortunately addicted to nicotine, they don't have a lot of other choices. And they, people they can say these gums and all this other stuff, but they don't, you know, <laughs> not connecting it back to the real world. These guys work in a hard job. They work 12 hours a day. They're away from their families uh, for weeks at a time, and then people over here want to want to deny them the right just to have a little bit of relief in their lives. They want to deny them the right because they think they think they know better. They know better than what that coal miner thinks in Moranbah. That's, that's what sums up this whole debate. Senator, Senator Griff, Senator Sheldon, other senators in this place think they know better uh, than the average worker in a coal miner about what's good for them. What's good for them? Well, I back, 
I back the average everyday Australians who make decisions about their health. Uh, it's unfortunate that too many Australians have found themselves addicted to nicotine and rely on smokes to do so, but, uh, but I do back adult Australians to make decisions about how they want to uh, try and kick the habit, get off the habit and do, have a better life, particularly when e-cigarettes are clearly less harmful than smoking. All the evidence says that. Now, as I said before, Senator Griff refused to engage in the overseas evidence that clearly says this and refused to even indicate that other countries have clearly adopted and legalised uh, uh, e-cigarette products and done so because of the clear evidence that they help. It's very timely, though, the motion Senator Griffiths puts up the very timely, because just yesterday, just yesterday, Public Health England released a comprehensive report that they do annually on the, uh, on the effects of e-cigarettes. Uh, uh, it's a very comprehensive report. It's about 426 pages. Uh, I would recommend it to, to, to all senators interested in this debate. And the, 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 the attitude and conclusions of Public Health England are now very different from where our own health authorities are. As I said, I recognise our health authorities have a different view, but they are not the Pope. They are not infallible. Uh, we should look at all evidence around the world, especially in countries which have taken a different path to ourselves. And in England, in England, Public Health England uh, clearly demonstrate in clear evidence about the, the, the impact of the legalisation of vaping and the benefits that has had for real people, for real people that should be the centre of this debate. This report, this, uh, this Public Health England report published yesterday said that it is estimated in 2017 more than 50,000 smokers stopped smoking with the aid of a vaping product who would have otherwise carried on with smoking. Real people, 50,000 real people in the United Kingdom who no longer have a terrible habit thanks to the use of vaping. The report went on to say that 38 per cent of smokers in 2020 believe that vaping is as harmful as smoking, and 15 per cent of smokers believe that vaping is more harmful. And this goes to the point. Senator Griff wanted to deride, through you, Deputy, um, Acting Deputy President, wanted to deride the evidence that vaping is less harmful. But this is harmful in itself. Senator Griff's statements are harmful in and of themselves because he perpetuates the myth the myth that is very prevalent among smokers that vaping is worse or, uh, or, not, uh, not, or is just as worse as smoking. So, according to Public Health England, uh, something almost uh, more than half of smokers believe that vaping is as harmful or more harmful than, than smoking. So, that's obviously going to stop people and prevent people choosing a less harmful product because they are fed myths and lies by the advocates or those that are standing against vaping. Uh, their report went on to say that using a vaping product as part of a quit attempt has some of the highest quit success rates. They estimate that between 60 per cent and 74 per cent uh, were successful over the last two years in quitting who used vaping products. That's real evidence. That's real evidence, not speculation, not, not, not complicated economic trick tests. It's real evidence that more than half of people who try vaping products in the United Kingdom actually end up successfully kick, uh, quitting. That's pretty good. That is a pretty good success rate. The report went on to say that vaping has plateaued in adults and young people since the last report in March 2019. So this report comes out every year, and uh, there's no evidence that, that the legalisation of vaping has actually increased smoking. Um, uh, sorry, that the increase of vaping has increased among young people, which is often a criticism made of the attempts at legalisation. That has is actually plateaued. There hasn't been any increase among young people. And importantly on this point, around 4.8 per cent of young people that in this report they're defined as aged between 11 and 18 reported vaping at least once a month, the same as last year. So the same rate among young people as last year. Obviously that's unfortunate. We don't want to see any young people take up this habit, but there's no evidence of an increase. And most of these people were either current or former smokers. So even in the young people category, the 11 to 18, most of those people vaping were actually had been former or current smokers themselves, and, and that's, as we say, as we know, even worse. In fact, only 0.8 per cent, less than a per cent of young people who, uh, uh, who had never smoked currently vape. A very low percentage of people, uh, young people actually smoke. So there is, I know, a scare campaign saying that vaping would lead to young people um, taking up um, smoking or worse products, but there's not a lot of evidence around the world that that actually happens. Not a lot of evidence that happens. And again, I want to stress that we all support, if there was a legalisation attempt, all support restrictions to make sure underage Australians would not have access to these products. Restrict it, just as we do with smoking. Now, is it perfect? No. But is anyone here going to stand up and say no young people smoke in this country? It's legal. It's illegal to sell a smoke to someone below the age of 18. It's illegal for an underage person to use 
uh, a tobacco smoking product, but it happens. It happens, unfortunately, uh, uh, and, and we'd be better off trying to impose real um, enforcement efforts rather than just put a blindfold on, on and think none of this actually occurs. And that's why we should look at the things like the New Zealand uh, Parliament, what they've done. Again, another example, another example of a country like us taking steps to legalise vaping because they've seen the clear evidence that this can help cut smoking rates. They have adopted a model. We're very strict advertising, uh, uh, selling and retail arrangements to prevent it going to the hands of young people, uh, uh, and they've allowed both the product to be used as a quit aid. Uh, um, the, the facts that we close our eyes to this evidence can in, indicates to me, indicates to me uh, that the entrenched positions that some have taken in the Department of Health and other organisations are the real barrier here, are the real barrier to progress and making people's lives better. The other side here, and, and Sterling Griff, the Senator Griff said the same, the other side here like to say that the US is the example. Well, the US is a free-for-all. And no one is advocating that model. No one is advocating that model. We don't want this. We don't want this THC in our products. We don't want vitamin E acetate. They are causing real issues, real issues. But let's have proper regulation to make sure that we can help those in this country that find themselves addicted to nicotine and actually return this debate to them, to them. It's not about the health bureaucrats. It's not about the health academics, this debate. It is not about uh, uh, what our position has been or how successful we've been as a country in the last uh, few decades in cutting smoking. It is about the 12 per cent of Australians who continue to smoke on a daily basis and need some help to get off a terrible habit so they can have better lives, so they can be better mothers, better fathers, and they don't continue this habit throughout generations in this country. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Sheldon. Sorry, Senator Sheldon, before I give you the call, I did just have um, to clarify that leave was denied to Senator Seawitt's request to table the speakers list, just so the chamber is clear on that. And now I will call Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, Labor accepts the advice and evidence of Australian and international experts when it comes to the matter of health. This is why Labor supports maintaining the precautionary approach adopted by the TGA and the Health Department in the regulation of e-cigarettes. The TGA is best placed to assess and advise the Australian government on claims of the relative harm of e-cigarettes, their risks and their efficiency as a method of smoking cessation. Informed by this evidence, the TGA is promoting a prescription model that would strike an appropriate balance preventing broad unregulated access amongst young people and by placing access within a medical context improving the, livelihood, uh, the likelihood of a cessation effect. Majority report of the Senate inquiry in tobacco harm reduction, as outlined in the motion, makes this important point. The absence of conclusive clinical evidence as to both the health effects of e-cigarettes and the efficacy of e-cigarettes as a smoking cessation tool supports the conclusion that there is no case to weaken Australian precautionary approach to the regulation of liquid nicotine. But there is also another matter the Senate must consider when it comes to the regulation of e-cigarettes, the influence of the tobacco industry, we just saw portrayed just then. When I signed on to the Deputy Chair of the Senate inquiry into tobacco harm reduction, People warned me of the insidious nature of the tobacco industry lobby, that these are companies that have, been, that have profited from the death and disease of its customers and over the better part of this last century, that they sat on research that demonstrated the link between their product and cancer for years before it became clear to the rest of the world. Well, Labor doesn't take, take money from them. There is no doubt that in my mind that the interests of the tobacco companies can never be reconciled with the public interest. So perverse is their business model and their intentions that politicians must always be alert to the efforts to ease restrictions on tobacco and nicotine. This is why, in, in, why Australia is a signatory to the World Health Organisation Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Article 5.3, which requires us as politicians to protect our politics regarding health care and tobacco control from what's quoted as commercial and other vested interests 
of the tobacco industry. It was for this reason I asked a significant number of the witnesses who appeared before the inquiry to declare any relationship or support they had received from companies engaged in the tobacco industry. I, along with many of the committee, had our suspicions that this inquiry was a political vehicle to, for the vested interests of the tobacco industry to push their agenda, not a health agenda. Reporting in the Australian Financial Review over the weekend reveals that this, these suspicions may have been very well founded. Over the weekend, it was revealed that Philip Morris had been funneling hundreds of thousands of dollars in contracts by the PR firm Burson, Cohen and Wolf BCW, to the Australian Retailers Association to lobby the government to legalise e-cigarettes. The product of this contract was set up uh, the Australian Retail Vaping Industry Association, alongside the group Legalise Vaping Australia. A shady front to push the argument that legislation and commercialisation of e-cigarettes will cause smoking rates to fall. Now, this motion is not a debate on the science of these cigarettes. The Tobacco Harm Reduction Inquiry has made and published and tabled its report on that issue. I, like many senators, believe that the health professionals, not politicians, should set policy in this respect. In this case, the Therapeutic Goods Administration remains the most appropriate regulator of our policy on e-cigarettes. And as I have repeatedly said, I deeply value and appreciated the personal testimony to our committee received from smokers, ex-smokers, e-cigarettes users and other individuals. It was clear to me that a large number of e-cigarette users were people seeking to make positive improvements in their lives and health by quitting smoking. We applaud them for taking the action to quit. But those who advocate a genuine grounds the merits of e-cigarettes as a means of smoking cessation have done a disservice by the covert efforts of the tobacco companies, industry bodies and their associated politicians, who push a message funded by companies whose interests are never in the public interests. And most importantly, it completely contradicts the line that legalising e-cigarettes will destroy the business model of the tobacco companies. That the tobacco companies want to see the broad commercialisation of e-cigarettes should be evident alone from the submissions they put into the inquiry. The submissions reveal that the British American Tobacco has invested over $4 billion into the development, manufacture and commercialisation of e-cigarette products since 2013. There is nothing small about $4 billion in investment. And of course, British American Tobacco would be pushing for an easing restriction on e-cigarettes. They have more than $4 billion invested to get back. Having seen the success of the global tobacco control measures reduce the rates of smoking to historic levels, the tobacco companies are facing an existential crisis. They see in the rise of e-cigarettes a solution to their crisis. E-cigarettes are not a threat to their business. They consider them the future of their business. They have co-opted the smoking cessation and harm reduction narratives as arguments for another generation of nicotine dependence and the profits that go along with it. This is clear from the smoke-free world language that is prominent in the submission to the inquiry from Philip Morris. Disturbingly, similar rhetoric is parroted in the monthly minority report put up by Senator Hughes and Canavan. Now, rightly, the ARA cancelled their contract with BCW in August last year and shut down ARVIA, leaving the tobacco industry in need of new surrogates to campaign on their behalf. As Neil Chenoweth points out in the Australian Financial, uh, financial Year at Review, uh, just a few matter of days after the Retailers Association cancelled this contract, the smaller national Retail Association began aggressively campaigning against our existing laws on e-cigarettes. This begs questions that should be answered. Is or has the National Retail Association been in receipt of a contract from Burns, Cohen and Wolfe 
relating to their work with Burns Phillip? Are they there now carrying out the work that the ARA has decided to stop? Will Dominic Lamb, the CEO of the National Retail Association, confirm or deny that they have ever been in receipt of the contract from BCW Global relating to the aims of Philip Morris? As I said at the outset, I was determined to ensure that this inquiry met with standards expected by Article 5.3 of the WHO Convention, which we are signatories of. I made this known to senators on the committee. Could this be why the National Retail Association declined to appear before the inquiry? Or why another group, Legalised Vaping Australia, a group that organised hundreds of form letter submissions to be sent to the inquiry, also declined to appear? Do senators think perhaps these groups, these fronts, would have felt uncomfortable describing what links or assistance they've had from the tobacco industry? Acting Deputy President, Legalise Vaping Australia is an arm of the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, a fringe radical group of half a dozen libertarians that has previously used social media support funded by British American Tobacco. The head of the Australian Tax Taxpayers Alliance is a Mr Tim Andrews, who works and lobbies in America against efforts to outlaw or restrict flavoured vaping products. I think you start to get the picture, don't you? Legalised Vaping Australia is run by Mr Brian Marlow. His organisation website outlines that it jointly runs a fighting fund with the now defunct Australian Retail Vaping Industry Association, just shy of $100,000 who now controls this money and for what is being used to do is anyone's guess. Tanya Buchanan, Buchanan the CEO of Cancer Council, was quoted in the AFR piece said, the tobacco industry has a long history of funding third party front groups to do their dirty work and help drive ongoing revenue streams, which is what is happening now in Australia. Thankfully, a majority of senators in the inquiry were aware to these efforts. They were mindful of the evidence and supported a common sense approach to regulating e-cigarettes. We supported that report because it was right, the right thing to do and we should support this motion as well. And in that evidence that we received, which has already been on the record, and the, uh, the incidents of take up from younger people in a series of studies is particularly disturbing when increased nicotine usage. And be very clear, this is about not reducing nicotine usage. But also be very clear that one of the Californian um, legislators had also made it very clear that vaping and the threats of vaping and byproducts that are put into vaping have not been tested by the TGA, and in the case of California had not been appropriately tested for the harmful, effect, harmful effects that it can provide and cause uh, to uh, e-cigarette users. It is quite clear that there is a competing evidence and views about what should be happening with e-cigarettes. But once the genie is out of the box, once they're out, then there's no way we'll be able to put it back in. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, it's my great pleasure to rise and support the motion put forward by Senator Griff, and I also want to commend the very strong contribution made by Senator Sheldon. Uh, Senator Canavan actually mentioned and, and called for proper regulation of e-cigarettes, and that is exactly what this government is doing. And I just want to actually, the motion is so important that I want to read it out to the Senate so that those who are listening to this debate can appreciate the importance of this motion and why it's so critical to support it. Uh, not only does Senator Griffin, in his motion note the tobacco industry has a vested interest in promoting e-cigarettes, and we've heard from Senator Sheldon, who has articulated uh, the money trail between a number of pro-vaping organisations and Big Tobacco. 
The motion further notes reports in the weekend Fin Review that the Australian Retailers Association under former CEO Russell Zimmerman received funding from Big Tobacco to lobby to legalise e-cigarettes and in doing so formed the Australian Retail Vaping Industry Association in September 2019. The motion welcomes the decision under the ARA's new CEO Paul, Paul Zara, Zara to close down Avia and walk away from its contract to lobby for e-cigarettes because the money was channelled from Philip Morris International. And as both Senator Griff and Senator Sheldon have pointed out in this debate, this was not disclosed to our Senate Select Committee on Tobacco Harm Reduction. The motion notes the recent Senate committee inquiry asked each witness to state whether they had ever received tobacco industry funding, and some groups, such as the Brisbane-based National Retail Association, provided submissions advocating the benefits of e-cigarettes but declined invitations to give evidence. Now, that's a very important point, and the reason this is important is because they would have then been forced to answer the question as to whether they had received very significant funding from the tobacco industry. So they gave a misleading submission to our inquiry because they fundamentally declined and I would say covered up the fact that they had received very substantial funding from big tobacco. And the motion, the last part of the motion, supports the findings of our inquiry's majority report that Australia has taken a sensible approach to vaping and the absence of conclusive clinical evidence as to both the health effects of e-cigarettes and the efficacy of e-cigarettes as a smoking cessation tool supports the conclusion that there is no case to weaken Australia's precautionary approach to the regulation of liquid nicotine. And that is fundamental. And that is what our government is so concerned about. And that is why we are implementing, as a government, sensible regulation, just as Senator Canavan called for. Uh, we obviously have a difference of view as to what that might be. But I am very proud to have been a part of this majority report, which adopts the government's position that we must take a precautionary approach. I was speaking with someone the other day about what's going on in the United States. Vaping is everywhere. Young kids on university campuses everywhere across the states are vaping. It is insidious. And there is deep and warranted concern that this is a gateway, not just to tobacco, but to other more serious drugs. The Thera Therapeutic Goods Administration, the independent regulator, made the decision on the 21st of December 2020 that from the 1st of October 2021, consumers importing nicotine will require a doctor's prescription to legally access nicotine, e-cigarettes and liquid nicotine. Child resistant closures for liquid nicotine will also be mandatory. So this is not a ban on, on nicotine. The TGA's decision follows extensive public consultation and is consistent with the existing ban in all states and territories on the sale of nicotine e-cigarettes without a doctor's prescription. The TGA's decision bridges a regulatory gap between state and territory law regulating nicotine e-cigarettes and Commonwealth law regulating their import. The TGA decision makers' reasons for the decision included to mitigate the potential uptake of smoking in young adults who would otherwise be at low risk of initiating nicotine addiction. The introduction of a novel nicotine delivery system, which may have a negative impact on tobacco control and may renormalise smoking. Uh, the TGA was also concerned that the exposure to nicotine in adolescents may have long-term consequences 
for brain development, potentially leading to learning and anxiety disorders. The TGA was also concerned about the unknown toxicity of long-term exposure to heated and inhaled chemicals and the risk of accidental exposure to children, particularly in relation to liquid nicotine. The Morrison government, in consultation with the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, the Australian Medical Association and other medical experts, um, will be developing a telehealth smoking cessation item that will be available six months prior to 1 October 2021, which is the implementation date. As part of this work, the government will provide $1 million for an education campaign focused on smoking cessation. Major healthcare professionals and consumer education programs are also scheduled for later in the year to inform them about the changes and the previously proposed customs prohibited imports regulations prohibiting the importation of e-cigarettes containing vaporiser nicotine, that's nicotine in solution or in salt or base form, and nicotine containing refills without a prescription from a GP will not be proceeding due to the significant overlap with uh, the TGA decision. So what our government has put forward, supported by the TGA, the highly credentialed independent regulator, is sensible, responsible regulation. And I want to also reference the Australian Financial Review's Neil Chenoweth, his article of the 20th of February, some very good journalism, I have to say, in this article, where he does reveal the money trail, the connection between big tobacco and, and particularly Philip Morris. And I want to quote from this article, the revelations that Philip Morris was secretly funding the push to legalise e-cigarettes undercuts claims by vaping advocates that legalisation would destroy the business model of tobacco companies. We know, and even in the evidence in our inquiry, we know that that's not true. This is the great panacea. This is the great way forward for the tobacco companies. They see vaping as their next great big commercial opportunity. This is why they are funding these vaping advocacy groups. They are driving their next revenue stream, as they have done in other parts of the world, and in doing so, that is going to lead to more harm and that is going to lead to a greater addiction for those who do take up smoking and perhaps other drugs. And I mentioned before the deep concern about the gateway effect of e-cigarettes. I also want to quote from the AFR article the following. The tobacco industry has a long history, and this is Tanya Buchanan, she says, the CEO of Cancer Council Australia. The tobacco industry has a long history of funding third-party front groups to do their dirty work and help drive ongoing revenue streams, which is what is happening now in Australia. And that is the basis on which the Retailers Association Board cancelled the contract. This is the, uh, the, the contract with Burson, Cohen and Wolfe. Cancelled that contract, recognising that this was not in the best interests of the organisation or the retailers it represents. Uh, Paul Zara said, the ARA has taken a strong position on this issue under my leadership. We don't believe the advocacy of vaping products are in the best interests of the wider retail industry, nor is it an appropriate use of ARA resources. So these pro-vaping advocacy groups have been caught out. They didn't have the guts to front our inquiry because they knew they would have to give evidence and tell the truth as to how they were funded. And as I say, I am very proud of the work that we've done and I would commend 
all Australians read our majority report, uh, including the additional remarks uh, which I made, where I canvassed a, a number of additional recommendations, and I do want to just um, briefly reference those. So just in summary, as the majority um, members of the committee found on the Tobacco Harm Reduction Select Committee, a prescription-based model provides the best pathway to strike an appropriate balance between providing treatment options for long-term smokers under medical supervision, whilst protecting against the legitimate risk of uptake of e-cigarettes use from non-smokers, particularly young Australians. It's also appropriate that decisions around regulation and access to medicines and poisons are made by an independent health regulator on public health grounds, such as the Thera Therapeutic Goods Administration. The current limited evidence, and that's the point that I do want to reference in relation to Senator, Senator Cavett Canavan's contribution, the, the reason the TGA has taken this precautionary approach is because the evidence is limited. That is absolutely crucial. The current limited evidence regarding efficacy of e-cigarettes, the unknown long-term risk of e-cigarettes and legitimate concerns around the uptake of e-cigarettes amongst non-smokers warrant a precautionary approach to this issue. This is entirely consistent with other nicotine replacement therapies which make health claims, and it also adopts a conservative approach initially to the availability of new products making therapeutic claims, uh, which is the proper and sensible approach. In my uh, additional remarks in the majority report, I made a number of recommendations that I just want to um, briefly reference. Uh, and they are that the, uh, the Commonwealth should ensure that telehealth under Medicare is universally accessible for smoking cessation to assist smokers to quit. And I was very pleased that the government has actually implemented that measure. Uh, the Commonwealth government should immediately review the affordability of nicotine replacement products and move to list more of these products on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme in line with medical evidence, because if people are wanting to stop smoking, we want to give them every support we possibly can. Upon application and subject to the usual public health assessment processes, the TGA should consider reviewing the classification of liquid nicotine to enable it to be sold in pharmacies without a prescription. Now, that's uh, a recommendation which I put forward subject to the TGA's assessment. So uh, obviously adopting the medical model, uh, if the TGA believes that this is appropriate, then it is also open to the TGA to recommend slightly more broader accessibility of e-cigarettes e and, e and liquid nicotine uh, through uh, pharmacies. So I do, and then my final recommendation was that we should introduce legislation consistent with other countries which requires tobacco companies to mandatorily disclose details of expenditure, including on tobacco and nicotine marketing. I commend the motion brought forward by Senator Griff today, and as I say, I'm very proud of the majority report. I recommend all Australians read it. Thank you. Senator Seawood. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to this general uh, uh, business uh, motion 1038 in Senator Griff's name, also now in the names of Senator Sheldon Urquhart and myself. Um, last year, I participated in the uh, Select Committee on Tobacco Harm Reduction the evidence, and wish to um, articulate um, some of the points that we learned and the concerns that the Greens have with the continual push by big tobacco to push e-cigarettes as a gateway to smoking. It is very clear that big tobacco have an agenda here. Otherwise, they would not be involved. Because anybody that thinks that they have the health of the community at heart have rocks in their head when they continue to push their death sticks 
in countries that don't have as good regulation as we do in this country. And I'm very proud of the strong record that Australia has in dealing with smoking. I never want to see smoking take hold to the levels it used to be in this country. And that's, let's face it, is the game and the focus of big tobacco. The evidence presented to the committee reinforced to me that we cannot afford to undo the many years of outstanding public health campaigns that have substantially reduced levels of tobacco smoking in Australia. Currently, over 95 per cent of people aged between 14 to 17 in Australia have never smoked, a statistic Australia should be proud of. However, evidence from Professor Banks from ANU noted that there is a 300 per cent increased risk in non-smokers becoming regular smokers of tobacco after using e-cigarettes. And she continues to do uh, further work and research in this space, which I think will contribute further to um, the evidence around e-cigarettes. We also heard evidence that the proportion of young people aged between 18 and 24 who have used e-cigarettes in their lifetime has increased from 19 per cent to 26 per cent between 2016 and 2019. This association between e-cigarettes uh, users who have never smoked cigarettes before and then go on to become regular tobacco, smoke, uh, reg regular tobacco smoking user, uh, users is known, as I just referred to uh, a moment ago, as the gateway effect. The Greens are strongly concerned that e-cigarettes and the gateway effect have the ability to undermine dec decades of work undertaken in Australia to achieve such low levels of smoking. There is real concern that the increased use of e-cigarettes in young people result, will result in normalisation of an increased uptake in regular tobacco smoking. It's also important to consider the use of uh, flavourings in e-cigarettes in this context. And I want to focus on this because it's an issue um, that I think is not getting enough attention. But it's also one that was the subject of an event that the Lung, Council, uh, Lung Foundation of Australia held uh, via Zoom with parliamentarians yesterday. Um, in a groundbreaking study funded by the Lung Foundation and the Mindaroo Foundation, Curtin, Curtin University tested 52 flavoured e-liquids for sale over the counter in Australia and found 100 per cent of the e-liquids were inaccurately labelled. 100 per cent contained chemicals with unknown effects on respiratory health. 21 per cent contained nicotine. 62 per cent contained chemicals likely to be toxic if vaped repeatedly. The Lung Foundation also set out their expert um, position statement on flavoured e-cigarettes and young Australians. This position statement recognises that young Australians aged between 13 and 24 are vulnerable to short and long-term health implications of an unknown product. It recommends that action uh, taken must be precautionary, protective, transparent, collaborative, evidence-based and free, free from industry influence. The Lung Foundation is also calling on governments across Australia to protect the respiratory health of young Australians by immediately increasing the cost of flavoured e-liquids and associated devices through taxation, immediately introducing plain packaging for all flavoured e-cigarettes, immediately mandating that flavoured e-cigarettes be subject to the same rules, advertising and promotion regulation as combustible cigarettes, banning the sale of flavoured e-liquids in Australia. That's how serious the Lung Foundation of Australia consider the implications of flavoured e-cigarettes um, and flavoured liquids and e-cigarettes. We can't afford to let big tobacco undo decades of hard work in this country. The Greens continue to hold significant concerns about the active involvement of the big tobacco industry in the debate around regulatory reform of e-cigarettes in Australia. The motivations of the industry were clearly articulated in a Philip Morris International sponsored article on the website of the Australian newspaper. This advertisement, and it was an advertisement even though you're not supposed to be uh, advertising uh, cigarettes anymore, or um, this clearly skirted around that but it clearly was aimed as an advertisement. 
this advertisement claimed that government regulation was prohibiting Australian smokers from accessing e-cigarettes, which, in their view, are a viable and safer alternative for, for combustible cigarette smokers. We have to ask why big tobacco is so strongly against the prescription-only model for tobacco and advocate that e-cigarettes should be available as a broad, broader consumer product, if not to promote the use of tobacco and heated tobacco and to try and promote um, the sale of their products. It is clear that big tobacco hold the view that vaping and e-cigarettes offer new profit-making opportunities as traditional combustible smoking rates continue to reach record low levels in Australia. They have not given up on trying to sell cigarettes. They sell them to our neighbours that have poorer regulatory provisions on smoking. If they were really committed to looking after this, the world's population's health, they, in fact, would, they would in fact not be selling cigarettes. They clearly still want to sell such products, for example, as heated tobacco that will still harm people's health. There is a very clear conflict of interest here with big tobacco. This is a public health issue and regulation should be considered and enacted without the influence of big tobacco or other commercial interests. Now, at the hearing, uh, at the various hearings, and during the inquiry into um, reduction of uh, tobacco harm, we heard from a variety of uh, commercial enterprises, including uh, those running petrol stations and their convenience stores and petrol stations. Because one of the things we heard at the inquiry was it's okay, you don't need to go, doctors don't really understand and don't provide an, uh, advice on e-cigarettes and neither does the pharmacist and the pharmacist won't be able to provide advice on vaping implements um, or the various flavours and things like that. The specialist vaping shops would do that. And then the rent seekers came in and said, oh, we run convenience stores at, at petrol stations, so we want to be able to sell vaping implements. And our staff will be specially trained to provide the sort of advice about how you could use your vaping implements and liquids to reduce to your smoking. What a pack of nonsense. What a pack of nonsense. I don't know about you, but when I go to the petrol station, I go to the petrol station to buy petrol by and large, occasionally I'll pick up some milk. But the people there, all very nice, but I wouldn't want them to be providing me with health advice. And that's what these people were saying. The people in these convenience stores will be able to provide you with health advice on how you can use e-cigarettes and vaping to reduce your smoking. Apparently doctors can't do it. But people running convenience stores who are, as I said, are very nice people, but I bet you they don't have a medical degree or a pharmacists. This is the sort of rent-seeking that's going on in this debate. It is not about reduction of tobacco harm. The long-term evidence isn't there. We have world-leading regulation here. This country should be proud of the record that we have had in terms of reducing smoking. We had world-leading legislation around paper, plain paper packaging. World-leading. Why would we want to undermine that by winding back the regulatory process? Use if, if e-cigarettes. And I'll grant you, we had, we had evidence at the committee that some people had found uh, using e-cigarettes beneficial in reducing harm. We also had evidence that some people had gone back or were using a combination or had gone back to smoking. But it's clearly, for some people, it has helped. And that, under the TGA process and the prescription approach, would mean that you could do that with, your, with the support of your medical practitioner to be able to do that as part of your smoking cessation plan. But the evidence is not 
there that it's appropriate to let vaping vendors provide that advice. The evidence, as I articulated from Professor Banks, is in fact the reverse. We can't afford to take the risk. And I got a little bit sick of hearing take the advice of other countries. The other countries are taking the advice and following the lead of Australia when it comes to issues like plain paper packaging. This is a public health debate. It should be treated as a public health debate, not enabling big tobacco and other rent seekers to come in and, and push measures that will harm people's health. And the work of the Lung Foundation which was very timely, um, being just before this debate around flavours, is cause for further alarm. I recommend that anybody with an interest in this debate go and look at what they were saying about the impact of, the f of flavourings in e-cigarettes as well. So yes, this is about nicotine, but it's also about some of the other, as far as I'm concerned, some of those other flavourings that are going in, the impact that that has on people's lungs and ultimately their health. I support this motion and recommend that Australia continues on its world-leading approach in reducing uh, tobacco harm and not follow those other countries that, that are going down uh, unproven methods on tobacco reduction harm and those that do think and want to try e-cigarettes as part of their reduction, uh, their tobacco uh, smoking cessation program, please go to your doctors. And my message to the doctors, if you are not up with the latest, look at the latest research about if someone comes to you and asks about how uh, a smoking cessation plan and they ask about e-cigarettes, look at the latest research and help people. That's, you are there as trusted health practitioners. Enable people to have a proper program in smoking reduction because there was some evidence that people said their GP didn't understand um, some of the issues around e-cigarettes. Medical practitioners need to get up to speed and they need to help people kick the habit not replace one habit with another, but kick the habit of smoking. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, uh, can I acknowledge some of the very good points that my fellow senator from Western Australia, Senator Seawert, makes there, uh, in that the Australian government is taking a very precautionary approach to e-cigarettes, uh, ably led by Minister Hunt. Um, our approach is supported by the majority of Australia's leading health and medical organisations uh, and, of course, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. So, whilst the government is aware that there are a variety of approaches to this issue uh, across the globe, uh, the government will continue to monitor the direct harms that e-cigarettes pose to human health, uh, importantly monitor their impact on both smoking initiation and cessation. Uh, monitor the uptake amongst our youth uh, and further inquire as to the dual use with conventional tobacco products, as these are all relevant considerations uh, when it comes to the matter of e-cigarettes. I think there is uh, no doubt that there are direct harms associated with e-cigarette use, uh, and there is very real potential for e-cigarette use to lead to nicotine addiction and hence tobacco use, uh, particularly amongst young Australians. Currently, we have insufficient evidence to promote uh, and to actively promote the use of e-cigarettes for the purpose of smoking cessation. And that's a very key realisation. Uh, further, I think it's important to recognise that the regulation of e-cigarettes is currently a shared responsibility. Uh, with the Commonwealth and states and territories each sharing in this. E-cigarette regulation uh, draws upon existing legislation uh, and the regulations that apply to tobacco products, therapeutic goods, poisons and consumer goods. So what is clear 
Mr Acting Deputy President, is that this is not a simple matter. It is an evolving matter and one that the Australian government rightly is therefore taking an incremental approach to. It is currently illegal to sell nicotine-containing e-cigarettes uh, e uh, in every state and territory, uh, and possession in all jurisdictions except South Australia is also illegal without a valid medical prescription. So the current situation is that legally imported materials are then illegally possessed under state and territory law. This is reflective, I guess, of the complexity that surrounds the regulation uh, with e-cigarettes and nicotine-containing products. Senator Seawitt rightly mentioned that any doctor may currently prescribe nicotine-containing e-cigarettes that can be used for consumers uh, for personal importation. And this is not widely understood. And, and I think it's an important matter of public information that there are more than 30,000 GPs in this country that may currently and certainly can continue into the future to prescribe nicotine-based e-cigarettes for the purposes of smoking cessation. Any of those general practitioners can also register with the TGA to become what is known as an authorised prescriber. A GP who is an authorised prescriber uh, can issue prescriptions for e-cigarettes for dispensing at a local pharmacy as an alternative option to personal importation. This affords Australians who wish to stop smoking uh, to have greater flexibility and exercise a greater degree of personal choice as to how they go about that important decision. The TGA's decision in this respect will therefore both reduce the risk of an on-ramp for teenagers to adopt nicotine use, and as has been highlighted, they also rectify the issue of legal importation but illegal possession. Medicines and poisons are classified into various schedules in the poison standard according to the level of regulatory control over the access that the substance has with respect to protecting public health and safety. Those regulatory approaches to e-cigarettes therefore uh, consider, uh, sorry, vary considerably uh, with other nations ranging from prohibition uh, uh, to no regulation whatsoever. Australia therefore cannot be considered to be an outlier in that respect. The TGA, as a totally independent regulator charged with many important decisions, made the decision on 21 December 2020 that from October of this year consumers importing nicotine will require a doctor's prescription to legally access nicotine e-cigarettes and liquid nicotine. An important part of this was child-resistant closures for that liquid nicotine will also be mandatory. But importantly, the TGA's decision was not a ban on nicotine. The TGA's decision is consistent with the existing ban in all states and territories on the sale of nicotine e-cigarettes without a doctor's prescription. And I think it's worth reflecting on the presence of 30,000 GPs in Australia who can uh, prescribe these, uh, these devices to an individual who seeks to stop smoking. The TGA's decision also bridges that reg regulatory gap between the variety of state and territory regulation of nicotine e-cigarettes and the Commonwealth law as it, res as it re uh, relates to their importation. The Therapeutic Goods Administration also took actions to further educate Australians, set minimum safety and quality requirements and encourage further research in cooperation with the Department of Health. So the government will continue to develop a smoking cessation plan that will be available six months prior to the 1 October 2021 implementation date. As part of this work, the government will provide a million dollars for the education campaign focused on smoking cessation. Promoting major healthcare professionals and consumer education programs is a complementary way of addressing this issue. The previously proposed customs prohibited imports regulations prohibiting the importation of e-cigarettes containing vaporised nicotine and nicotine-containing refills without a prescription from a GP 
will not be proceeding due to the significant overlap with the TGA decision. The government will also monitor the impacts of these changes to the poisons standard. Senator Seward uh, rightly raised the Senate committee inquiry into this, and the government is in the process uh, of considering the report of the Senate Select Committee on Tobacco Harm Reduction with regard to the TGA's scheduling decision uh, and to include nicotine as a prescription only medicine. Uh, it won't come as a surprise to honourable senators to know that the Department of Health and indeed the Minister of Health has had uh, a little bit uh, on their plate in the last 12 months as we seek uh, to protect lives and livelihood through the COVID-19 pandemic. But Australia is committed to protecting public health policies in relation to tobacco control from commercial and other vested interests in the tobacco and indeed any industry. We are alive to the very real conflicts that exist in this space. Earlier this week, uh, I had the pleasure of listening to the Lung Foundation uh, and Mindaroo Foundation jointly present uh, the results of some research that they have conducted in this space. The research was undertaken by the Curtin University and involved testing of 52 samples of flavoured e-liquids. According to the research, 21 per cent of samples tested contained nicotine. So that's one in five uh, files of e-liquid contained nicotine. 62 per cent contained chemicals likely to be toxic if vaped repeatedly. And incredibly, 100 per cent, every single one of the 52 samples was inaccurately labelled. The research also found that 100 per cent, that's all 52 of the samples uh, that were tested, contained chemicals with unknown effects on respiratory health. The Morrison government believes that it is essential that Australian consumers know what they are consuming. On 30 September 2020, the National Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health of the Australian National University published a summary report on the use of e-cigarettes and its relation to tobacco smoking uptake and cessation relevant to the Australian context. The report is broadly consistent with the latest advice from the medical industry experts and reaffirms the precautionary approach that the Morrison government is taking to e-cigarettes. The ANU report reaffirmed the importance of limiting access only to the specific circumstance of e-cigarettes containing nicotine. But I do note the important research that was undertaken by Curtin University, where 21 per cent of samples actually did contain nicotine, and 100 per cent of those samples were incorrectly labelled. So the very real issue that Australian consumers need clarity on is a clear, reliable uh, understanding of what they are consuming. Through the National Health and Medical Research Council, the government has supported 13 grants and committed over $12.6 million into the research into e-cigarettes since 2011. This is not a new problem. It's an evolving problem and one that the government takes very seriously. I was actually quite intrigued by one aspect of uh, the Curtin University research that found that chocolate-flavoured vapes are actually amongst the most likely to be harmful to human health by virtue of containing benzene rings and other compounds, uh, whereas peppermint-flavoured vapes uh, are actually reportedly much less likely to cause uh, a harmful reaction with human cells. So uh, I guess, yes, I, I was very taken aback, Senator Seward, uh, to learn that chocolate could be bad for you in the context of e-vaping. And I share your pain. I share your pain. But let me affirm uh, to, to, to all senators present that uh, the, the government is committed to that incremental and carefully considered approach to e-cigarettes. Uh, and with that respect, I guess there's much more to come. Thank you. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I just wonder in this country, we've just heard um, Senator Small's contribution, and um, whilst he is obviously a supporter of taking 
more action about e-cigarettes. What we heard was that the government plans to do stuff at some point into the future. And, uh, the problem with the Morrison government is they've turned into a bit of a gunner government. They're always going to do something at some later date. And we've heard a lot of uh, reports that have been tabled ages ago and nothing's happened. Uh, and equally, um, it seems this e-cigarette debate, because of some wobbliness from their backbench, um, is also going to take its time. And, and it caused me to reflect on how difficult it seems to be for conservative governments to move on social reform uh, and other health reforms in this country. I remember when um, Labor put forward the plain packaging uh, legislation, and oh my goodness me, to hear from the government, to hear from uh, those opposite who at that time were in opposition, as if the sky was going to fall down. Now I appreciate that the tobacco lobby is very, very powerful. It's very good at the games it plays because it's been playing them for a very, very long time. And I know Senator Seawitt, in her contribution, talked about the tobacco lobby. But seriously, this is about uh, the potential take-up rate of smoking. We have led the world with um, uh, smoking reform in this country, and now for all of us, it's really unusual to have someone amongst us who smokes. And yes, of course, it's their right to smoke. I'm not suggesting that. But we've made it um, almost impossible to smoke uh, anywhere these days, and that's a solid move because there's clearly public health. Um, research that tells us it's bad. But that doesn't mean that the tobacco lobby is sitting there with its feet up. It's still snapping at our heels. And the debate, the most recent debate we've had in this country, was plain packaging. And those opposite who were in opposition at the time behaved shamelessly because obviously the tobacco lobby was in their ear. Marriage equality, saying sorry to First Nations people. All of these things are so difficult for this government. We should really be seizing the day on e-cigarettes and moving quickly, because the evidence is there in, already that it's harmful to young children. We know that um, there are already toxins in some of the e-cigarettes that are available. Um, last year, or I can't remember now, the year before I travelled to the UK, whenever it was that we were last uh, allowed out, and I commend the government on closing international waters. I'm not wanting them open. Um, the e-cigarettes uh, in the UK and Europe are shocking. They are everywhere. And we're, as an Australian, when you're not used to any kind of smoke, uh, they come as a bit of a shock. So we could lead the world here. And I urge the government to get on with the job to stand up to its backbench, and if they're being influenced by the tobacco lobby, then that, let's realise that. Let's be a first and not dragging our heels on this matter. E-cigarettes, we should stomp on them right away. Let's get rid of them and make sure that um, we continue to provide the utmost health opportunities for young people to not uh, create addictions. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. One Nation opposes this motion. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I'll explain why. Vapes and e-cigs are as safe as the vaping solution's contents. E-cigs should, e should be available in Australia using the established Therapeutic Goods Administration procedure for Schedule III pharmacy-only medications. This will allow local producers to submit their products to the TGA for testing and approval. Those approved devices and solutions will then be made using good manufacturing process right here in Australia. This offers complete assurance to Australian consumers that the product they're using is safe. The approval process is quick and cheap as compared to potential sales revenue. Distribution should be limited to pharmacists. Our policy follows a review of both academic research and empirical data from around the world. Thousands of pages of science and data supports the effectiveness of e-cigs as an aid to quit smoking. Public Health England has found the available evidence suggests that e-cigs are likely to be considerably less harmful than cigarettes. 
A peer-reviewed article published in the latest edition of the International Journal of Drug Policy found there was no support for the argument that vaping is a gateway to smoking. No support. The article produced empirical evidence that clearly shows e-cigs have accompanied a reduction in smoking rates in countries where quit rates had previously stagnated. What is wrong with paying attention to the science and the reality? It's debates like this debate around e-cigs and vaping that leads one nation to call for an office of scientific integrity. These matters are far too important, far too important to be decided by a selective quoting of reports so as to support any preconceived position. Good government requires the truth not dueling reports, not fear, not ideology, not vested interests, not uninformed opinions, not emotions, facts and data. An Office of Scientific Integrity and Quality Assurance will allow independent scientists and advocates to test these important issues, and from that process, the truth has the best chance of emerging. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So the question is that the uh, General Business Motion 1038, moved by Senator Griff, be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. Only one voice. Uh, the ayes have it. I propose that the Senate do now adjourn and call Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. On 10 February 2021, I was actually extraordinarily fortunate to visit with a wonderful group of Queenslanders at the Lawaraji Aboriginal Corporation based in Ipswich, near to my home office in Springfield. And on that day, I met with Auntie Lily Davidson, Auntie Maria Davidson, Miss Samantha Carr and Miss Kiana Fisher. Wonderful, wonderful people. And I'd also like uh, to acknowledge the role of Auntie Faye Carr, a Yugara elder, in the formation and operation of the Lawaraji Aboriginal Corporation. And Auntie Faye Carr was named the 2017 NADOC Female Elder of the Year. An extraordinarily uh, wonderful, just a wonderful Queenslander. The Lawaraji Aboriginal Corporation provides a number of essential services, not just to our First Nations people, our Aboriginal and Indigenous people, but also to everyone in the greater Ipswich region. And this includes services in relation to a breakfast program, which was called Five Bridges, domestic and family violence awareness, agricultural training courses, readiness for work courses, uh, cemetery maintenance at Deebing Creek, which used to be the home of an Aboriginal mission, the Youth Didgeridoo Program venue uh, provision, cross-cultural awareness programs, even a partnership with Hutchinson Builders, a great Queensland company who, uh, in its construction activities, seeks to involve First Nations people. And sitting down and meeting uh, Arnie Lilly, Arnie Maria, Samantha and Kiana, uh, you got that feeling, Mr Acting Deputy President, which I'm sure you've had in terms of visiting various constituents and organisations where you just knew you are in the presence of wonderful people in a welcoming environment and they were doing great things for our community. And it was really some of the stories they told me that really touched me, touched me profoundly about the work they did. They told me how a young man, a First Nations man with schizophrenia, came into the office on one occasion extremely agitated. And one of the aunties sat him down with a notepad and with a pen and just asked him to write down his feelings. And through that process, they helped calm him down so they could then get him the assistance he needed. They told me a story of a local family that was having all sorts of issues where child safety authorities were taking their children from them. The family was going through all sorts of uh, ruptures and through the assistance of, of the two aunties, the Lawaji uh, Aboriginal Corporation, they provided that family with assistance so it could be reunited and function again as a family unit. Just uh, an outstanding story. And as they were speaking and telling me these stories, I noticed out of the corner of my eye that an Australian of African descent came into the store. And they actually have a bit of an op shop 
associated with the, uh, the headquarters of the, of the corporation, and they've got all sorts of clothes and things that are available. And this lady was coming in and she was choosing a few garments, and, and she smiled, and there was a lot of uh, uh, welcoming, welcoming exchanges, and she left. And after she left, they told us uh, how they'd provided assistance to this lady. She wasn't a First Nations person, she wasn't of Aboriginal descent, but they provide assistance to everyone in the community. And they'd assisted this lady to obtain some part-time cleaning work, and they're always there to provide her with uh, the support she needed to, to get on with her life and to provide for her family. But more than that, more than that, they provide a welcoming place for her to come in and meet with them, have a cup of tea and sit down and um, obtain that community connection. They also, they also talked about a phenomenon whereby a lot of Aboriginal workers during their lunch breaks congregate in their lunchroom because they find it an extraordinarily safe place to come and tell their stories and exchange notes. And sometimes they have trouble convincing them that uh, they need to leave so they can get on with their work. But to me, it just under, underlined, underlined the fact of the welcoming nature of this uh, organisation and the outstanding contribution that all of these ladies provide to their community. So I'd like to say to the Lawaraji Aboriginal Corporation, I was honoured to spend time in your presence, and it's an absolute honour to inform the Senate of Australia of the wonderful work you do for our community. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. On the 2nd of December um, last year, uh, Australian bushfires were discussed as uh, a matter of public importance in this chamber, uh, with sovereign aerial firefighting uh, as a focal point. Last week, a response from, the Min from Minister Littleproud was tabled here in the Senate. The letter included the statement, and I'll quote, before any decision or long-term commitment is made regarding particular aircraft in the ownership and strategic operation, it is imperative that the government has a full and evidence-based understanding of the capability actually required. This will be pivotal to informing the decisions on the future of aerial firefighting to deliver an operationally effective fleet that is scalable, adaptive and provides value for money. Well, I kind of almost had to sit down after reading that statement. I mean, seriously. Australia first conducted aerial firefighting uh, in Benambra, Victoria, in February 1967. And I'll just indicate to the chamber that was before I was born. Okay, so that's uh, 54 years ago. Now, in that time, we've had multiple Australian organisations, including CSIRO, AFAC, Bushfire Cooperative Research Centre the Victorian Department of Sustainability and Environment, the West Australian Department of Conservation and Land Management, all reporting on aerial firefighting. We've had multiple inquiries, up to and including a Royal Commission. Bottom line is there's data available and there has been analysis. And the reference to value uh, to, to, for money makes my blood boil. Commonwealth and state procurement rules require officials to obtain value for money with public monies uh, and there's clearly been many years, 54 of them, for, the, for government procurement authorities to determine if they've obtained value for money, for the money they've spent. So they should know. Adding to the confusion is that the Department of Home Affairs put into the, uh, the Senate inquiry into lessons learned in relation to the Australian bushfire season 2019-20 that, and I quote, leasing of aircraft between the northern and southern hemispheres has proven to be cost effective. Cost effective sounds a little bit like value to money for me, so, so there's clearly been some analysis. Now, when I rose to spoke about this during the MPI, I suggested all we need is a bit of a tweak to occur and largely the problems will be solved. One of the problems we have right now is that uh, we give Australian contractors, contractors contracts for short terms, maybe two or three years. And they can't go to their bank and say, let me buy an aircraft, because the contract terms are too long. They're not asking for any more money, but if we extended out the contract terms, they'd have the surety to be able to go to the bank and actually get some finance to have aircraft that we could uh, have operating here in Australia, sovereign, 
and selling overseas in our off-season, making money, bringing foreign dollars into this country. So I was a bit dumbfounded by um, some of the analysis that has taken place so far, um, the, you know, particularly where the government says we need more time, without even so much as an explanation as to what they're actually doing or those tasks that they're completing. Um, now, uh, you know, they could have just indicated they were looking at things like, uh, uh, like properly integrated, remotely piloted vehicles, for example, um, also known as drones, uh, into the aerial fleet. They could have talked about engaging CASA to, to make sure that uh, the regulations are not getting in the way. They could have said that uh, modelling was being done. The bottom line is we know all about uh, aerial firefighting. There is no, there's no more questions to be answered. And If uh, someone thinks that that is the case, then for 54 years people have not been doing their job. It's unforgivable. So you know, while, the, while the bureaucrats want to do more analysis, the people who do hold a hose are proposing solutions that will help them deal with the very real and increasing dangers of bushfires. But sadly, all I can hear is the hollow clanking sound of a can being kicked down the, down the road yet again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday, the 15th of March, at 10 a.m.